You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Get away, you kids! I told you not to play here. Go on now. It, it's so noisy. They're gone now. Come along, Mrs. Knaus. This way, everyone. Oh, but doctor, I have my knitting to do. Another time. Out onto the porch. I didn't finish my crossword puzzle. It will wait, Mr. A.G. <sighs> Now then, isn't this a beautiful day? I don't know why we have to go. It isn't good to spend all your time inside. Everybody needs the sun once in a while. Even you, Mrs. Summers. I've had my share of the sun. Now I need my rest. We all do at our age. And where's Mr. Conroy? He's not feeling so well this morning. Well, I'm not either. What about Mr. Whitley? Why does he get to stay in? He's waiting for an important call. Watch your step. Nurse will bring the picnic baskets. Well, some of us may not want a picnic. A picnic, is it? On the grass? All those ants. We have blankets and chairs. You'll see. Ah, darn those kids, anyway. Hey, quit running. Stop it. Like wild Indians. They won't bother us. This way, there's a nice place under the trees. Listen to them, would you? Ah, oh, they're only children. They know they aren't supposed to play on the grounds. <sighs> How can a body think? Now, Ben, just read your paper. They're not hurting anyone. Well, let them play someplace else. They've got homes, don't they? It's the grass. The what? We have such a big lawn at Sunnyvale. Kids can't resist it. Oh, what are you doing downstairs, Charlie? I thought you had to get ready. Not today. You haven't heard from your son? I I thought it was all set. Maybe you didn't get my letter. <laughs> oh, he got it all right. They just don't care. Nobody cares anymore. The boy has enough problems. It's a small house and the second baby's on the way. It was a foolish idea moving in with them. They don't need an old duffer like me around. Huh. Would you listen to that? It's enough to wake the dead, I tell you. Don't be so hard on them, Ben. They're only kids. A fine state of affairs when your own son turns against you. There you are. Yes, nurse? You have a phone call. I do? I believe it's your son. Well, what do you know? Be right there. I'll tell him. 
Isn't that something? Guess he got my letter after all. Huh, I never get any letters. Or phone calls. Nope, nope, nope. You will, Ben, you will. Excuse me, I'd better get it before he hangs up. What are they doing out there? Don't be a grouch. It's Saturday. Perfect for kick the can. Perfect for what? We used to play it all the time, remember? No, I don't remember anything of that kind. Sunnyvale Rest Home, a place for the aged. The address is 1275 Tranquility Lane on the outskirts of town. It offers room and board, nursing care, and a kind of refuge from the world. Outside, a common game called Kick the Can. Very shortly, a man will have a choice to make. He can either die in this world or escape to another kind of refuge in the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone, and our story, Kick the Can, starring Shelley Berman and Stan Freeberg, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Hmm, some picnic. Plastic spoons and forks. Well, the potato salad was good. What do you mean? It was spoiled. No, it wasn't, Emma. They made it in the kitchen, just for us. You must admit, it's better when it's fresh. Oh, oh I, I think I hurt my back sitting down. Oh, the ground was damp. It was. Bad for my arthritis. Will you people please hold it down? I'm trying to read. Oh, you shush, Ben Conroy. No one's bothering you. <laughs> Easy for you to say. Where is Mr. Whitley? Still in his room, probably. Taking a nap. Oh, that's what I'd like to do. And why, may I ask, on such a lovely day? There he is. Going somewhere, Charles? Yes. Why are you all dressed up? It's my son. He's coming to get me. You don't say. He called a little while ago. He did. He's on his way. <laughs> At least someone gets calls. What's he carrying? Is that your suitcase, Mr. Whitley? Indeed it is. You're going to stay overnight then? A bit longer than that, I should say. That is, if they have the room fixed up. Room? At my son's house. You mean... You're moving in with them? That's the plan, if they'll have me. Well, what about the rest of your things, Charlie? You can't just leave your things behind. No hurry. It all can be packed up and sent over later. Well, we'll certainly miss you. Will you come back to visit us? Of course I will. Meanwhile, I'll call and see how everyone's doing. May we write you? Please, I'd appreciate it. Mr. Cox has the address. Nobody writes. They say they will, but they never do. There he is now. Hey, aren't you going to say goodbye? I hate goodbyes, Mr. A.G., don't you? Take care, all. Here, let me carry that for you. I've got it. Behind the wheel. His son, David, don't you remember? Such a nice young man. Let me see. Some car, huh? Betty costs pretty penny. Everything does nowadays. Don't crowd now. You wouldn't want him to think you're watching. I did. David, you're looking well, son. What's the suitcase for? Oh, just a few things for now. 
I don't understand. Wouldn't want to push you out of the house and home. What? Of course, I don't have that much anymore, but I suppose it could go into storage Whoa. if... I think there's been a misunderstanding. There has? Get in. We need to talk. If it isn't convenient today, we can make it another time. Listen, Dad. Yes? I didn't say I'd come to get you. I said I'd come to see you. But I thought, didn't you get my letter? That's what I wanted to talk to you about. If it were up to me... You don't have to explain. Well, Debbie's turning the extra room into a nursery. Right now it's being painted and... I understand. I don't think you do. Let's drive a bit. Uh, your friends are watching us. It's all right, really. Let's go into town. I'll buy you lunch. That's not necessary. Please, Dad. I want to. This wasn't a good idea. If you'll let me explain... Pull over here, please. I can walk back. But, Dad... The exercise will be good for me. If you'll just listen... We'll have lunch another Saturday, son. Call first, though. I'm really quite busy these days. You're taking this all wrong. Give my love to Debbie, will you? He's coming back. I thought he said... Oh, don't stare. It's not polite. Yeah, you're it. Gotcha. Hey, where'd our can go? That old man's got it. Hey, mister. What's this? Our can. Your can? Can we have it back? Could you have... Yeah, we need it. Oh, you do, huh? Yeah, we're playing a game. Yes. Yes, I remember. This is a good can. Nice and sturdy. It will take a lot of kicks. It will? You'll have to play by the rules, though. What rules? You know the rules, don't you? Hmm. I give it back. Please, mister. I'd say this can is just about the perfect size. Is he gonna keep it? Hey, mister, can we have our can back? You can get another. Anyone will do. Tomatoes, beans, doesn't matter. You'll see. Charlie? You in there? It's going to be a beautiful sunny day today. And yes. Much more oh, the same over the uh, just days. wondered what happened to you. Not a thing, Ben, not a thing. Las Vegas, 68. Los Thought I'd lie down for a minute. Come on in if you'd like. Uh, sorry about that son of yours. Are you? I'm not. This is a good enough place for me. I don't know what I was thinking. Here, uh, I'll close the window for you. Why? It's a beautiful day, don't you think? Oh, so much noise. Yes, what a great running and shouting. Huh, that's what you call it? Such a grouch. You can't stop kids from playing kick the can. It's in their blood, like statues or hide and seek, a ritual this time of year. You, uh, you surprise me sometimes, Charles. And why do you say that? You actually brought that tin can up to your room? Ah, must be filthy. No, it's not. It's been emptied out and washed clean and baked by the sun till it's shiny as the day it was made, tempered by the wind and the grass and the warm summer air. Sure you're feeling all right? Admit it, Ben. 
Admit what? Don't you ever think about it? You must. I don't know what you're talking about. All kids play those games the same as we did, and the moment they stop, they begin to grow old. Oh, come on. It's almost as though playing kick the can keeps them young. Huh. So that's what this is for. Magic. I'm not sure. Charlie, I'm worried about you. You're not yourself. Aren't I? You don't believe in magic anymore, do you, Ben? Huh. What are you talking about? But there was a time when you did believe in it. Never. We've known each other since... I can't remember. Since we were toe-headed kids. You believed in magic then. Huh. Not me. Yes, you did. When we walked on different sides of the street lamp, you'd say bread and butter. When your baby teeth came out, you put them under your pillow for the tooth fairy. And when you went down the sidewalk, you were careful because you knew that if you stepped on a crack, you'd break your mother's back. <laughs> oh, you believed in magic all right. What is wrong with you, Charles? Would you like me to get the nurse? What happened, Ben? Where did the robbery take place? Robbery? A thief stole everything away when we weren't looking. Who was it, Ben? Was it time or something else? <sighs> we grew up, that's all. Everybody gets older. Do they think, Ben? How can we be sure? Maybe there are people who stay young, only we don't know it. Maybe they have a secret that they keep from the rest of us. Now, Charles... Is there something kids know that they forget? That they want to forget? They say, when I get big, I'll be a fireman or a detective or an explorer. They wish so hard to get older that it finally happens. They get taller and stiffer and forget the magic that made it all possible. There is something wrong with you. I've never heard you talk this way before. Maybe the fountain of youth isn't a fountain at all. Maybe it's a way of looking at things, a way of thinking. Charles? Yes? Stop it. Stop what? You're an old man. Don't you understand? Your youth has been gone for 60 years. Well, what I mean is, you lived a full life, Charles. Don't go sloppy now. Don't spoil it by acting like a nut. But it's all so clear. It makes sense. It isn't too late to play kick the can. That's the secret. Can't you see, Ben? Can't you? I see a plain old tin can with dents in it. That's all. Then look again. This can is special. I'm absolutely sure of it. And so, that's why I thought I should tell you. I'm glad you did. It's just that I can't stand to see him make a fool of himself. Of course not. And if there is something wrong with him, something in the head, then you can get him the right medication. You understand, don't you, Mr. Cox? I do, Mr. Conroy. You were right to come to me. When he acts that way, I feel I don't know him at all. It's foolish talk, I agree. So what are you going to do? Nothing. Beg pardon? At least not for the time being. If I got excited every time someone indulged in foolish talk around here, I'd be upset every minute of the day. Let him go on about kick the can if he wants. He isn't doing any harm. But I'm worried, I tell you. It, it, it isn't like him. He's getting on in years. It's common for folks of a certain age to behave like children once in a while. Oh, nonsense. He's no older than I am. In some ways, maybe, but in other ways, when some people get old, truly old, in their minds, they may act strangely, out of character. Take Mr. Agee, for instance. He's as sane as they come, but do you remember that ruckus out on the porch the other day? Somehow he got hold of some firecrackers... The nurse found him trying to set one off. It must have been those kids. Well, wherever he got them, he could have hurt himself. And that's something that concerns me. 
Charles hasn't done anything like that. I, I just don't want to hear him talking crazy. Oh, it isn't necessarily crazy. Huh? You, you haven't heard him. Look at it this way. As far as he's concerned, all his best years are behind him. He can't even look forward to spending time with his son and daughter-in-law. Huh, a fine thing. So, that being the case, he'd rather return to an earlier time, one he recalls with pleasure. It only makes sense from his point of view, so he uses a time machine to accomplish it. A what? It's called memory. Is that so crazy, Mr. Conroy? Everybody does it, even you. But... He actually believes he can be young again by playing kids' games. Not really. He's exploring, that's all. He'd like to believe that kick the can is a magic button he can push to make himself young. But deep down inside, he knows it won't work. Instead of the disappointment of failure, he'll never risk pushing that button to find out. Stop worrying. Your friend is fine. Are you certain? I'm certain. Until he does something to endanger his health or the health of others, there's no reason to interfere. Thanks for stopping by my office, though. Look at the time. You wouldn't want to miss dinner. <sighs> well, in that case, uh, I, I suppose... Uh, it still troubles you, doesn't it? What would you have me do? Maybe if you talked to him. It would be a waste of time. But you have a point. Perhaps I'm reluctant to face the facts myself. Every time one of our people goes senile, I get a little cold inside. When I took this assignment, I was 32. Now I'm 43. Everyone grows old, Mr. Conroy. Everyone. We should go in now. Yes. It turns chilly this time of day. Ah, stay a while. We can watch the sun go down. I've seen enough sunsets, thank you. Hey, it is the same. It's pretty sight. Puts me in the mind of back home. If we're going to stay on the porch, I'll need my sweater. Why don't you come inside with me, Mrs. Summers? Give me a moment to get my strength. There you all are. I wondered where you'd gone. Hello there, Whitley. Hello. We were just going in. Why? Before it gets dark. I uh, have my programs to watch. What's wrong with you people? Wrong? Nothing in particular. Then show a little life. Aren't you the same ones who used to skip rope and hunt pollywogs and night crawlers when the sun went down? Why, I don't think so. Don't ring a bell. Well, I was. If you can't remember it, I'll remember it for you. The weather was just like this back in Wheat Town of a summer evening. Right after dinner, you'd hear a banging of screen doors all down the block, and there we'd be, Stanley Maple, and his kid brother, Wes, and Ben Conroy, and the Arvis girls, and some others whose names I can't think of, the air would be soft like this, children with her. And we'd come out with no coats, and we'd start shouting and play kick the can. Yeah, you're right. Everybody played that game, absolutely everybody. Or catch, or, or hide and seek. <sighs> Seems like a million years ago. I was fastest runner on the block. Were you? Sure was. When we played kick the can, I was never it. But now, ooh, look at these legs. I remember. I remember. Sure you do. But we all grow old. I miss the running most. I think... If I could only run again, growing old wouldn't be so bad. I agree with that. That's one way to look at it. Maybe we can't run as far and as fast, but we can move about 
and there are lots of trees and bushes. If the hunted are handicapped, so is the hunter. You can't be serious. He... he isn't serious. But I am. I was the fastest runner on the block. Us? Children's games? It's the secret. Can't you see? The secret of youth. Well, now, I don't know about that. Look at this. What do you see? Ooh. What have you got there? Just what you think it is. The fountain of youth. The source of the Nile. Looks like a tin can to me. It's a good deal more than that. I promise. Take another look. Think. Feel. Have you forgotten how? Have you all gone too far to turn back? Back to what? You mean to what we were? Yes. Do you feel it inside you yet? Here, take the can, touch it, pass it around. Does it wake the part of you that's been asleep? Let me see that. Well? Why? It fits perfectly in my hands. Here, Mr. Agee, you try. Okay. Ooh, I thought it would be cold, but he's warm. <laughs> is it? Of course it is. Put it like a seashell. Now listen. To what? Can you hear it? Summer, grass, running and jumping, youth. I hear something. It's telling you to wake up. This is the last chance. Somebody, tell me I'm not crazy. Or if I am crazy, prove it to me. I can't play kick the can alone. Well, I don't know, Charlie. I'm not quite sure, but I think these legs, they might just work. Oh, there is a sprinkler. Yep. Every afternoon at this time. Now we must go in before mm. the spray blows this way. Yes. Sprinklers? I remember sprinklers. We all do, don't we? Hold on. Do you see it? See what? A rainbow. Look at it in the air above the lawn. Why, I believe I see it. Remember running through the sprinklers on a summer's day? What could be more fun than that? Wait, Charles. What are you going to do? What does it look like? I'm going to do what feels better than anything. Run through the sprinklers and cool off. Somebody hold my shoes. <laughs> well, look at him, will you? <laughs> This way, everybody. It feels great. Mr. Whitley. Charlie, what are you doing? Come on in. The water's fine. Nurse. Nurse. Yes? Help me get him inside. Yes, Doctor. Don't worry about me. I'm having a great time. That's enough. He's soaked. Get him some dry clothing and put him to bed before he comes down with pneumonia. Right away. Ah, oh, you're spoiled sports. That's what you are. I don't need any help. Don't be difficult, Mr. Whitley. Just come along. I'll get you a towel. What are you doing, Ben? Did you call them? It's for your own good, Charlie. You'll, you'll only hurt yourself. I thought we were friends. We are. That's why. This way, I'll bring your shoes later. All right, everybody. The party's over. But he wasn't hurting anyone, was he? You see, he's been talking to them. Pretty soon he'll have them believing it. I was afraid of something like this. Yeah, it's like he's gone crazy after all. I'll have him move to the observation room in the morning. But doctor, to be all alone, that, that'll kill him. If I don't, he'll end up killing himself. See now, me? Mr. Whitley, please try to understand. You want to put me in a special room? Alone? You don't leave me much choice. 
Why? What rules have I broken? There have been complaints. Oh, there have? Who from, may I ask? That's not the point. Go on, tell me. I want to know. Who thinks I'm breaking the rules? It's not so much a matter of rules as attitude. Look out the window. Grass, trees, a park across the street, all very peaceful. The kind of place people come to for rest and relaxation. It's what Sunnyvale is known for. But if things happen that rile them up, disturb their peace, well, then we can't stay in business. You see that, don't you? So the charge is disturbing the peace. And for that, you want to isolate me from my friends. I hope that won't be necessary now. You've got to go out there and show them you're all right. Cut the crazy talk. Learn to fit in. That's not hard, is it? What a choice. To keep that nurse from pawing at my pulse all day. I have to sit like a vegetable, stare into space. Listen, I'm trying to help you. Keep on like that and they'll put you away. I won't have a choice. Use your head. Maybe you're right. There. You see, you're an intelligent man. It's a question of playing the game. Isn't that something we all have to do? Yes, I suppose it is. Good, Mr. Whitley. I knew you'd see it my way. Now, why don't you go up and rest before dinner? Tonight's the bingo game, remember? I remember. Goodbye, Doctor. Goodbye, Mr. Whitley. Anytime you want to talk, feel free. I consider it part of my job. I made him change into fresh clothes. So I see. Thank you. Is he going to be all right? I think so. It must be quite a transition. Remind me of that when it's time, will you, nurse? Time for what? To pack it all in. Personally, I think I'd rather go back to the town where I grew up instead of rooming with a house full of strangers. Wake up. Oh. Who? What? Come. Charles, what is it? Shh. Quietly. Come where? We're going to play a game. What do you have there? What does it look like? Uh, an empty tin can. We're going to play kick the can now? It's dark outside. It usually is in the middle of the night. Now get your robe and come with me. Right, Hog. It's us. What? Uh, what? What? It's time. We're all gathering downstairs. Uh, w w why? Something important. It's a secret. What would Mr. Cox say? He'd say it was dangerous and foolish. He'd say it was crazy, and maybe it is. Maybe it's necessary to be a little crazy for magic to work. He'd say we'd be acting like children. But isn't that the idea? Only children can play kick the can. Now get the others. Freitag, wake Mrs. Summers. A.G., you get Mrs. Wister and Mrs. Knaus. Let me see, who else? There's Mr. Carlson. Everyone? Everyone. Well, what if they won't come? They've got to. Don't take no for an answer. Hurry. I heard people walking around. Whoa, what's going on here? Uh, Mr. Whitley has an idea. Would you like to come, too? Hello, Ben. Charles? What are you doing? Go on. Do as I said. Yeah, yeah. Right away. I'll see you downstairs. Y 
You should be sleeping. Everyone should be... What? What's that in your hand? No, Charles, you can't. Who says so? It's against the rules. The devil with the rules. It's our last chance, don't you see? Ben, Ben, come with us out to the lawn. Me? Yes, you. Ben, we always did everything together. Let's not stop now. Even if you think it's crazy, come out and play. Come to your senses, Charles. You think I'm obsessed? You think I've got hold of one crazy idea and won't let it go? Well, haven't you? Maybe so, but where I have one idea that's strangling me, you have dozens. You're the one obsessed. Oh, nonsense. Is it? You're afraid of death, but you're also afraid of life. You think age gives you the right to stop growing. You've sealed yourself inside your shell, and you're afraid to poke your head out and look around. That's enough. You're afraid of a new idea. You're afraid to look silly, afraid to make mistakes. You've decided you're an old man, and that's what's made you old. I am old, Charles, and so are you. It's a fact. Facts be damned. Your bones are old. They'll break if you try to run with them. Your heart is old. Your lungs are old. Don't you get it? You're used up, worn out by a lifetime. Sit down, Charles, before you fall down. Go back to your bed. I can't do that, Ben. Charles? I've got to find out. Won't you help me, Ben? There is magic in the world. I know there is. When I fell in love with Mary and kissed her for the first time, that was magic. When my boy was born, that was magic. The moon is magic and the stars. Friendship is a magic thing, too. Life is magic. Maybe I'm right, Ben. Can't you consider that? Maybe kick the can is the greatest magic of all. Well, what do you say? There's nothing to say. I just don't know how to get through to you anymore. Then I'll do it alone. What are we doing here? I'll catch my death. Now, you just wait. Mr. Whitley has something in mind. Yeah, something important. But what could it be? Don't you know? Don't you remember? Remember what? How it used to be. How we used to sneak out of the house after dark when the grown-ups weren't looking and the weather was like this. Don't you remember how we used to play kick the can? Everybody played in my neighborhood. A long time ago. A long, long time. Funny. It doesn't seem that long ago to me. I remember. Yes. I think I do, too. But we've all grown so old. Are you sure? If these legs would carry me. How do you know they won't until you try? You can't be serious. He isn't serious. But I am. You mean us? Children's games? What about the nurse? She's asleep. If we keep our voices down and open the door carefully, she won't hear us. Go outside? Why not? Are you chicken? Show them the can. Where did you get that? From some kids. They've already broken it in. Well, are you with me? Or do I have to play kick the can all by myself? Who, uh, who remembers the rules? Mr. Cox. Hold your horses, I'm coming. What is it? Mr. Cox, come quick. Keep your voice down. You'll wake everybody. They're already awake. Hurry, hurry. Y you've got to stop them. Calm down, will you? What, what are you talking about? You'll see. Come to the front room. 
Easy, Mr. Conroy. Now, what is it exactly that I'm supposed to see? There's no time to lose. But there's no one here. Why is the door open? Because they've gone outside. Why would they do that? It's like I said, to play kick the can. That was just a crazy idea. Mr. Whitley's forgotten all about it. No, no, you're wrong. They really mean to play. Calmly, please. You mean now, at this hour? That's right, and it's all because of Charlie. Now I'm really worried about him. What'll happen when it, when it doesn't work? He really believed it, see, that it would make him young. That's not the problem. What worries me is what will happen if he tries to run. He can't take the exertion. None of them can. Five, ten, Where? Fifteen, Look. Twenty, the front lawn. Everybody, let's hide. This is gonna be good. Over here, hurry up. 85, 90, 95, 100. Ready or not? Where are they? <laughs> and what are these kids doing here? I told them to stay away. Look out! Run, Amanda, run! Maybe, maybe they're around the other side. I'll go check. Hey, kick the can over to me. Hey, Ben! Look at me! I told you it would work. Charles? Come on, you want to play? No, no, it can't be. Ben, you better hurry up, or it'll be too late for you. Charles! Yeah, hurry up, or it'll be too late. What is it? Do you see them yet? Gotcha. Is... is that... <laughs> Here, you kids, <laughs> how many times do I have to tell you, go home? Ah, get out no, of my way. wait. <laughs> what are you doing here this time of night? One, two, Charles? Three, you're out. Charlie? Sorry, Ben. I wish you could have believed. I gotta go. Charlie. Hey, kick it over here, over here. Charlie, take me with you. Get away and stay away. Mr. Cox, please. Last one over fences right today. Come on, let's go. <laughs> I can't climb that. Charlie, high. wait. <laughs> wait. Charlie. Hey, you guys. We gotta find the others. They can't have gone far. I bet Whitley's taken them down to the orchard. No. Why? Look all you want, Mr. Cox. <laughs> you won't find them. Wait here. You, you forgot your can, Charlie. But don't you worry, none. I'll keep it for you. Inside. In case you ever come back for it. Come on, let's play kick the can. <laughs> come on, let's hide. You will never find me. You can't catch me. I'm too fast. Ha ha, you missed me. Come on. No, kick it to me. Kick it to me. Gotcha. Yeah. Ollie, Ollie, Ollie. Sunnyvale Rest Home, a place for people too ancient to remember the fragile magic of youth. A place for those who have forgotten that childhood, maturity, and old age are magically intertwined. A dying place for those who have grown too stiff in their thinking to revisit the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. 
where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at TwilightZoneRadio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. Kick the Can, starring Stan Freeberg and Shelley Berman with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcherson and written for The Twilight Zone by George Clayton Johnson. Heard in the cast were Christian Stolte, Kurt Napig, Herb Graham, Joby Cerny, Doug James, Roz Alexander, Meg Falcon, Renee Matthews, Sarah Wellington, C.J. Amari, Natalie Byrne, Amanda Amari, Mitchell Hernandez, Julia Cosmos, Robert Gertish, Matthew Gertish, and Brayden Luke. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises and the Rod Serling Estate for making this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group and Westwood One. Sound design and custom Foley effects for The Twilight Zone by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Craig Lee, Michael Slabach, and Matt Sorrow. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Shouldn't be long, eh, Cap? Not unless they move to Italy. I bet old Benita would like to do that. We're almost there. See that mountain range just over the horizon? Well, now, what do you know? I think I might have seen that a few times. All we do is maintain course and the boot will pop right up big as life. Sounds like you've done this before, Captain. You like Italian food, Blake? Me? Uh, yeah, spaghetti's okay. No meatballs, though. They give me heartburn. Okay. No meatballs. Beautiful day like this, I thought we'd just bomb the supply dump and sit down and have us some lunch before we head back. How's that sound? You picking up the tab? Don't worry about it. This one's on Mussolini, his own personal mess hall. Yeah? Special orders. I hear the Allies can drop in any time. Oh, I get it. So we'll quit pounding him, huh? Plus, he wants to show off what a good cook he is. Watch out for the garlic, though. That's his secret weapon. Lousy greaser. I got something for him. There it is. Target in view, Jimenez. How's our time? On the money, Captain. Set the Bombay doors. Check. Ready to release on your command. Take her down 400 feet. Hope they don't have no big guns today. They don't. That's why we're going to win this war. Another 200 feet. Let's drop these babies right down the smokestack. Yes, sir. Is that flak? I don't believe it. Give me some altitude. Looks like the jerks finally got some artillery. Pull up on the stick. I'm pulling. (laughs) That was too close for comfort. Pull up, I said. Climbing, Captain. Higher. We're hit. Kransky, you okay? Waste gun good, Captain. Connors? Missed the tail by a mile. Fine. We took a hit on the starboard engine, sir. Looks like we're losing fuel. Then let's drop our payload and get out of here. Fast. Yes, sir. Mayday, Mayday. This is King 9 calling Firefly. King 9 calling Firefly. Come in, Firefly. This is the war in Europe, 1943. The air spits out violence and destruction, and the sandy graveyard of North Africa swallows it up. Her name is King Nine, a B-25 medium-range bomber, 12th Air Force, USAAF. On this hot, still morning, she took off to bomb the southern tip of Italy, manned by a crew who knew the risks when they signed on. Between them, they have several thousand hours of flight time, much of it in combat. 
They have followed these coordinates before, armed with a deadly payload for the enemy. A fairly routine run, certainly not her first, but unfortunately, it may be her last. Because this time she's taken a hit that's forced her off course and into a region not listed on any map. She won't return to home base on this day or any other. But as Captain Robert Embry is about to find out, like a resilient human being, she dies hard, especially in the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, King Nine Will Not Return, starring Adam Baldwin with Stacy Keach as your narrator. What's the damage, Blake? We took a hit on the wing tank, Captain. How bad? Needle's dropping fast. We're leaking fuel. How much? A lot. Jimenez, what's our position? Ten degrees off course, Captain. Airspeed's dropping. Losing altitude. How far from base? Too far. We'll never make it. We may have to ditch. Down there, oh, mama mia. Take a look around. See anything? Nothing but sand, sand, and more sand. Looks like one great big beach and no ocean. Then get ready for some belly surfing. Landing gear? Leave it up. Won't do any good. The sand's too soft. Connors, climb. All crew, strap it in. We're gonna attempt an emergency landing. Flaps down. Level her out! She won't hold! Pull up! Get over that dune! There goes the other engine! Hang on! <laughs> She's holding! We're gonna belly in like a glider. Nice and easy. Piece of cake, Captain. Piece of cake! Watch it! Watch it! We're coming in too fast! I can do this! I promise you! Captain! Look out! I remember now. More and more, one piece at a time. First the wing tank was hit by flak. Then we lost fuel. Fell behind, veered off course. Not the moment of impact, though. The crash, that's still pretty much a blur. But I remember holding the wheel. Trying to hold it. The way she bellied in and then yawed at the last second. That brought the nose down into a dune and... And all of a sudden, it was over. When I couldn't hold her straight, she yawed and skidded through the sand. That must have been the way it happened. It must have been... I honestly don't know how long I was out. It might have been minutes or hours. Uh, uh. Hey, guys! Guys! We made it! Hey! Where are you? Where is everybody? We're alive, you hear me? We're still alive! The crew. What about the crew? Did they bail out? Did I order them to bail out? No. No, I didn't. I remember that much. We rode it in together. They stayed with me all the way down. Because I'm the captain. Yeah, that's right. Captain Robert Embry, that's who I am. Blake's my co-pilot, him and as the navigator. Kransky, radio op and waste gun. Connors, he was tail gunner. And Klein, sure. Klein, he was the upper turret gun. Uh, Let's see. Who else? Think. (laughs) Gotta think. It was coming back to me, but I wasn't 100%, not by a long shot. My leg was racked up and my head felt like someone caught me with a left jab and a right hook that put me flat on the canvas. Now I saw the plane about 100 yards away and I knew I had to get back inside to see if the guys were okay. Blake! Jimenez! I kept walking toward it, but it didn't get any closer. That's the way things are in the desert. Something about all that sand and nothing to measure it by. But I kept going. I had to help them if I could. If there was any way, any hope. Are you all right? Connors! I climbed up on the wing and finally got in through the gun turret. I dropped down inside. Blake? 
Blake, answer me. That's an order. And there was Blake's cap on the co-pilot's seat. I knew it was his, but I turned it over and looked inside anyway. Blake, Gerald S. First Lieutenant, USAAF. And the radio op. His headset still plugged into the radio, but he wasn't there either. Jimenez. And Connors. All gone. If they were still on board when the plane crashed, then where were their... their bodies? No, no, I couldn't let myself think that way. Piece it together, that's what I have to do. Piece it all together. We bellied in. We bellied in and I must have been thrown clear of the plane. That's what happened. Sure. Knocked me cold. I could have been out for hours. And the others, th they... What about the others? Where are they? They didn't jump. They couldn't have. The chutes are still here. All of them. And they're not dead. They couldn't be dead. They're no... No bodies. But if they left the plane and started walking, why didn't they take me? <gasps> Morse code. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. We're here. Wait. Give that to me one more time. Mayday, Mayday, this is King Nine calling Firefly. King Nine calling Firefly. Pancaked in the desert. One hour, 30 minutes from last checkpoint. Bearing 290 degrees. Terrain flat and sandy. Low hills to the north. No other landmarks. No sign of crew. Mayday, Mayday. King Nine to Firefly. Come in, please. No answer. Nothing in the headphones. Not a blasted thing. Easy now. Easy. Don't panic. Go back to where this all started. The last thing I remember. I'm sitting in the cockpit. Right here. We're dipping. The ground's coming up to meet us, and we're sitting down hard. Flaps down. Level her out. Get over that doom. She won't hold. I can do this. I promise you. crew. The whole crew was in the plane, and now they're gone, all of them. And I'm here with a king-size headache. So what? I got off easy. Nothing to worry about. But the main thing, the main thing is not to forget. I'm responsible for this crew. I'm in charge. As far as it's within my power, I've got to keep them alive. I've got to keep them out of this. Every last man. I command this aircraft, and I'm responsible. I'm in charge. Nobody else. I'm responsible for all of them. Klein, Jimenez, Connors, Blake, Kransky. Every last man. Who's out there? Blake? Is that you? Blake? Blake? No. It's not you, is it? Just a piece of the tail assembly. Well then... Where are you, Blake? Guess you wouldn't leave any footprints. Not for long in this wind. What in the... What is this? Klein, William F. Tech Sergeant, USAAF. Klein? Sergeant Klein? You... Incredibly stupid jerk, you dropped your canteen! You dumb Bronx cowboy, you idiot! You're gonna need water out here! Don't you know that? Don't you know anything? I still got a nursemaid, you, huh? Is that it? This is some crew I got here. <laughs> some crew, all right. Run around dropping canteens full of water. You couldn't find your way off a golf course without a map. And I gotta stick around and wipe your noses and comb your hair and see that you wash behind your ears because you... You're the worst bunch of survivors I ever... Wait! That's the plane. Somebody's trying to start her up. But... Who? Hey! Hold up! That's my plane! But... Who's in the cockpit? Who's in my plane? Is that you, Blake? Blake! 
I see you. Right there in the pilot's seat. <laughs> Don't tell me that's not you. Look at me, over here. I'm over here. Blake! Blake. Blake. Blake, it's Embry. It's me. It's the captain. I'm here. I'm here, Blake. Blake, what's the matter with you? Can't you hear me? Blake! Where are you? Where'd you go? What's the gag, Blake? Hey, come on, fellas. If this is a gag, knock it off. It's not funny anymore. Strictly not funny at all. Why are you guys hiding from me? Don't you get it? I'm only trying to do my job. That was when I knew, really knew, something was very wrong. It was more than the flak and veering off course and the crash and not knowing where I was. Oh, I was in the desert all right. But where exactly and where was my crew? Huh? If someone was playing mind games with me, the question is who and for what reason? Because wherever I was now, I wasn't just in the middle of a desert in North Africa. If I was the only one there after all, then the mind games had to be going on in my own head and not anybody else's. The big question was, why? The first thing I had to do was pull myself together and find out if I really was alone. And if I was, what the devil had happened to the others? I had to find out, don't you see? Whether I survived or not, I had to know. Gonna be a long night, get a campfire going, then they'll see where I am. Hey! You out there, guys? <laughs> sure you are. You started walking, didn't you? With or without your canteens and your rations. But you won't get very far, you couldn't have. I wasn't out that long. You watch it, boys, the animals are restless tonight. Whatever kind of animals live in the desert. Blake! Jimenez! Connors! Klein! The whole lot of you! This is your captain speaking! Look over your shoulder! Here I am! I'm waiting! This is King Nine. King Nine calling Firefly. Come in, Firefly. Let me tell you something, Firefly, if you're still out there. Now listen up. You better respond before the batteries run out, because I might not be here when you fly over. I might not even be here now. For all I know, I'm already dying out there. Lying in the sand with a fractured skull. This is all going on inside my brain-damaged head. For all I know, this whole thing is one big hallucination. Sure. Think about it. If I see something, or if I only think I see something, how can I tell the difference? How could I be sure? Could you? You ever have a nightmare, Firefly? Huh? Really bad nightmare? Well, you were scared, weren't you? Just the same as if it really happened. Sure you were. Yeah. Your eyes moved around and you were breathing fast and your heart was beating a mile a minute. So what's the difference? I mean, really, what's the answer? The only way you ever found out was when you woke up. This whole time, I, I could be sleeping, having a dream. Maybe I'll wake up and I'll be back at the base, or... <laughs> I tied one on and I'm in a booth right now with a girl I met in a bar someplace. Oh, wouldn't that tear it? Wouldn't that really, truly tear it? <laughs> when the medics get a hold of me, they'll never let loose. They'll put me in a straitjacket and send me on tour like a freak. If they ever let me out of the loony bin, that is. <sighs> but for now, I think I'll just take that chair him and his was sitting in and carry it outside and keep the fire burning. Because <sighs> that's the only thing I can do till wake up. Hallucination hell. I saw Blake. 
I saw my co-pilot sitting in that cockpit. That was no hallucination. I saw him. Nobody can tell me any different. Maybe I'm a little woozy, but I'm not that far gone yet. Concentrate. I gotta keep my head clear. Piece it together. I'm Robert Embry. Captain. I fly a B-25 bomber. It's called King-9. It crash-landed in the desert. This desert right here. Because I ran out of fuel. Yes, I did. I did that. And now I gotta keep the fire going. So they'll see. And come back. You're responsible for the ship and the men. You, mister. Now you gotta pick up the dice and you gotta throw until you make a pass. That's the hand and you gotta make it. Six the point. Six crewmen. They're in your hands. So what do you do first? You build the fire up. The chair will burn a long time, soon as it catches. Here's some more newspaper from the base this morning. What's it say on the front page? Uh, can't make it out. Picture of a plane. B-25 Mitchell aircraft found. Just like this one. Whose plane is that? Another one went down. Well, at least they found it. Maybe they'll find this one, too. Sure they will. Just gotta wait a while. Uh. Embry, Robert, 24 years old. I took pre-flight training at Amarillo, and then I took multiple engine at Randolph, and I went to England. And then to... to Africa. And now we're based in... We're based in Tunisia. And we were on a routine mission to southern Italy and we caught some stray flak where there wasn't supposed to be any. And then we ran out of fuel. And I got the poor devils off. Of course. I did that too. It was my fault. I got that much down, no question about it. It was my fault. But where are they? Where'd they all go? Hey! Hey, fellas! No more hide and seek, okay? Time to come home now. Dinner's ready. Come to Papa. Fellas! Uh, fellas! What's this? A cross? Made out of metal? From the plane. And a flak helmet hanging down. But who? Who put it here? Huh. Somebody wrote something. Tech Sergeant William F. Klein died of wounds received in crash April 5th, 1943. Rest in peace, buddy. The crew. Oh, Klein, I didn't know. I didn't know. I'm sorry. I had no idea. Rest in peace, kid. Rest in peace. Captain! Huh. Who goes there? Blake! Is that you, Blake? Captain, Captain, Captain. Connors? Hello, Captain. Kransky! It's you and... Who's that? Here, sir. Huh. Jimenez! And the man next to you, what... What's the matter with his face? Is that blood? All present and accounted for, sir. Klein, I don't believe it. You... You're not dead. Well, neither am I. Neither am I. I'm here, fellas. We're all here. We can do it. Whatever it takes. Come on. Plane's over here. I'll show you. See? It's kind of banged up, and the aft fuel tank's definitely shot. But the other engine looks okay. And some of the instrumentation's haywire. Of course, we'll have to get our wheels down. We'll have to raise the ship and get under there. Because we're not going to walk out of here, that's for sure. That's a definite. Can't walk out, so we're gonna have to fly. But I'll get her up, boys. You can trust me. I'll get her back up. How does that... <laughs> hey! <laughs> hey, where'd you go? <laughs> you hiding behind that sand dune again? What do you want to do that for, huh? <laughs> hey, guys. Where are you? 
Listen to me. We can do it. I can do it. You'll see. All we have to do is get this propeller out of the sand and free it up. Hey, team. You can talk, you know. Talk to me. Yell at me if you want. Tell me off. But say something. Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? It doesn't matter. You were never here. You were never here. Your illusions, mirages, that's all you are. You don't even exist. But there are no mirages at night. Only during the day, when the heat waves come off the sand. So either I'm dead, or out of my mind, or I'm off in limbo someplace. I'm unconscious, I'm sick, that's it. I'm cracked up in an army ward, or I'm down in the drink somewhere, drowning. Or I don't even exist any more than you do. There isn't a thing here, not a single thing that's real. Oh God. Oh God, you gotta tell me what's happening here. You gotta tell me. Please. You gotta give me a sign. What? What is that? Aircraft. I can see their lights. Yes! But they're moving too fast. I've never seen planes like that before. I've never even seen jets. I couldn't have, not yet. Jets. Jet aircraft. What do I know about jet aircraft? It's 1943. There's no such thing as jets yet, but I know about them. F-106s, F-105s, B-47s, B-52s, B-58s. I know all about them. I am Captain Robert Embry, United States Army Air Force. I'm the pilot of this bomber right here. We went to Italy this morning because... because it's... World War II, and it's not over yet, and I'm right in the middle of it. Hey, crew! We've got to get out of here! we got to get out of here! we got to get out of here! Because if we stay here, I'll have to dig more graves and bury you all with my bare hands. Don't you worry, I'll take care of it because it's my responsibility. <laughs> yes. And I'll dig one more while I'm at it. One for your captain. One for me, too. It's your Tribune here. All the news. Latest on the Kennedys. Big changes in Cuba. Mystery plane found in the desert. Read all about it. I'll take one. Ten cents. Get your latest news right here. Paging Dr. Benway. Dr. Benway, please go to ICU. VA hospital, please hold. Where's Dr. Martin's office? Third floor to your right. Thank you. Veterans Administration, how may I direct your call? Dr. Martin. Yes? Stephen Markham. Oh, thanks for coming over on such short notice. Not a problem. Your patient, Embry, is that his name? Robert Embry. Age 41. He was admitted a few hours ago. May I see his chart? It happened this morning. He went by a newsstand, looked at a paper, and went into shock. When the ambulance got there, he was almost catatonic. This newspaper? Yes, that's the one. And that's what set him off? The front page? That's why I thought we should have a psychiatrist in on it. Odd. I thought so, too. So after he came around and told me the story, I spent the day digging into the fellow's background. I checked with the Pentagon in Washington. It's all confirmed. The information's in the file. He was a captain in the Air Force. 
Flew a B-25, Africa and Italy. 37 missions. Discharged in August 1943. Recurrent fevers. Any trouble since? Nothing. But if you look back at his original record, there is some suggestion of a psychological disturbance early on. He was discharged before they could find out much about it. It was all brought out in a Squadron MO's report just before his discharge. And this was his plane? That's the one. B-25 Mitchell bomber found. World War II bomber found intact in the desert. Lies 17 years in sand. Remains of crew not yet located. Hard to believe, isn't it? His plane and his crew, the King of Hearts. They took off for Italy on what was supposed to be a routine bombing mission. They'd done it many times before. But Embry never went on that last mission. He reported to sickbay that morning and someone else flew the plane for him. His co-pilot, Blake. It never returned. And for 17 years, he's known that and carried it around with him, buried deep in his gut. Not deep enough. When he saw the picture of his plane on the front page, he wasn't able to keep himself from letting out one scream and then going into shock. The mind is a very delicate thing. Sometimes there's an infinitely fragile balance. We never know how fragile until something sets it off and tips the balance one way or the other. Something like this. Completely out of left field. How's he doing? I was just going to check on him again. Why don't you come along? Oh, Doctor. I'm glad you're here. Did he get any rest? For an hour or so. He still seems agitated and disoriented. Thank you, nurse. Dr. Markham here would like a word with him. Of course. How are you feeling, Mr. Embry? Sorry, I don't know what's wrong with me. That's what we're here for. To get you back on your feet. That's our job. Crazy dream. <sighs> Crazy. Was it? I went back. Where? The desert. Take it easy, Mr. Embry. You don't have to go over it again. Go ahead. You went back, and then what? Back to the ship. I tried to find the guys. I... I looked for them, looked all over, I swear. But they were gone. I... I thought I saw Blake and then the others, but it wasn't real. A mirage. Yeah, a mirage. An illusion, that's all. He wasn't there. None of them were. It was an illusion, Mr. Embry. You know that now, don't you? Uh, I, I guess so. I guess so. It seemed so real. It's over now. All that's behind you. Is it? I should have been on that plane. I should have gone on that mission. I chickened out. You didn't chicken out, and you had no way of knowing that the plane would never come back. You'll realize that as time goes on, and you'll feel better for it, Mr. Embry. It's out in the open now. You don't have to keep it buried inside you. That's what's been hurting all these years. How did you know? You've been carrying around one gigantic guilt complex for something that wasn't your fault. Buried. Yeah. Buried. I found Klein's grave. Did I tell you that? He was killed in the crash. Take it easy. But then I saw him. And I saw the others, too. I thought I did. I thought I did for a moment. The whole crew. I would have buried them, you know. The last thing I dreamed, I would... I was digging graves for them in the sand so they could be buried just like he was. You need to get some sleep now. I'll ask the nurse to give you a sedative. As soon as you're ready, you can get back to your life. But there's no hurry about that. What you need right now is rest. Another crazy thing. Another part of the dream, uh, whatever it was. I was standing in the desert. And I asked for a sign. And I looked up. And there were these planes overhead in the night sky. They were moving fast. Oh, and they made streaks. And I could tell by the sound. They were jets. Isn't that wild? It was 1943 in the African desert, and up above me were jet planes. F-105s and 106s. Just as if... as if I'd gone back there today. Did I? Did I go back? 
to the plane. Is that... Is that possible? Well, of course it is. In your mind. That's how you went back, Mr. Embry. In your mind. The greatest time machine of all. Go to sleep, Captain Embry. You're entitled. You're going to be all right. Thank you, Doctor. So, what do you think? I'd like to talk to him again in a couple of days, start a treatment plan on a regular basis. I can set that up for you. But I think the worst part of it's already over. The guilt's out in the open, and he knows what it is. And the dream? The delusion? Right now, it's still so fresh, it feels very real to him. In a few days, in a week or two, it'll lose its reality. You sure? Nothing's guaranteed, and that's why I want the follow-up. But in a case like this... Actually, I've never seen a case quite like this one. So much information coming back to him in a rush and generating a new set of memories he'd never had before. It's going to be one for the case books. Absolutely fascinating. He seems like a decent man. Yes, he does. And that's exactly what got him into this state. His fundamental decency. He has a conscience. If he weren't a good man, he wouldn't be vulnerable. And would have one less patient. I'd have a whole lot fewer. Is that Mr. Embry's room, Doctor? That's right. His clothes are in this bag. It was left in the examination room. You can give it to me, nurse. I'm going back in. Thank you, Doctor. What's that? I really don't know. Looks like sand. Yes, it does. Sand? Now, where in the world did that come from? I wish I knew. It was in one of his shoes. Could be from the seashore, Jones Beach. Or... Or... Where else could it be from? It could come from a desert. Really, now? I read the article in the paper. It said there were no bodies found in the area, not a single one. Well, the sand would have covered them over. The sand didn't cover the plane. It was sitting there, perfectly preserved. There would have been something left of the crew, too, their bones at least. Unless... Unless what? Unless someone dug graves and buried them. Mr. Embry. Looks like he finally dozed off. Good. Good for him. I'll just leave his things. Shirt, trousers, jacket, and shoes. Complete with several ounces of white sand. Where do you suppose it's from? Maybe a fishing trip he took recently? Very recently. Or from a plane. From a B-25 called the King of Hearts. Wherever it's from, rest easy, Mr. Embry. You've had a long journey back, very long. Now you can rest. Meanwhile, I'll leave your shoes by the bed. You'll need them when you're back on your feet, which will be soon. Very soon indeed. Captain Embry. Godspeed. Portrait of an enigma buried in the sand. A question mark with broken wings that lies in silent grace. A marker in a distant desert shrine. Odd how the real consorts with the shadows. How the present fuses with the past. How could it happen? The question is on file in a barren desert. And the answer? The answer is waiting for us in the twilight zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com, where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone.
King Nine Will Not Return, starring Adam Baldwin with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Rich Kamenick, Christian Stolte, Craig Wickman, Doug James, Linda Ryder, Michelle Graff, Paul Patch, Carl Amari, Roger Walski, and Vince Amari. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. Unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Come on, Mac. Let's go. Out in the backyard. You got plenty of water, big guy. What's the matter? Something out there? Hey, maybe it's a squirrel. Nothing you can't handle. <laughs> See you in the morning, big guy. promise. Daddy and I are in the next room. Hey, sweetie. Ready for bed? Daddy, I want Mac. He's outside where he belongs. But I need him. No, you don't. This is where you belong, in your room. But I... You're a big girl, aren't you? Yes. A very big girl. And big girls have their own rooms. In the morning, I'll make your favorite breakfast. Waffles? Waffles, for all three of us. But it's scary in here. Tina, honey, stop it. Will you leave the door open? Sure, sweetie. Plus, you have your nightlight. Come on, Ruth. But, Mommy... If anything frightens you, call for me. I'll come right away. Nothing's going to frighten her. The house is locked up tight as a drum. But what if the bad man comes? Oh, Tina, really? Hey, then Mac will get him. He's a good dog, isn't he? Yes. Go to sleep now. Can I have a drink of water? Of course. Night-night, sweetheart. Night. Don't let the bed bugs bite. She's been scared of her own shadow lately. Yeah, separation anxiety. New room and all. Did you hear what she said? The bad man. Where did she get that? Maybe she's on to something. What's that supposed to mean? Like Mac. He hears things, doesn't he? He's a dog, Chris. Well, kids hear things. See them, too. Oh, I remember when I was little, my sister used to tell me about... The Nighthawk. The what? That's a good question. I never did find out. But she'd say, The Nighthawk's gonna get you. Oh. Kept me on my toes. What a mean sister. Mm, maybe she was just looking out for me. I thought I saw all sorts of things. Face in the window, something in the yard. You would. Just the same, maybe there are things we can't see. Just kids and animals. That's enough, Chris. Like when Mac hears a squirrel or smells another dog down the street, but we can't because we don't have the senses. Next, you're going to tell me that there is a bad man. I didn't say that. Now I won't sleep a wink. That's not what I mean. Oh, what do you mean? Nothing. I don't know what I'm talking about. No, you don't. Come to bed. Sorry. You should have been a science fiction writer. 
visible world. Nice. Makes me feel all safe and secure. I said I'm sorry. Well, this is the real world. Remember that. I'm turning out the light. Mommy? Uh, now what? Oh, I forgot to get her a drink of water. If you get up every time, she'll never go to sleep. But I promised. One time. That's it. Agreed? Agreed. The voice of one frightened little girl. Name, Bettina Miller. Tina for short. Description, six years of age, average height and build. Blonde, quite pretty. Last seen being tucked into bed by her mother only a few minutes ago. Last heard, aye, there's the rub as Hamlet puts it, for she can still be heard quite clearly, despite the curious fact that very soon she won't be seen at all. Not by her father or mother or anybody else. Present location? In the next bedroom, or so it seems. At this moment, it might be more accurate to say that she's just become a resident of an unseen world called the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, Little Girl Lost. Starring Stephen Tobolowski with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Chris? <sighs> Not again. But she sounds so scared. Yeah, yeah. Mommy? Listen to her. I'm going. Where are my slippers? I don't know what's wrong now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll talk to her. One last time. <sighs> All right, sweetie, daddy's coming. Quiet, Mac! <sighs> What's the matter now, Tina? T... Where are you? Against the wall? Here I am. Take my hand. Tina, where'd you go? <laughs> Did you fall off? I'll lean down it. Not against the wall, huh? Did you roll under the bed? Take it easy, I'm here. <laughs> Tina! <laughs> Where are you? Daddy. Over here. Come on out, baby. You must have crawled under the bed. Now reach out. Reach out for my hand. What happened to you? Daddy. Where in the... Hold on, I'll get the light switch. Daddy, help me. I'm trying, baby, but I don't see... Chris, what is it? I don't know. What's the matter? She's not here. What do you mean, she's not? I turned on the light. I can't... Tina? Mommy's here. See for yourself. This is ridiculous. Tina? Tina! I already looked under the bed. All the way to the wall. It's clear there's nothing. I'm trying, baby. Chris? Where is she? I don't know. But I can hear her right in front of me. I can't, too. It doesn't make sense. I'm looking under the bed. The, the floor's clear. It's absolutely empty. There's, I don't see anything. Honey, I don't know what to tell you. What are we going to do? Quiet, Mac! Quiet, Mac! Listen, what's happening to her? Where is she? I'm tired, Mommy. Going to sleep now. Tina? Tina? Bill. Yeah. Bill, it's Chris. Oh, hi. What time is it? Can you come over? When? Now? I'm sorry, but it's an emergency. What's the matter? It's Tina. What happened? That's just it. I don't know. You don't... She's disappeared. From the house? 
You mean she wandered off? No, no. Somebody took her? She hasn't been kidnapped. Well, then what? I can't explain. She's here. I is she injured? I don't think so, but... So she's okay? I don't know. <sighs> Let me get this straight. She's there, and she's not hurt, and she's... She's here, but she's not here. I don't follow. Bill, for God's sake, get over here. I don't know who else to call. And hurry. She's still asleep. That's what it sounds like. Ruth, stand up. Shouldn't we wake her? I called Bill. Bill? He's coming over. He's a physicist. Maybe he what can... What do we need a physicist for? It's all I could think of. Shouldn't we call 911? And tell them what? That our daughter rolled off the bed and now we can hear her, but we can't see her. Oh, God. Where is she, Chris? Where is she? I'm going to look under the house. Under the house? Why? There's no hole in the floor, is there? Not that I could see. Oh. I better let Mac in. He's going to wake up the whole neighborhood. Sit on the edge of the bed. Wait here for me. Get the flashlight. It's in the kitchen. Right. Come here, boy. Mac, where are you going? Mac! What's wrong with him? He's after something. Like he's got a scent. He's trying to get under the bed. Grab him! I can't! Where did he go? I don't know. Step back. He's got to be under there. Mac! Come on out, boy! Here, Mac! He's not, is he? Now don't jump to conclusions. He's... with Tina. He's here. Bill. I got here as fast as I could. Thanks. What's up? I'd tell you if I could, but you wouldn't believe it. Try me. I wouldn't know where to start. You better see for yourself. See what? They're in the bedroom. You remember Bill, honey? From work? Ruth? She's still asleep. Listen. Where's your daughter? Uh, under there? Take a look. I don't see anything. Neither do we. Do you have a flashlight? Here. You were right. About what? Don't believe it. Let's move the bed. Bill, where is she? I'm about to lose my mind. Well, at least she's breathing normally. So she must be okay. Take the other end. Got it. Wait. It's not that heavy. Uh, we better mark where the legs were. Why? Do what he says. Anything will work. You know, those books in the corner. Put one on the floor here and here. I don't see. Thanks. Now, from the front, lift. Right. Two more under this end. Here? Perfect. Now, lift it away from the wall just a few feet. There. All right, now set it down. Okay. You can still hear it. That, that's her breathing? Yes. And these four books mark where the bed was. The sound of her voice is inside the rectangle. The dog was, too, a while ago. Dog? Mac, I let him in the house, and he ran straight for this spot, dove under the bed, and poof. He was gone, too. But we could still hear him. Not now, though. Not now. You felt the entire area? All over, several times. And? Nothing. Okay. What are you doing? Stepping very, very carefully into the rectangle. Looking for... The opening, maybe. The... I want to cover everything between here and the wall. The opening to what? I don't know yet, Ruth. Quiet. There. Do you hear? I hear. 
You're moving as if you're afraid you're going to step on her. But there's no hole in the floor. You can see that. Yes. Why are you moving your hand? To cover the air above the floor as well. I did that. We both did. Well, maybe not every inch, but... All right, take it easy. I'm almost at the wall. I don't get it. Get what? It's not in front of the wall. So that means it must be... Bill! Look out! Your hand's going into the wall. Pull out! Pull out! I guess I found it. Found what? Bill, what was that? Your whole hand disappeared into the wall. It did. I saw it. So did I. This must be it. What is? The opening. To where? I'm not sure. But off the top of my head, I'd say... to another dimension. Another what? Dimension. You think this is a joke, Bill? No, I don't. Then why? I don't know if I'm right or not. I can't think of anything else, though. Anything else but... Look, there are three dimensions that we can see. Height, width, and depth. The fourth dimension is time. Now, if you know these, you can place anything. Where something is and when exactly. Like, uh, what time is it now? 1.12 a.m. on this particular date in this location. Why are we talking about this? Wait, hear him out. There may be other dimensions as well. Science is still arguing about how real they are. But there could be doorways to these other times and places. Other realms. And some of those doorways have been verified. Have you heard of wormholes? I don't see what all this has to do with my little girl. Wait, I think I'm getting it. Tina must have fallen out of bed. Accidentally rolled under it and gone through. Like my hand. Did that actually happen? I couldn't believe my eyes. Well, one way to find out. Let's try it again and be sure. Bill, don't! Right about here, wasn't it? I was touching the wall to see if it was solid and... It's happening again. Oh, this is it. An invisible opening of some sort. I can't see your hand. Pull it back. There. I'm okay. What did it feel like? There was no sensation. It's just that for a second, my hand was out of the visible spectrum. Where was it? That's what we have to figure out. I, I don't care about the reason. I just want Tina back. That's where Mac went to? Must be. He's probably with her now. But why? He could have sensed it. Animals are sharper about that sort of thing than we are. He must have known she was in there and gone after her. But we have eyes too. Why can't we see them? Because some things may be right in front of us, but we have a blind spot. Such as? Do you have any change on you? What? Wait a minute, I do. Here, here, here's a quarter. Now, hold it out at arm's length, between your thumb and your finger. Yeah, that's it. Now, I want you to stare straight ahead at the ceiling light and move the quarter just off center a few degrees to the right. Approximately the three o'clock position. But don't move your eyes. Go ahead, try. Wait a minute. What do you see? Nothing. I can't see the quarter anymore. Exactly. But if you move it an inch or two right or left, or up or down. There it is again. It always was there, right in front of you, but you couldn't see it. Do you know why? Because you have a blind spot on your retina. It's a very small area where the optic nerves tie together. You'd never know it. How can you be aware of what you can't see? But whatever's there is still there, isn't it? I mean, whether you see it or not. I never noticed that before. You could go your whole life and never notice it, unless there was some reason to. But it's been there all along, invisible, like the quarter. Well, now that I know where she is, I'm going after her. 
No. Don't try to stop me. She's my little girl. We don't know what else is in there or how far it leads. My daughter is in there. I know that, Ruth, but we can't just... Why not? You put your hand in and you pulled it out twice. We don't have enough information yet. Tina is right in front of us, on the other side of this dimensional opening or whatever it is. All we have to do is reach in and... If it's that simple, why hasn't Mac found her yet? If I'm right, and this is a, a kind of gap or blind spot, an opening to another dimension, it wouldn't be laid out the same as our world, would it, Chris? There must be something we can do. Listen to the man, honey. You got a pencil? Anything to write with? Check Tina's drawer. Only crayons. That'll do. Uh, a black one. Here. Now... Let's see just how big this thing is. I'll have to mark up your wall. Go ahead. This is solid. And this. And this. Ooh, but not here. The same spot I touched before. All right, I'll mark it with a dot. Take your hand out first. Right. And all around the edges, where it's still solid, There. These marks form a rough outline of the opening. And you're saying it's always been there? Oh, my God. That's why she didn't want to sleep in here. She knew somehow. She could have fallen through at any time. Oh, uh, I doubt it. Why not? Because locations are in space and time. The fourth dimension, remember? <sighs> Lord knows, I'm no expert on this, but... Well, it's still pretty theoretical, but for now, I can connect the dots in at least two of those dimensions. So you're establishing the perimeter? As best as I can. I suspect that junctures like this are anomalies, you know, freaks of nature, or the space-time continuum, if you prefer, occurring, well, who knows how often. Rarely, though, I'd say. I hope. Now, if I take these points and extend them geometrically and then draw lines to connect the limits, we should see the projected boundaries of our so-called doorway. That's it. The outline? All right, let's step back and see what we've got. Kind of a vertical rectangle. Looks like a doorway, all right. Not quite symmetrical, and a bit small. About three feet across, maybe four feet tall. Exactly the size of Tina. She could have stepped through. Do you still have that quarter? Here. Throw it. What? At the wall. What for? It's a test. Toss it between the lines, and, and we'll see what happens. Okay, here goes. Where is it? It went through. The quarter's in. The other place. Wherever that is. Now what? Well... What are you doing? Shh. This is where I heard her. Where the bed was. The sound was the loudest just off the floor, but now... I can't hear her anymore. Chris! Let me try. Put your head down as low as you can. She's right. I can't even hear Tina's breathing. No. No. Tina? Answer me, sweetheart. Where are you? Tina? <gasps> What's happened? The temporal dimension may be shifting. In that case, she could be anywhere. Tina? Tina! Hold it down. You hear anything at all? No. She's gone. Get up, Ruth. Move around, both of you, and keep listening. What's the point? It's a chance. Do it. Psst. Over here. That's her. In the corner. What in the name of... Quiet. It's getting weaker. Where's she going now? Tina, come back. Keep looking for her. But how? Come on. Where? Anywhere. Try the whole house. I'll take the living room. Tina? 
Tina. What is it? She's gone. Gone and never coming back. We don't know that. We don't know anything. Come on, babe. You gotta be strong. For Tina. In here. Bill? What are you doing by the television set? Put your ear next to mine. Is this? First she was in the bedroom, now she's in here. I've told you what I think, Chris. But she went into this other dimension in the bedroom. What's she doing here? If I could tell you, I would. You've got to think rationally. How can we think rationally about an irrational situation? One step at a time. We try every possibility. Cross off the ones that don't work. I'm not going to wait. Neither am I. We can't get ahead of ourselves. My daughter needs me. I've got to go to her somehow, some way. Mommy? Daddy, help me. Help me now. I've got to go to her. I'm afraid it's not that simple. Get out of my way. Slow down. Let's think it through first. We have to do something. I know, but what? She could be somewhere else entirely now. Are you saying it's hopeless? Chris, if she's beyond our world, everything's different where she is. The normal rules don't apply. The slightest movement on her part might seem to us to be all over the place, but she might just be turning over in her sleep. Then what do we do? I have an idea. Call him. Who? The dog. Call him. Hurry. Mac! Here, boy! That's it. Here, that's a boy. There she is. I hear her. Where are you taking me, Mac? I don't want to go. Stop it! Tell her to go with him. Tina! Mommy? She hears you. She hears you. Go with Mac, baby. Please, go with him. Where are you? Here, baby. I'm here. Just tell her to go with the dog. Sweetie, go with Mac. Right now, baby. Where are they taking me? Where we are. You want to be with Mommy and Daddy, don't you? Yes. Then go. Will he take me to you? Yes, baby. He will. Let's go. The dog should go back to the place where he entered. Yes. Now, get down on the floor in front of the wall. I don't hear anything. Call the dog again. Mac! Here, boy! Here! Nothing. Bill, can't we help her? It'll have to be the dog, Ruth. We can't take a chance going through ourselves. Why not? If Mac could do it... Mac has a better sense of smell and hearing. He might be able to find his way. Mac! Come here! Right here! Come on! I hear him. He's doing it! Man! What a mutt! They're not getting any closer. This way, Mac! Come! Tina? Mommy? I can hear him. But they're not coming through the wall. They can't see the opening where they are. Come to me, Mac. To me. Daddy. Bring her out, Mac. Now. Daddy, where are you? Here, baby. Right here. Just a little bit farther. Follow Mac. I can't see you. Mac, you better come. Right now. Why doesn't he do it? Maybe he can't. He's confused. If you can't see him, he can't see you. No, I won't have it. What are you doing? Reaching in. Stop! Pull your arm back! Tina! Take my hand! No, Chris, it's too dangerous. Let go of me! My hand, Tina! Take hold of it! I can't see it, Daddy. I'll lean a little further. See it now! No. Chris! 
Here! Here! Chris! Chris! Chris? Yes! You all right? I'm okay. I got through. Can you hear me? We hear you, pal. Don't move. But I have to. Don't move an inch, or you'll never find your way out. But I'm just here, on the other side of the wall. What do you see? I'm... not sure. It's dark. There are lights. Millions of them. Like... like stars. Some of them are flashing, moving past. And there's some kind of mist. I can't make out anything else yet. Don't even try. Stay where you are. I've got to find her. Let her come to you, Chris. Call her. Yes, call her. Tina! Daddy? I can hear her. She's close. Where are you? Come to the sound of my voice. I don't know which way. I gotta help her. She can't see any more than I can. Chris, I mean it. Daddy, I'm scared. Don't. Wait there for her. I don't have a choice. She needs me. Tina! Where are you, Daddy? Right here! Where? Is Mac with you? Yes. Grab his collar. Can you see his collar? I think so. Put your fingers under it. I'm coming, honey. Chris, Chris, don't go after her. I have to. Tina, where did you go? Tina, Tina. I'm over here, Daddy. Stand still. I don't like this place. Don't be afraid. I'll get you out. Where's mommy? Waiting for you at home. In your room. She's waiting for us. Listen to my voice. Come to me. I, I don't know where you are. I can't see you, Daddy. Where's Mac now? Here. Grab onto him. Hold tight. Can you do that for me? I'm trying. Chris! Hurry! Got his collar yet? Get a good grip now. Okay, Daddy. But he wants to run away. You have to stay with him. Don't let go. Mac! <gasps> Bring her here. Bring her to me, Mac. <gasps> Is he bringing you, Tina? Yes. Hold on tight, baby. Go where he wants to go. I will. You'll be here in a minute. Mac knows the way. Just hang on. Come on, Mac. Come on, boy. Chris, we're running out of time. That a boy here, right here. Can you see her yet? I'm not sure. There's shadows moving. Yes! Tina! Here, boy. That's right. Daddy, pick me up. Take my hand. I'm right in front of you. Reach out, a little closer. I can't see you. <laughs> I know it's hard. Just try. That's it. Closer. There. I got her! Oh, Daddy. Oh, baby. Baby. You're okay now. Daddy, Daddy. Oh, baby. I got her. I got her. Hi, Mac. <laughs> you, you big, beautiful animal. You did it. You found me. I want to go home. Me too. That's where we're going. Mac... Let me take your collar. Now go. Go to Tina's room. Where is it, huh? Put your arms around my neck, honey. Hold tight. Here they are. Tina! Mommy! Take her. I've got his legs. I'm pulling as hard as I can. There. There. 
I told you you'd make it. Oh, Chris. How does she look? Fine. She looks beautiful. Mommy. Come on, honey. Let's get you out of this room. I better go with him. Sit down on the bed. Get your bearings first. Oh, man. Man. What happened anyway? I pulled you out. Feet first? How did you do that? Half of you was still here. But I was walking around. You only thought you were. I was holding on to you the whole time. I didn't feel it. I know you didn't. How come you kept telling me to hurry? Because. Yeah? The opening was getting smaller. What are you talking about? The time element. At least that dimension was changing, or starting to. And if it had happened, we would have lost the location on both sides. For how long? <laughs> I couldn't begin to guess. The opening was shrinking? Well, see for yourself. <sighs> Solid all over, now. Including the area inside the lines. It was closing up the whole time. You mean... Another few seconds, and it would have finished closing. With half of you here and the other half... there. Uh, I would have been... cut in two. Yeah. Mac? Oh, you did good, Mac. Real good. How would you like to sleep in the house from now on? Keep an eye on things. Yeah, dead a boy. Better put some boards on the wall for now, until we can figure out what happened and make sure it doesn't happen again. Can we do that? Well, we can try. Meanwhile, you might not want to let her sleep in here for a while. Are you kidding? No way. Tina will never have to sleep in here again. Looks like she got a wish after all. From the mouths of babes, huh, Chris? From the mouths of babes. And good old boys like Mac here. <laughs> A brief journey into another dimension, perhaps. But which? The fourth? The fifth? Or one not yet charted by theoretical physics? They never came up with an answer, despite a battery of research scientists equipped with every instrument known to man. No explanation was ever found. Only a little more respect and uncertainty about what can happen in the Twilight Zone. Little Girl Lost, starring Stephen Tobolowski with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Richard Matheson. Heard in the cast were Alyssa Frayden, Dana Bokor, and Doug James. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises and the Rod Serling Estate for making this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. Sound design and custom Foley effects for The Twilight Zone by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Craig Lee, Michael Slaybach, and Matt Sorrow. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaking. Long Distance Call, starring Hal Sparks with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Charles Beaumont and William Idelson. Heard in the cast were C.J. Amari, Frenette Lebo, Rosalind Alexander, Nick Sandys, Jeff Lupatin, Laura Russell, Kurt Nabig, Christina Verba, Doug James, Karen Olson, and Amber Lake. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Jason Mallow for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking.
you're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. There. Superhero wrapping paper. Billy's going to like this one. Hi, Mommy. We're back. So I see. We picked up a few things. You did, huh? Grandma! Don't bother your grandmother, Billy. She's resting. I want to see her. She'll come downstairs for the party. When? In a little while. I'll call you when it's time. Why don't you go play for now? Just on the patio, though. Okay, Pumpkin? Okay. How is she? Okay, I guess. She didn't want any lunch. The doctor said he'd try to stop by. Maybe we should cancel the party. No, no, it'll, it'll cheer her up. You know how much she loves Billy. But the excitement. She wouldn't want it any other way. Well, we'll make sure it doesn't take very long. I'll go up and see how she's doing. Oh, and there's something in the bag for Billy. Mother asked me to get it. If you have a chance, maybe you could. I'll wrap it up. Thanks, so. I'll be back in a minute. Take your time, honey. But I think she's asleep. Mother? Is that you, Chris? How you doing? Oh, fine. Just resting my eyes. Well, you go right ahead. We've, we've got everything under control. Where's Billy? In the yard, playing. Oh, such a big boy. And today... Another birthday. I can hardly believe it. Neither can I. Did you get him a present for me? I sure did. The one you asked for. Sill's wrapping it up. Good. Take the money from my purse. No, don't worry about that. It's all taken care of. I insist. And I insist that you relax. Dr. Unger's coming in a little while. You want to look pretty for him, don't you? Oh, Chris. You're such a teaser. <laughs> Well, who do you think I learned it from, Mama? <laughs> Just like Billy. He's so much like you, in so many ways. Oh, I don't, I don't know about that. He's got Sylvia's nose and mouth. And your eyes. When I look into those eyes, I see you at that age. I don't know where he gets so much energy. From his daddy, of course. Now, hold on. I was the quiet type. Oh, you were a bowl of fire, running this way and that, full of curiosity. I find that hard to believe. But it's true. Billy's the spitting image of you. <laughs> if you say so, Mother. Take your nap now. Can I get you anything? Nothing at all. Just remember to call me when it's time for Billy's party. He can come upstairs if you like. Oh, nonsense. I wouldn't miss it for the world. All right, Mother, you win. Just don't try to walk on your own. I'll, I'll let you know when it's time. You do that, dear. Tell Billy I'll be there. I will. I'll get some rest. As must be obvious by now, this is a house hovered over by Mr. Death, that omnipresent player in the third and final act of every life. It has been said, and perhaps rightfully so, that what follows this life is an unfathomable mystery, a bridge into darkness, passage over which is reserved exclusively for the dead, or so the philosophic claim. But in a moment, a child will try to cross the bridge that separates light from shadow. And of course, he must take the only known route, that indistinct path through a region called the Twilight Zone.
And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Long Distance Call, starring Hal Sparks, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. That's enough for now, Billy. I like the way it sounds. Can you help me set the table for dessert? Is it time yet? Almost. Where's Grandma? Well, you know, she wanted to come down, but she's awfully tired. You understand, don't you? You're a big boy now. But I want to see her. Maybe in a few minutes. Daddy's just gone up to... There she is. Chris, watch your step, honey. Why is Daddy carrying you, Grandma? Because she's light as a feather. I've got your chair ready. You go to so much trouble. Mother, you've got to follow the rules of the house. And today, the rule is, the moment Billy opens his presents, you're going back upstairs. That's fine, Chris. I always follow the rules. Except when I don't agree with them. (laughs) Hi, Grandma. There's my little angel. Mother, the doctor told you not to exert yourself. I don't exert. Billy is a feather to me. Everybody get ready. Time for the candles. I'll turn off the light. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Billy. Happy birthday to you. Go on, son. Blow them out. Here it goes. Wait now. You've got to blow out all the candles or it is no good. Take a big breath, Billy. All of them. Okay. (gasps) You did it! Did you make a wish? Yes. What was it? I can only tell Grandma. Well then, tell me. I wish for his... Don't you think we should all hear your wish? That's not the way it works, honey. You know that. It is a secret between the two of us. Isn't that so, Billy? Mm Mm-hmm. And now we cut the cake. (laughs) Mother, let Syl do that. What? You think I'm too old to hold the knife? He didn't mean it that way. When I am that old, you get the shovel and dig a hole. I have a shovel and a pail. Billy. Yes, my angel. I know you do, to play with. We had some good times at the beach, didn't we, Mom? All of us together? Lovely times. Like tonight. I'm so happy. My heart is so full. I would like to say something. May I? Sure. Oh, my little Billy. My wonderful little boy. He gave me life again. An old woman, good for nothing but to complain. He held out his hands to me and made me alive. Why are you crying, Grandma? I I don't know, Angel. You don't? Baby, it is because I won't be here with you for very long. Now, Mama. Why not? I am going to... Away. Where? No, please. Don't lie to him. Tell him the truth. I will be gone. But where? Come on, Billy. Grandma's tired. I want a piece of cake. Good idea. After we open the presents. Let's go into the living room. Yeah, presents! Is anything wrong, Gran? No. uh, a, A little short of breath. That's all. Take my arm. It's not necessary. You go. I can walk. We'll go together, all right? Look at that, son. A real cowboy guy. Bang, bang. Sit here, Mama. Open this one next. Okay. Wait. Billy, do you want to see what Grandma got you? Yeah. Which one is it? Right here, I think. Yes. Wow, cool! Well, you know what it is? Yeah, telephone. Why, that's a nice toy, isn't it? Grandma picked it out for you. For us, Billy. For you and me. So you can always talk to Grandma. Any time. Even when she is not here. Can you say thank you? Thanks. 
See, Mama, he loves it. I'm so glad. I want to talk to Grandma now. You may. You know how to work it, son? Yeah. Hello. Hello. Who is it, please? Guess. Is there someone who wants to talk to Grandma? Yes. What is his name? It's me. And who are you? Billy. Oh, Billy. It's so good to talk to you. <gasps> What's the matter, Mom? You'd better take me upstairs. Now, Chris. Of course. Don't you want to play? I want to, Billy. In a little while. When? Whenever you like. You talk on the phone. I will hear you. Come on. Up you go. Don't hurt yourself, Chris. Not a chance. I'm not a little boy anymore. I think I could carry my mother upstairs. Can I call now? Not yet, Billy. I have a message for her. Hello? This is me. Grandma, please don't be sick. Don't be sick, Grandma. Can you hear me? I don't want you to be sick anymore. Someone's at the door. I'll get it. You stay with Mom. Come sit next to me, Billy. Dr. Unger. Chris. Thanks for coming by. How is she? The same. Sylvia. Hello, doctor. How are you holding up? Oh, don't worry about me. Grandma? Billy, stay here. Is Grandma okay? Of course she is. I'll just look in on her. Let me walk you upstairs. I know the way. Can I go too? Later, Billy. Sit here with us. But I want to tell her something. Oh, darling, we can't see her right now. Why not? She's... She's not feeling very well. Is she gonna get better? I hope so, sweetie. I really do. She isn't in any pain. Can we see her? I wouldn't advise it. Not that it would hurt her, but, well, I doubt that she would recognize you. Oh, we'd recognize her. All right, Chris. Just don't stay long. Me too. Isn't it your bedtime? I want to say goodnight to Grandma. Billy, try to understand. Grandma's sick. Why don't you wait until she's well? I want to see her now. Billy, don't. If I may make a suggestion. Yes? If he wants to see her, this might be the time. Come with me then, but only for a couple of minutes. And Billy, listen to me. If Grandma acts a little different, that's only because of the medicine, okay? Okay. Then let's go. Sylvia? Now? Do you think... I, th I think we'd better. Mrs. Bales? Yes? I have some people here who would like to see you. You do? Go on in. I'll wait in the hall. Hi, Mama. What? Grandma. My angel. Are you sick, Grandma? Not anymore. Then why don't you get up? Billy. How you doing, Mama? Who are you? Who am I? I don't know you. It's Christopher, your son. My son was taken from me by a woman. This is my son now. My only son, little Billy. Does that hurt, Grandma? No. There is no pain. Then what's the matter? It will be so lonely. Oh, Billy. I wish you could go with Grandma. Go where? Away. Far away. Together. The two of us, Billy. I want to go. 
You and me, Billy. No one else. Just you and me. Grandma? 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 Oh, Mama. Goodbye, Gertrude. Goodbye. I want Grandma. I want a doctor. I have to. I need her. I want to talk to her. Fishies. Do you want to play with me? Billy? Billy, where are you? There you are. Didn't you hear me calling you? No. You know you're not supposed to be playing out here all alone. Why not? I don't want you so close to the pond. What were you doing? Nothing. Billy? Looking at the fishies. It's getting cold. No, it's not. I think you'd better come in now. Don't you want some lunch? I'll make you a cheese sandwich and some hot soup. Come on. I want a hot dog. All right. A hot dog, then. Why don't you wait in the dining room? I go upstairs. Why? I want to go in my room. OK. I'll call you when it's ready. Oh, Chris. What's the matter? Billy. I heard you calling him. Where is he? In his room. You all right? I hope so. What do you mean? He's been walking around in a trance all day. He misses her already. You know how close they were. Yes, I do. Why do you say it like that? Like what? Come on, Sel. Well, why don't you admit it? They were too close. She was his grandmother. You and I know that. But you heard what she said. What? She called him her son. Her son, Chris. She didn't mean it. Didn't she? No, of course not. For heaven's sake, Sylvia. She was full of sedatives. She was dying. I'm sorry, darling. I'm sure you're right. It's, it's just that... I guess we're all upset. We'll get over it. I know you will, because you're strong. I do understand how hard it must be for you. I don't have a choice. But... How strong is Billy? Billy! Lunch is ready. Billy? Are you still upstairs? Hey, Grandma. Won't you come and play with me? What? Going to what? Bye. Who were you talking to? Grandma. Billy. She says she's lonesome. She wants me to come and stay with her. Can I, Mommy? Can I? I just wanted to say, well, how much we all liked your mother. She was a fine woman. Thank you, John. If there's anything we can do, anything at all. I appreciate your coming. A wonderful woman, Mr. Bales. She was, Mr. Pennington. And I know she was fond of you. She mentioned you often. If you need any help, you know, at the house. We'll keep that in mind. I, I think everything's under control. How's that dear little boy of yours? Fine, Mary. He's with the babysitter. I'd be happy to take him any time. Shirley's just down the street. She's been very good. We have plenty of food at home if you want to stop by. That's all right. We, we should get home to Billy, though. I'll bring over a casserole so you don't have to cook. Bless your heart. I made dinner ahead of time. All I have to do is heat it up. Well, don't be a stranger. 
You two, both of you. We should see each other more often. Very kind of you to come. I'm glad that's over. She had so many friends. It was a lovely service, don't you think? You know what I really think? Funerals stink. I know. But it's a way of remembering her. I wanted to remember her the way she was, you know, the way she used to be when she was healthy. Now I'll always think of her like this. How she was at the end. Come on, honey. Let's go home. Billy needs us. Yes, he does. More than ever. What? I'm not sure. They went to the funeral. I don't know when they'll be back. Yeah, I'll call you. No, don't come by. I told you I don't know. Oh, he's a good kid. Kind of depressed with his grandmother dying and all. Doesn't want to play or anything. And Oh, wait a minute. Hey, Billy boy. Where are you going? Outside. Is that okay with your mom? Yeah. You sure? What are you gonna do out there? Play. Oh yeah? Well, that's good. That's real good. How come you decided to play? Somebody wants me to. Wants you to what? Go outside. Right, just don't go out of the yard, okay? Okay. Oh, nothing. He's just going out to play. It's the first time he wanted to do that today. No, I don't have to watch him. He's a good boy. He never wanders very far, he just sits and plays by himself. It's sad, I don't Wait, what was that? Something's happened, I gotta go. Good to be home. I can take care of things for a while. Why? Wouldn't you rather be alone? That's the last thing I want. Oh, okay then. I'll make us some coffee. Sounds good. Billy? Shirley? We're back. Mrs. Bales? Hi, Shirley. Are you in the living room? Is there anything I should- Oh, Mrs. Bales, I- Who's this? Mrs. Bales, my name's Peterson, uh, Jeff Peterson. I live down the block. Where's Billy? Sorry to bother you at a time like this. I mean, the girl told me about your mother-in-law's funeral. I'm very sorry, but, uh... What's happened? Well, it's about your boy. Billy? What about him? He's all right, Mr. Bales. I put him down for a nap about a half an hour ago. Then what? What about Billy, Mr. Peterson? Well, now, I sure hate to say this, but, uh, your son almost got himself killed this afternoon. What? He ran right out in front of my car, from nowhere. And lucky thing, I'm a cautious driver, Mr. Bales. If I wasn't, he might have... Billy! Billy never plays in the street. He never leaves the yard. I know. That's why I didn't mind when he wanted to go out. What happened? Well, there wasn't any sense in putting on the brakes. It was too close, so I cut the wheel as sharp as I could. Just in time, too. Couldn't have missed him by more than a few inches. Not a scratch on him, I'm glad to say. It wasn't my fault, Mr. Bales. Honest. <sighs> All right, Shirley. It, apparently it wasn't anyone's fault. Anyway, Mr. Bales, if I do say so, I think you better have a talk with your boy. He's sleeping. Oh, he's fine, just like I told you. A talk? Why? Well, when I saw that he was all right, I asked him, why'd he do a crazy thing like that, running out in the middle of a busy street? He said uh, somebody told him to. Somebody told him to? Who? He didn't say. You know I wouldn't tell Billy to do a thing like that. Who else did he talk to, Shirley? No one. All day long, he just sat in his room playing with the telephone. Chris? You believe me, don't you? Yes, yes I do. Chris. I'm sorry it happened, Mr. Peterson. Don't be sorry. Be glad. The boy's safe. What is it? You'll see. Well, he is all right, isn't he? He's not really asleep. He was faking it. Oh, for crying out- Listen. Listen to what? He's talking to- That's enough. Hi, Daddy. Hey, Pumpkin, we're back. Would you tell me something? 
Sure. What's this running in the street business? Billy, you know you worried us. I'm sorry, Daddy. Well, why'd you do it? I don't know. Billy, who were you talking to on the phone just now? Nobody. I asked you a question, young man. Don't fib to me. Who were you talking to? Nobody. You'll tell me, you hear? Oh, no. Sylvia, let go of him. All right. Let's see what you can accomplish, which so far is nothing. Mommy hurt me. She didn't mean it. She doesn't like Grandma, does she? Of course she does. She's just upset. Why? Billy, I've got to tell you something. I, I want you to try to understand, okay? You're a big boy now. What? You won't be seeing Grandma anymore. She didn't go away like we said. She... She died, Billy. You know what that means? Yes. Now, I know you're only pretending to talk to her on your telephone. I know it's a game you made up, but please, will you do me a favor, Billy? Okay. Don't do it around Mommy anymore. Why? Because... It, well, just because. I'll, I'll explain it to you someday. Deal? Deal. Okay, I'm gonna go talk to Mommy now. See you in a little while, okay? Okay, Daddy. I am back. All finished in the bathroom? Hmm. Shall I turn out the lamp? What? The light. Do you want it off or do you want to read for a while? Yes. Yes, which? Whatever you like. Oh, Chris. It's not what I want, it's what you want. I don't care. Please. Don't shut me out. Sorry, I was just thinking. I know. So? Yes? So I know how hard it was for you. What you went through these last weeks and months, you did more than anyone. But I hope you understand. Understand what? My mother didn't mean any harm. I suppose not. It's the truth. She had two other children before me, and she lost them, and she couldn't let go. I was all she had. Except for Billy. Billy was me again. At least as far as she was concerned. A chance to go back, to pretend that none of the years had happened after Dad died. I know it wasn't right or fair to you, but honey, believe me, whatever she did, she did out of love. Love for whom? What does that mean? I'm sorry. I didn't mean it the way it sounds. Really, I didn't, Chris. You're trembling. It's cold. And pull up a blanket. Let's get some sleep. Yes. It's been a long day. The longest. No, I won't have it. Mommy! Who are you talking to? What's the matter? Give me that. What is it you're hearing? I want to know. That's my phone. Hello? Hello? Give me my phone back. Whose voice is that? Who? Mommy, give it to me. Not until you tell me. Say it. Say it! It's my phone. It's from Grandma. That's it. No more of this stupid telephone. You broke it. You broke it! Yes, and I'll break it even more into little pieces. You will never play with this telephone again. It is gone. Do you understand? Gone and never coming back. I don't want it. I don't want it. Why? I want Grandma. Billy? Billy! What did you do? What did I do? What, what happened here? It was that stupid toy. I woke up and... I'm sorry, Chris. I lost my temper again, but... Why did you break it? I heard her. Heard who? Who do you think? What are you saying, Syl? She was there. On the phone. She didn't say anything, but I could hear her. Breathing. That's crazy. I know. But I heard it. Come on, honey. Snap out of it. He was so upset. Of course he was. We're, 
Where did he go? Downstairs. I'll go after him. We both will. <gasps> That's the back door. He's gone outside. Billy! Billy! Where is he? In the patio. Billy, come here, son. The fish pond. Billy! Oh, no, 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 no. He's not breathing. I'll give him CPR. Go inside and call 911. <gasps> Dr. Unger, too, now! Lift him. Careful. I got him. How is he? He's breathing. Thank God. We'll do everything we can. Put him in the ambulance. If we had gotten here a few minutes earlier... I'm going with you, Billy. Oh, my Billy. Excuse me. Yes? My my son, the, the little boy. Oh, yes, Mr. Bales. How is he? He's out of IC. They're moving him to a private room. Is he conscious yet? I'm afraid not. I, I brought some of his things. He's going to come out of it, isn't he? We're doing everything we can. My wife's having a hard time. The doctor will be here in a minute. He'll give her something. Please tell him to hurry. Now, if you'll wait over there. Yes. Yes, of course. Well? Take it easy, honey, please. He's, he's gonna be all right. Is he? Yes, I promise. You can't promise that. He's getting the best treatment. It doesn't matter. What? It's too late. Don't even think that. No? Why not? We have to face facts. What facts? She's already taken him. That's not true! Yes, it is. She took him away. She has him now. Syl, don't say that! That's what she wants what they both want. I can't fight her anymore. She's won. Just a minute, sir. Is this room 511? Yes, but no visitors are allowed. I'm, I'm his father. I brought some of his things. You can leave them with me. Give me a minute with him. Well, just a minute, until Dr. Unger gets here. Hi, Pumpkin. It's Daddy. Can you hear me? You're gonna be all right, you know, I swear you are. Why did you do such a crazy thing? Going in the fish pond. Mommy and I will take care of you from now on, you'll see. She doesn't mean to get you all upset, she's... She's sorry, she's so sorry, she just... She only meant... You don't need that telephone anymore. It was Grandma's idea, but I'm the one who got it. I... I shouldn't have listened to her. Grandma's at peace now, you have to accept that. Please, Billy, try. She didn't want you to do anything like that, I'm sure of it. Anyway, I brought your telephone that I can use it one more time, okay? Just once, and that's it. I have to try, you hear me? I know it's silly, but I have to. It's the most important call I've ever made. Mother? 
you can hear me, by some miracle you can hear me at all, please listen to me now. You said you loved Billy, remember? On his birthday, you picked him up on your lap and hugged him and said that he gave you life again. I know you meant it. You did, didn't you, Mama? Well, if you did, if you really meant it, I'm asking you now to prove it. Give him back to us. He's five years old. Do you know how young that is? He hasn't even started. He doesn't know anything about school or girlfriends or wearing long pants or pitching a baseball. He doesn't know anything yet. He hasn't been anywhere. He's hardly been out of our house. There's a whole world he hasn't seen or heard or tasted or smelled or touched. Remember what you said. You said Billy gave you life again. Well, now you can give him life. If you really love him, let him live. Give him back, Mama. Give him back! Nurse! Nurse! What's happened here? I don't know, Doctor. His heart! It's not stopping after all. It's, it's stronger. And his breathing. Blood pressure's rising. Heart rate's up. Thank you. Something's happened here. What? His vital signs are stabilizing, Doctor. Take a deep breath, Mr. Bales. Then go tell your wife. He's come back to us. I don't know how or why, but we've got it. He's going to be okay. A telephone, an act of faith, a set of improbable circumstances, all combine to probe a mystery. To fathom a depth, to send a facet of light into a dark after-region. To be believed or disbelieved, depending on your frame of reference, a fact or a fantasy. A substance or a shadow. But all of it very much a part of the Twilight Zone. We'll return to the Twilight Zone in just a moment. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At TwilightZoneRadio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop TwilightZoneRadio.com. Visit TwilightZoneRadio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD. Or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. The date is Tuesday, September 11th, 1864. We are encamped outside Atlanta, and the destruction goes on. I know not what history will make of this conflagration, but I have witnessed it at close range. I feel it my duty to set down these observations before the prism of time colors them in a 
different light. As to the present battle, then my words may seem harsh, but I assure you, this is how it was. We charged the enemy's works and carried them with a bayonet. The earth ran red. The air was filled with the screams of the wounded and dying, but we were many, and they were few. And so we tried. Nonetheless, and despite urgings to the contrary, the battle raged on. The city was ours. There was no need to destroy save that which could be of use in the fight against us, but Sherman was drunk with victory. He himself started the fires, the flames which annihilated that great citadel of grace and beauty. One of us should have sent a ball into Sherman's brain. It would have been so easy. But somehow we couldn't, and that devil knew it. He knew it, and he mocked us for our cowardice. The good die young, I have heard him remark. If you're evil enough, you'll live forever. And with that, the entry from Major Skelton's diary ends. So it was that the Union soldiers burned Atlanta. Questions? Professor Jameson? Yes. Uh, the books I've read don't describe the Battle of Atlanta that way. Oh, I know. Confusing, isn't it? But as someone once said, history is bunk. <laughs> Uh, who was it now? Um, uh, I should know that. Henry Ford. Yes, of course. That's it. Mr. Ford. Thank you, Professor Kittredge. Helps when a Nobel Prize winner sits in on your class. You should drop by more often, Sam. You seem to do quite well without me. I could always use a good teaching assistant. <laughs> so, to sum up today's lecture, the Union soldiers did indeed burn Atlanta for no good reason after the battle was won. You may have seen a more pictorial version in the motion picture, Gone with the Wind, but I assure you, the conquering troops took no pleasure in their work. They were forced to it by a man they hated more than they could ever hate the rebels. An ugly, sullen, appallingly brutal general named William Tecumseh Sherman. The history books have glorified this monster, attributing to him qualities of courage and integrity. Trust me, he had no such qualities. He was just a small, evil man, with tiny red eyes and a dirty beard, and a way of talking that made you quietly want to slit his throat. What a great lecture. I really like this class. Professor Jameson makes it so real. I forgot to take notes. Oh, you can borrow mine. When's the test? I don't know. I think it's next Tuesday. It has been said that universities are worlds unto themselves, inhabited by the young. These are the inhabitants of Collins University, a very small world indeed, young people hungering for knowledge, which can be imparted only by age. You have just met Walter Jameson, for 12 years the college's most popular and respected history professor. Students crowd his lecture hall and listen in fascination as he brings the dead past to life for them. It doesn't seem to matter what period of history he's discussing, he makes that period as real as this morning's headlines. Some explain this ability simply as the mark of a consummate actor. However, there are those who don't agree. Like Professor Samuel Kittredge, Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, who has another more disturbing theory about Walter Jameson, and that theory is about to be put to the test. Very soon we will find out whether our star professor received his degree from a major university or from the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Long Live Walter Jameson, starring Lou Diamond Phillips, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Very vivid, Walter. You had me on the edge of my chair. Thank you, Sam. Coming from you, that means a great deal. Now I see why these lectures of yours are so popular. Is that why you sat in today? Partially. Tell me something, if you have a moment. 
Certainly. Who was this Major Skelton? Oh, no one important. Just a lawyer who happened to enlist. And you acquired his diary? Yeah, lucky break. As I recall, an auction of Civil War memorabilia a few years back. What regiment? 123rd Illinois Infantry. Remarkable. American history is a hobby of mine, but I must say I've never heard of him. His diary's never been published. A fascinating document. May I see it? Um, <laughs> surely. Well preserved. It was stored in someone's attic for a hundred years. I don't think it had ever been read. You come across objects like this once in a while, put away in boxes. They didn't know what they had. You could resell it for a nice price, I imagine. Original source materials are hard to come by. Hmm. Don't suppose I could borrow it? I never lend books to absent-minded professors. Remember the last time? Yes. I guess you're right. Time for some coffee? What? I'm going past the student union on the way to my office. Not today. I have a paper to work on for the conference. Oh, I almost forgot. Can you come by for dinner? Whose invitation? Yours or Susanna's? Mine, this time. Something on your mind? Nothing special, just your company. We have a chess game to finish, if I'm not mistaken. Say, seven o'clock? All right, seven it is. Good. See you then. Hello? There you are. Where else? I keep regular office hours. I know. A chance to counsel all those co-eds. Oh, please, Mr. Jameson. I just have to talk to you. It's about my term paper. It's Professor Jameson to you, young lady. Excuse me, Professor? I might have an hour this afternoon. Then we'll have to work fast. You see, I have a bad case of writer's block. I need someone to, well, loosen me up. You don't need me. You need a cold shower and a massage. Speak for yourself. <laughs> Daddy told me he invited you for dinner. He did. You mind? Not if you don't mind my getting some work done afterwards. My thesis is due in ten days. How's it coming? Oh, it's coming. I'm just not sure I've said enough. Want me to look at it? Absolutely not. I have to know that I can do it on my own without help from you or Daddy. You will. Don't worry about it. I miss you. Me too. Only a few more days. Then we can spend more time together. We'll paint the town red. Oh, there's my two o'clock. I gotta go. Let me guess. Female, age 19, about five foot two, with eyes for her handsome professor. Be right there. Actually, this one's a little old lady. Wants to finish her degree before she kicks the bucket. <laughs> I'll bet. See you in a few hours, darling. It's a date. Oh, there you are. Come in, Janice. I was afraid I was late. Someone else is waiting for you. You're my only appointment this afternoon. She asked if this was your office. A student? No, I don't think so. She's sort of elderly. She acted like she knew you. Hello? Hello? She'll probably come back. Uh, I'm sure you're right. Now then, Janice, how can I help you? I'm sorry to bother you, Professor, but I'm having trouble with the assignment. Can't find all the books? The research library isn't supposed to check out certain materials, but sometimes... It's not that. I've got everything I need. But the authors on the list, they don't agree with your version. So my question is, which version should I use, yours or theirs? Remember what Ford said. What? Never mind. Start with the basic events. Everyone's in agreement there. As to interpretation, that's up to you. Just tell me what you think happened and why, based on all the accounts. Original thought is what counts. But how can I be sure if I wasn't there? That's always the problem, isn't it? 
There's an old adage, those who were there know more than those who weren't. The problem is getting people to believe you. Nonetheless, you know what you know, so you learn to keep some things to yourself. <laughs> but that doesn't affect you, Janice. We deal with truth in my class, nothing but the truth for better or worse. They say it can set you free. Get it, Father. Hello there, Miss. I've got a great deal on a set of encyclopedias. Sorry, we don't want any. Just let me get my foot in the door. Oh, really? You know what's wrong with you, Professor? What? You're always on time. Sort of takes the mystery out of things. Oh, so I'm not mysterious enough for you. That's just it. You're too mysterious, except when it comes to keeping dates. Get in here. Mm. <laughs> What's that for? Because. Like my new dress? Awful. Get rid of it right away. You mean here and now? Watch it. You're a PhD, not some sorority girl. And not yet, I'm not. There's a little matter of a thesis, remember? A mere technicality. Anyway, it doesn't matter. You're about to give it all up and become a housewife. The devil she is. Hello, Sam. I didn't see you there. I'm giving you my daughter's hand, not her brain. Which I inherited from you. She'll get that PhD if I have to... A spanker. I know. Well, I like that. Spare the rod and spoil the child. Pour yourself a drink, Walter. Dinner's almost ready. Don't tell me you're the cook again tonight. Indeed. And why not? Don't you think it's about time Susanna learned for herself? He won't let me. Force of habit, after her mother died. Let's go into the dining room, shall we? I'll serve. You sure there's not something on your mind, Sam? Nothing that a good meal won't cure. Had enough to eat? I take it all back, Sam. She'll never be the cook you are. I wouldn't even try. Well, you could try. Who knows? Maybe you've inherited your father's talents. What do you think you're doing in here? I'll do the dishes later. Unless this is the men's hour. Cigars and brandy and all that. Not a cigar. A pipe. It's not the dishes I'm worried about. It's a little matter of a doctoral thesis. Upstairs with you. Walter and I have some talking to do. I don't believe this. It is the Gentleman's Club, right here in my own house. Just for a while, Susie. Then you can have Walter to yourself. You're not going to treat me this way, are you? Worse, you might have to support me. Then the wedding's off. Good night, Daddy. See you before you go? It's a requirement. Brandy? Yeah, by all means. You know, you don't have to worry about her. She'll accomplish anything she sets her mind to, with or without us. Oh, I know that. But she's wasted a lot of time. She's almost 30, and I'm almost 70. You're talking about chronological age. You're both still very young. I don't feel young lately. Aches and pains. Let's sit down. The chessboard is exactly as we left it. My move, isn't it? Do your worst. Hmm. How about pawn to King's Bishop 4? Look at that. You don't like it? Not the move. Your hands. Well, what about them? Extraordinary, isn't it? They looked very much the same when we met, those two hands. Firm, smooth. Not the slightest discoloration. Time marches on. 
for some of us. Walter, tell me something. Of course. How old are you? You know the answer. Forty-four. My move. I seem to recall that when you applied for a position at the university, you listed your age as 39. That was, uh, let me see, 12 years ago, which would make you 51 now. Come on, Sam. So I'm 51. Too old for Susanna, is that it? In a sense. What are you getting at? This is between the two of us. It won't go beyond this room. Really, Sam? Walter, when I met you, I was 58. I had most of my hair, all of my teeth, and hardly a wrinkle. Look at me now. In 12 short years, I've turned into an old man. But you haven't. It happens that way sometimes. I know. But why? Clean living? Don't ask me, Sam. You're the chemist. I'm just a history teacher. Yes, and you teach it very well. Do you know what your students say? They say it's almost as if you witnessed history firsthand. I try to make it interesting. Fake it, you mean? You could call it that. Yes, that's what I thought. But somehow it didn't seem like you. You're such an honest, precise man. Ah, here it is. What have you got there? A book. A first edition. Photographs, mostly. Taken by a fellow named Matthew Brady during the time of the Civil War. Well, what is it? You look as if you'd seen a ghost. Perhaps I have. Hand me that magnifying glass, will you? I don't see. Was your grandfather in the war by any chance? No. In that case, I'd say we have something of a mystery in our hands. Hmm? How so? You got me interested in your major skeleton today. Oh, that. <laughs> I was curious to see what he looked like. So I went through the Brady pictures, not really expecting to find anything. Here, this is a shot of Sherman and three staff officers. Yes, typical of Brady's work, moody, grim, not a smile between them. Look closely. The one with a pistol in his belt is identified as Major Hugh Skelton. This photograph was taken in the 19th century, and yet it looks exactly like you. I'd know those eyes anywhere. In fact, Walter, I'd have to say it is you. It is you, Walter, isn't it? Photographs can be deceptive. Poor lighting, grainy images. You shouldn't have kept the ring, you know. It's a dead giveaway. Ring? Uh, it, it is a bit like mine. Not like it. The same. Sam, really, you can't be saying what I think you're saying. That wouldn't make sense. It wouldn't be rational. It wouldn't... Come now, Walter. We're not children. You know exactly what I'm saying. I've been accused of many things in my time, but never of being inarticulate. Oh, you're joking. Just because a man in a picture happens to look like me... And happens to wear the same ring, and happens to have the same small mole on the left side of his face. Did you keep the pistol? Or is it in a Civil War museum somewhere? Oh, Sam, Sam. Tell me the truth. You know what the truth is, don't you? You are the man in the photograph, aren't you? Yes. I knew it. I've suspected for a long time. But, of course, it seemed so fantastic. It is. Yes. So, now we're on equal footing at last. The time for lies is over, Walter. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. So tell me, how old are you? You won't believe me. I can believe anything now. This bust on your mantelpiece? What about it? 
It's after a Greek statue, as I recall. The head of Cato the Elder. That's right. Let's just say, I'm old enough to have known this gentleman personally. But he lived more than 2,000 years ago. I said you wouldn't believe it. No, no, it isn't that, but 2,000 years? How, Walter, how? You don't know what you're asking. In heaven's name, this is what mankind has been dreaming of. Sam. To live forever, to go on learning and understanding eternally, without end, without death. Sam. Tell me the secret. I can't. You must. You owe it to the world. I owe the world nothing but contempt and pity. Then tell me any part of it. I'm almost 70 years old. I have a heart condition. I'm going to die, but I don't want to until I finish my life's work. Walter, listen to me. Do you understand? I'm not ready to die. I can't tell you the secret because I don't know what it is myself. What? I was like you, Sam. Afraid of death. Too afraid to face the concept head on. When I thought of all the things there were to know and the pitifully few years man had to know them, I went cold with fear. And with anger, too, at the impossibility of it all. The combination was paralyzing. Every night I dreamed, as you dream, of more time, of immortality. Only if man lived forever, I thought, could there be any point to living at all. I'm thirsty. You have water? Come in, traveler. Thank you. You're very kind. One day on the road, I met a man, an alchemist. I told him these things and more as I rested with him. He said that he could grant my wish. Only it would cost money, a great deal of money. So I sold everything I had and paid him his money and submitted to his experiments. Drink this, young man. You may remain here until you recover. I feel strange. That will pass. I remember very little of what followed, except that I was in a coma for many weeks. When I revived, I learned that the alchemist had been burned for blasphemy. You're not serious. An alchemist? The only legitimate one that I've ever known. You're asking me to believe something that goes against everything I know? Not without proof. But an alchemist? I'm a man of science. They knew nothing of chemistry. Lead into gold. Just as I thought. You won't believe it. Smoke and mirrors. Their methods were based on superstition, magic. What did he use? Bat's blood and eye of toad? And once upon a time, germs were unknown. And blood cells and pasteurization and human growth hormone and... Sam, all those things and more would have been called magic once. It's a matter of knowing what to measure and how. Do you realize that most of today's medicines come from plants? Which doctors discovered a long time ago that they worked, even if they couldn't explain the reason? Don't lecture me. All right. But you'll grant that certain phenomena exist before we know why. Science is like history in that respect. A detective story, working backwards from known facts until we understand the cause. And I'm the most undeniable of facts unless you can come up with another explanation. Go on. There isn't much more to tell, really. I thought the experiment had failed, of course, because I didn't feel any different. But then, 
when I saw my wife and my children and my friends aging and growing old. This was a problem I hadn't considered, you see. But surely there's a way to get around that paradox. Such as? There must be. Is there? Think about it. If I tell you that somehow I can stop you from aging, where do you want to be stopped? At 30? Then you watch everyone around you turning old. At 70, would you want to live forever the way you are now, sick and weak? It's better than dying. No, Sam. You're wrong. I was wrong. It's death that gives this world its point. We love a rose because we know it will soon be gone. Who ever loved a stone? I'm not a rose, and I'm not a stone. I'm a man, very old, very frightened. Of what? Death? Yes, of death. You're a fool. I want to die. Then why don't you? Because I'm a coward, like all men. Because I'm tired of living and scared of dying. That's why. There's a revolver in my desk at home, Sam. The same one you saw in the Civil War photograph. Every night, I hold it in my hand and pray for the courage to pull the trigger. But I can't. You mean to say you've survived all these years without an accident, without being injured or wounded? Some people are lucky that way. They go through life without ever breaking a bone or seeing the inside of a hospital. Oh, I've come close to death plenty of times, but never close enough. Thank you. For what? For reassuring me. I thought that if a man lived forever, he would grow wiser. But that isn't true, is it? You grow tired, that's all. It must be lonely. That's a word that comes to mind. You say it as if you think it's a word I don't know anything about. I suppose you were married more than once? Yes. How long with each woman, Walter? Ten years? Fifteen? I take your point. Now you know why I attended your lecture. Why I asked you here tonight. It wasn't idle curiosity. I suspected as much. Sam, this isn't a situation of my choosing, not any longer. I tried to resign six months ago, but you talked me out of it. Do you remember? Yes. Do you know why? I knew that Susanna was falling in love with me. And I knew what would happen, because it had happened before. A few years of happiness, and then... I warned her. I did everything I could to discourage her. Except tell her the truth. How could I do that? She'd have thought I was mad. Then why didn't you leave? Because it was too late. I was in love with her. Everything was against it, all my reason and experience. But that didn't matter. And God help me, it doesn't matter now. It does to me. Walter, I can't let you marry my daughter. And why not? Susie. Well, go ahead. I asked a question, Father. We were just having a conversation. So I gather. How long were you standing at the top of the stairs? Long enough to hear that there's some sort of disagreement over me. Don't you think it would have been considerate to include me in the negotiation? It's not a negotiation. Please, don't misunderstand. Your father seems to think I'm too old for you, darling. Susanna, let me explain. That's the silliest thing I've ever heard. Good. In that case, you will marry me? I thought that's already been decided. You asked, and I accepted. Unless you're having second thoughts. Nonsense. If I had my way, we'd do it tonight. Are you serious? I've never been more serious in my life. I think you mean it. There's a justice of the peace in the next county. Go upstairs and get your prettiest dress. I'll go back to my place and pick you up in an hour. But... Go. Go. Daddy? I can't very well ground you, can I? You're of legal age. Oh, Walter, I do love you. Though your timing is a bit of a surprise. Life is a surprise. If we're not ready now, when will we be? 
next week, next year. We have to seize happiness when it comes, and it's here now. One hour, darling. Mm. I'll tell her. She won't believe you, Sam. No one would. In fact, by tomorrow, you won't believe it yourself. We'll see. Yes, we will. Yes? I'll give you one last chance, Walter. If that's your name. Sam, please. The irony is, I truly like you. We've been fine friends. But when it comes to my daughter... You deny her happiness? Is that what you call it? People who love each other don't have secrets. They share their lives. They grow old together. Susanna's entitled to the same thing. Not a mockery of it. You don't think this is easy for me. There's nothing ahead for her but a broken heart, as she sees herself age while you don't. How long do you think you can keep it from her? And if I go away, will that make her happy? She'll suffer, but she'll get over it. You don't belong here, any more than that antique pistol in the photograph. It's still here, in my desk drawer. And so am I. That's reality, Sam. For better, or worse. She's upstairs now, packing. If you come back, I'll expose you. Not just to her, but to the university and the world. Starting tonight. You mean it, don't you? You don't leave me much choice. Give me a few minutes. I need to think it through. Good. If you love her, you know what to do. Yes, I know what to do. Only, I don't know if I have the courage. Hello, Tommy. Who are? You needn't stand up. How did you get in? You left the front door open. Who are you? Don't you recognize me, Tommy? No, I don't think I... Look hard into my eyes. You called them the most beautiful you'd ever seen once, a long time ago. I think you've made a mistake. No. It's you, Tommy. My name is Jameson, Professor Jameson. And if you don't leave my house at once, I'll be forced to call campus security. Don't pretend with me. I know who you are. And who is that? Tom Bowen. Tom? My husband. That's impossible. I've never been married. You mean you don't remember? How convenient for you. We married right after the Great Depression. We lost our farm to the drought. Crops died and blew away like dust. And you, still a strong, vital man. So we packed up the car and moved west. The living would be better now, you said. And it was for a while. We had a little girl. Did you know she passed away last year, Tommy? A grown woman herself, getting on in years. It's not right to outlive your children. But me, I had to keep going. 
It was like I'd been waiting all these years, waiting to know where you went when you ran off. And now, I found you. My dear lady, perhaps if you told me who you're looking for, I could... Oh, stop. Please, stop. I saw your picture in the paper. Huh. I knew it was you by those eyes and the ring. You always wore it. So I had to see if it was true. It is. No, Lord, look at that. I can't explain it. I only know what I see. I've grown old, and you haven't. Don't, please. And now you're going to marry someone else and leave her the way you left me. Lorette, for God's sake. I can't let you marry her, Tommy. You're mine. Don't touch me. What's this? Put the pistol down. Oh, I remember that gun. You used to keep it locked away. Said it belonged to your great-grandfather. Take it out and oil it like you knew you were going to use it someday. Is it still loaded? I said put it down. Tommy, what you're doing... It's wrong. You can't go on hurting people the way you hurt me. I won't let you. Lorette, for the love of... What was that? I didn't hear anything. Are you sure? I thought... Thought what? I... don't know. Susanna, dear, please wait. Don't try to stop me. I've made up my mind. I know. It's not like I'm going away. Walter and I will be married, and then we'll come back and I'll move my things into his house. It's only down the block. I'll still see you every day and... Shh. I did have some things to say to you. Very important things. But now, I don't know where to start. Please don't. I'm nervous enough as it is. Can't you be happy for me? I know it's a change, a big change, but surely you're not surprised. You must have seen it coming. I know we haven't talked much about it, but... Do one thing for me, sweetheart. What? Bring me my reading glasses. I shan't be able to sleep while you're off eloping. At least I can get some reading done. Oh, Daddy, thank you. Where did you leave them? Upstairs in my bedroom, as I recall. Would you mind getting them for me? Of course I will. If Walter comes to the door, tell him... I know what to tell him. Don't expect him just yet. There's still time. Wait right here. I'll find them. Excuse me, I didn't see you there. I saw my Tommy. He's resting now. Good evening to you, madam. Walter. Walter, where the devil are you? Hello, Sam. Why are all the lights off? I, I was just uh, thinking. The window's open. I know. I'll close it. <laughs> no. What's the matter? <laughs> it's a, a strange feeling after all this time. What do you mean? I mean, I've come to my senses. Tell Susanna. Tell her if, if you would. <laughs> You're hurt. Turn on the light. Stay away. 
I'll call a doctor. No. But your hand, there's blood on it. Hard to avoid that when you've been shot. <laughs> it's dripping all over everything. <laughs> I'm leaking, Sam. Everything that's been held inside for so long, it's running out. I feel light as a feather. Take my arm. Sit down. Quickly. A little late for that. <laughs> I'm sinking, Sam. Right into the rug. There'll be quite a mess to clean up. <sighs> What's happening to you? It's happening. At last. Your hair. Your skin. Sorry to fall apart on you. <laughs> oh. But nothing lasts forever. Thank God, Sam. Thank God. In his wisdom. Oh. Walter. Walter. Tell her. I'll try to think of something. Don't let her see me. Dad? Walter? No, Susanna. Stay back. Daddy! Go home. Where's Walter? Susanna, please, go home. Now. Walter? He's gone. Gone where? I wish I could tell you. But there are his clothes, his shoes. Daddy. Daddy, what else is on the floor? Dust, my dear. Only dust. Professor Walter Jameson, an expert in the subject of times long past, and above all, a consummate actor, since before this university was founded, he's finally completed his life's work, a history of the world that begins in the cradle of civilization and ends in our time, because the future was not his specialty. In fact, the simple truth is he had no future left. The past has a way of catching up with us, sometimes when we least expect it. They say that time heals all wounds, but it also wounds all heals. Rest in peace, Professor. You've just passed the ultimate final examination in the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, You'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop twilightzoneradio.com. Visit twilightzoneradio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663.
Long Live Walter Jameson, starring Lou Diamond Phillips with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Charles Beaumont. Heard in the cast were David Darlow, Alyssa Fraden, Elizabeth Leto, Anne Whitney, Jeff Lupiton, and Christian Stolte. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. Audio editing, sound design, foley effects, and mix for the Twilight Zone radio dramas are by Cerny American creatives Craig Lee, Michael Slaybach, Bob Benson, and Jason Rizzo. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaking. Miniature, starring Lou Diamond Phillips with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Charles Beaumont. Heard in the cast were Ellie Weingart, Elissa Fraden, Jeff Lupiton, Joby Cerny, Roger Mueller, Elizabeth Lido, Christian Stolte, Doug James, Kurt Nabig, and C.J. Amari. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Finally, 12 o'clock. Let's go to lunch. Hey, Charlie. Charlie, it's recess. Oh. Thank you. I just want to finish up here. Trying to make us look bad? What do you mean? Now, just what do you think I mean? Hey, just forget it. Come on, we'll be late. Look at him. Little goody two-shoes. Why don't you guys lay off him? Because we're mean, heartless brutes. Right, Fred? <laughs> right. Well, I think he's nice. Hey, Mama, don't forget to change his diaper. Charlie? Hello? Aren't you going to lunch? Oh, yes. Any place in particular? Yes, in a way. Where? Well, it's in, in the museum, actually. The museum? They have a, a very nice cafeteria. It's quiet there, and, um... Would you like some company? Well, I, 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 I mean... It's okay, Charlie. I understand. See ya. Hey, look at the dinosaurs. Wow, that's the biggest elephant I ever saw. It's a woolly mammoth, you dope. Come along, children. Keep up with the class and don't touch anything. Cafeteria. Closed. Oh, no. And here we have one of the world's greatest collections of primitive art. E excuse me. Pardon me. There are selections from every period. I direct your attention to the New Guinea exhibit. Some of the pieces, the sepic shields, for example, are hundreds of years old. But some were made as recently as 1950. Now, this is because New Guinea is still a largely unexplored and therefore unspoiled land. Most natives of the interior will live and die without realizing that the world extends beyond the limits of their jungle. Sorry, I'm not part of the group. Uh, let's stay together, please. Now then, the natives speak over 500 different languages. However, uh, you'll notice that their art has a great 
unity. Of course, they don't think of their carvings as art, not in our sense of the word. Uh, this first piece in the glass case uh, was meant to frighten away evil spirits. Uh, this one is a protection against disease. Oh, and this one. If, 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 I, if, I, if I could just get by, please. I'm, I'm on my way out. Help you, sir. What? You look lost. Can I help you find anything? Oh, no, that's, that's all right. I just got turned around. Is, is the cafeteria closed? For the rest of the week. They're remodeling. Well, I'll be leaving then. Main entrance is that way. Thank you. Have you seen the Egyptian wing? Pardon? Egyptology. They have a nice exhibit. Is that right? Just downstairs, next to the Hall of Miniatures. Miniatures? You know, the model houses. They have the palace at Versailles, a log cabin, a New England church, a whole room full of them, all made by hand, with little dolls inside that look just like real people. Pretty amazing. Have you been there yet? No, I, I, I only come here for lunch, you see. Well, you might as well take it in now that you're here. Not many people go there, but it's really something. All right. I think I will. Turn left at the bottom of the stairs. You can't miss it. Thank you for the suggestion. I'll, uh, I'll have a look. To most of us, a museum is a place of knowledge, of beauty and truth and wonder. Some people come to study, others to contemplate, others to look for the sheer joy of looking. Charlie Parks has his own reasons. He comes to the museum to get away. It isn't really the low-priced cafeteria meal that draws him in here every day. It's the fact that in these cool, inviting halls, he can be alone for a while, really and truly alone, away from his work and from people who don't understand, which includes almost everyone in the world. But Charlie should be careful. He doesn't know it, but there's always a chance he might wander too far and get lost in the twilight zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Miniature, starring Lou Diamond Phillips with Stacy Keach as your narrator. 19th century townhouse, home of Boston residents, Mr. and Mrs. Copley Summers. The figure represents their daughter, Alice, and was carved in wood taken from the original balcony. Hmm. Will you look at that? What in the... Found it okay, huh? I excuse me, but... Yes, sir? I guess this will sound silly to you, but... How do they manage that? How do they manage what? In there, in the, in the glass case. Oh, well, I couldn't say exactly. I know they use magnifying glasses, little tiny tools, single hair brushes, that kind of thing. Must go blind making them so small. But the girl... She's so realistic. Isn't she, though? Long black hair, lace dress. Look at her fingers. They didn't miss a thing. Little rug, chair's got teeny tiny doilies on it. But how, how do they get the girl to move? Servo motors? Microchips? How's that? The girl playing the piano? It's, it's stopped now. I don't think I... There, see her sitting at the piano? She was playing just a, a few seconds ago. It was, um... I, I don't know, um, something, something like this? Didn't you hear it when you came downstairs? I don't like jokes, mister. Not when I'm on duty, anyway. I'm not joking. Then you're hearing things. There isn't any mechanism inside that piano, and the doll's carved out of wood, a single block of wood. See the sign? Yes, I know. Carved in wood taken from the original balcony. But I, I could have sworn... Yeah, it was probably some kid with one of those pocket radios. They sneak them in once in a while. But I, I saw her move. At least I, I think I did. Well, you know better now, don't you? Yes, I, I know better now. Here he comes. Finally. Where do you think he's been? At the zoo. Visiting his relatives. <laughs> Charlie? Yes? 
There's a note on your desk. Mr. Demo wants to see you. How do you do, Mr. Demo? I... Yeah, I'll sit down, Parks. I'm sorry I'm late getting back from lunch, sir. Well, I'm sure you have a good excuse. No, no, sir, I don't. I just let the time slip away. I, I don't know how it happened. You know, Parks, that's the first sign of humanity you've shown in almost four years. I beg pardon? Up to now, you, you've come and gone like some kind of wind-up toy. Never early, never late, always keeping to yourself. What, don't you like us, Parks? I've never thought about it, sir. Well, think about it now. Do you like your co-workers? I suppose so. Oh, you, you suppose so? I mean, that is, I, I, I don't d dislike them. I'm afraid that isn't good enough, Parks. An office is like a, a team or a platoon. Either it works together or it doesn't. And here, it doesn't. And the reason is you. I knew you were a square peg when I hired you, but you were bright and... I... Well, I thought we'd wear those edges off. We haven't. No, not at all. You're still a square peg. You understand me? Yes, sir. I think I do. I'm going to use the excuse of your being late, but I can't. The fact is, I'm letting you go because you just don't fit in. I understand, sir. Um, Parks. Yes, sir? No, this isn't any of my business, but how old are you now? 37, 38? 35. Uh, uh, 35. Don't you think it's about time you gave up living with your mother? She needs me. Oh, why? Is she, is she ill? Not actually ill, but my father died some time ago, and my sister is married, and, well, she needs me. I see. Look, you're welcome to stay on a few weeks if... No. That's very nice of you, sir, but I I'll manage. Well, you can pick up your check tomorrow. Thank you. He had no right. He had every right, Mother. Hiring and firing people is his job. But why you? He doesn't think I fit in. That's ridiculous. What are you doing? I'm going to phone that man and find out why you're being persecuted. Mother, please, it, it, won't, it won't do any good. <laughs> oh, Charlie, what's going to become of you? I've worked so hard to bring you up right. Maybe if I'd let your father punish you the way he wanted to. It's all right, Mother. This is just a, a minor setback. You say that every time. Why can't you keep a job, son? Why do you always end up making people uncomfortable? I don't know. I suppose they blame me. Well, I'm not keeping you here. I know that, Mother. Nothing in the world would make me happier than to see you settle down with a nice girl, raise a family, live a normal life. <laughs> Please, don't cry. I can't help it. I hate to see you hurt, son. I'm not hurt. Well, you should be getting fired. It would have killed your father. It would have absolutely killed him. <laughs> I'll go to the Employment Bureau tomorrow. Here. Take my handkerchief. Uh, where are you going? To my room. Get me my heart medicine before you do. Yes, Mother. Charlie! Why were you late getting back to the office? I, I was... detained. What's that supposed to mean? Nothing. I was detained. That's all. Open your mouth. Charlie, do you feel all right? Yes, Mother. I'll, I'll go to my room now. What's that you're whistling? Pardon? You were whistling. I, I don't remember. You should lie down, Charlie. Take a little nap. Mother, please, I can take off my shoes. I'm only trying to help. I know, but I'd prefer to untie my own shoelaces. Very well. I'll bring you some cocoa. Not now. Why? You always have your cocoa. I, I think I'll, I'll go out. 
At this time of day, we'll be having dinner soon. I want to get a head start with the Employment Bureau, see if there are any jobs. But they must be closed by now. Th there's still time. I think I'll walk over. It isn't far. Are you sure you should? Why not wait till tomorrow? Get a fresh start. Do you want anything at this store? Not that I can think of, but... Sit in your chair in the living room. Put your feet up. Are you sure? Try not to worry, Mother. I'll be back in an hour. Back again, huh? Yes. Anything in particular? Is it still open? What's that, sir? The, the a miniature room, you know, downstairs next to Egyptology. Oh, sure. Thank you. I came back. Wait, where? Hello? Hello? There. I, I was afraid you wouldn't be here. Oh, no, you've changed your dress. <laughs> That's a lovely gown. Very lovely. Are you going out? Who's that? Oh, you are going out. That's why he's wearing a cape and a top hat. Your gentleman caller. Does, does he have a carriage waiting? I hope so. I wonder where you're going. To dinner? No, something grand. The opera, that must be it. Hi. Oh, hi. Be closing soon. I see. What time do you open in the morning? Hmm? Nine o'clock, Monday through Saturday. I'll be here. What's that? Nothing. I'll be along in a moment. I want to study this dollhouse a while longer, if you don't mind. Okay, sir. Just a few minutes, though. It's almost time. I, I see. Thank you. Have a nice evening. I have to go now. I, I won't be here when you come back. But I... I hope you have a... nice evening, Alice. Where's old Charlie this morning? Don't worry about him, buddy. My brother never misses breakfast. Charlie, your breakfast is getting cold. You see, late for his meals, awake every night, tossing and turning. I tell you, I'm half dead with worry. Mother. He's sick. I know he is. Sounds to me like he's got a girl. Don't be silly. It's silly about it. He's not a bad-looking guy. A little peculiar, maybe, but, you know, he's not... If he had a girlfriend, he'd tell me. He hasn't told me, so it isn't possible. Okay, okay. Nothing would make me happier than to see Charlie settle down. He knows that. I'm not one of those mothers who won't let go of their children. Ask Myra. Pass the butter. Charlie! I'm here. Your breakfast is on the table. Sorry. Hey, Charlie boy. Hello, buddy. How are you? Couldn't be better, Charlie boy. Couldn't be better. Good morning, Myra. You're looking nice. I wish I could say the same for you. I, uh, I, I, I haven't been sleeping very well. Because of the job? Yes, I, I suppose so. It's been terribly hard on him, pounding the pavement every day. Boy, that can get you down. Charlie. Yes? We've got a surprise for you. Tell him, bud. Well, it's like this. I heard they gave you the pink slip, and see, I, uh, I know the dispatcher pretty well over where I work, and, uh, well, I, uh, I told him about you, and uh, he said... He said he'd give you a job. Yeah. Isn't that wonderful? Oh. Yes, I, I guess so. Charlie! It's very nice of you, buddy. Really. You have experience in billing, don't you? Yes. Then what? I 
well, you see, I, I don't know if I'd want to travel that far. It's out of the city, isn't it? Nobody could pick you up. Sure, till you get yourself a car. Charlie, for heaven's sake, Buddy's offering you a job. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I appreciate it, really. But I'm, I'm, I'm afraid. You got something better, Charlie? I excuse me, I, I have an appointment. Charlie! Charlie! Oh, I don't recognize him anymore. My own son. Does he have something better, Mother? <laughs> no. He doesn't have anything. <laughs> he isn't even looking. How do you know? <laughs> the employment agency called. They sent him on two interviews, and he never showed up. <laughs> well, then where does he go? I don't know. Like I said, he's got himself a girl. Oh, shut up, will you? Henry, look at that. A real log cabin. Isn't it wonderful? Mm-hmm. See, there's a little spinning wheel. Your grandmother had one of those, remember? How did they make it so small? Mm-hmm. Oh, 19th century townhouse, Boston. Isn't that something? I've never seen anything so perfect, have you? Just look at the miniature piano and the doll there in her little handmade dress. Come on, let's go. Oh, I'd love to live in a house like that. Sure you would. No air conditioning, no central heating, no television, no phone. Sure you would. Uh, excuse me? Are, are, you, are you finished here? Uh, I, I, I mean... Yep, on our way to see the mummies. Come along, May. If we must. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't know you were still in bed. I, I wouldn't be here so early, but my sister and her husband came over and... Oh, I, I understand. Uh, of course you need to get dressed. I'll, I'll, I'll turn my eyes away so you can have your privacy. Hi. A little early today, aren't you? Am I? I guess you must get a real kick out of these displays. Yes. This one in particular. What do you see in there, mister? Nothing. Man doesn't stand for four and five hours at a stretch looking at nothing. Uh, I'm not breaking any rules, am I? No. Then, then leave me alone, please. Suit yourself. Forgive me, it, it won't happen again. Oh. I see you're having breakfast. It isn't any of my business, but I really do think you should eat more than toast. Mother says breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Have I told you about my mother? She's very nice. Of course, she still treats me like a child, but <laughs> I can't blame her. I'm all she has. I suppose that isn't very much. I have a sister about your age. Her name is Myra. She's nice too, but she's not as pretty as you are. I think you're about the prettiest girl in the world. I don't mind saying that because I know you can't hear me through the glass. But I, I think I'd say it even if you could, because... I hope it's all right, but I, I have to go now. Just, just for a while. I, I didn't get much to eat this morning myself. I, I better have something. But I'll, I'll be back soon, I promise. Hello, Myra. What are, what are you doing here? Oh, I was driving by. Saw you come out of the museum. That's nice. Well... Buy me a cup of coffee? The cafeteria is closed. Then we'll go somewhere else. <sighs> All right. Here you go, folks. Thank you. Charlie, I'm going to be honest. 
I didn't just happen to see you today. I followed you. You did? Why? Because Mother asked me to. She's worried, and so am I. You haven't been yourself. No. You go to that place every day. I, I thought it might be a good idea to improve my mind. That isn't why. I'm your sister, Charlie. I grew up with you, and I know you. You go there because it gives you a chance to be alone. And you want to be alone because you're scared. Myra. Listen to me. This is important. You're over 30 years old, Charlie, but you're living the same way you did when you were 14. Some of it's mother's fault, some of it's yours. But it isn't natural. It's sick, Charlie, and you know it's sick. And that's why you're scared. You're probably right. Stop agreeing with me. I could say you were a blue monkey and you'd agree. But I... Look, I don't know about psychology or anything like that, but I think I know what's wrong with you. You need a girl, Charlie. You're at that time in your life. You know what I mean? Not exactly. Well, it's hard to explain, but you've never had a girl, have you? Not as, as such? That's what I thought. Well, we're going to change that. How? I'll introduce you to Harriet Gunderson. She works at my office, and she's a lot of fun. You'll like her. <sighs> Myra, please. Charlie, please. This one time try. For me. If you do, I promise I won't bother you anymore. All right. Here's her address. You don't even have to phone. Just stop by, say, around 7. And you don't have to buy her dinner. Take her for a walk in the park. She'll like that, okay? Okay. Word of honor? Word of honor. Charlie? Hmm? What you thinking about? Nothing in particular. You sure are quiet. That means you're the dangerous kind. You can't trust the quiet ones. You can trust me. Who said I wanted to? I only meant... Look, why don't you relax? Come on, let's sit on the bench. If you like. Lean back. Take it easy. There. That's better. You like me, Charlie? Very much. Then why don't you show it? How? Well, you could try kissing me. But we only met this evening. <laughs> Oh, come here. We hardly know each other. Quiet, you man, you. Oh! I, I, I didn't mean to, to push you off the bench. It's just that you, you, you surprised me. Sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll help you up. Forget it, Buster. Just forget it. Tell your sister you don't need a girl. You need a doctor. Wait, please. Of course, I realized she was doing it as a favor to Myra, but even so, I didn't mean to be rude to her. It must be hard for you to believe, but that's the way things are these days. Who's at the door? Oh, well, it must be your gentleman caller. Wait! Tell the maid not to let him in. You, you mustn't! Why, he's drunk! Look at him! Run! Run! Don't, don't touch her! Don't lay a hand on her! Stop! He's got to stop! No, no, let go. Let go, please. I can't help you! The glass is too thick! I, I, I need something to break it! Hold on! There, there, there's a fire extinguisher on the wall! What are you doing? I, 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 I had to. He was, he was trying to harm her. Hold it right there. He tried to kiss her last night, but she wouldn't let him, so he came back. Don't move. I'm calling for backup. But I had to. He grabbed her, and she got away, and he went after her. She, she fainted, and he carried her to the bedroom. I, I, I had to stop him. You can see that, can't you? Sure, buddy, sure. Put your hands where I can see them. 
This is museum security. I need a unit over here right away by the miniatures. Better bring a butterfly net and a straitjacket. This one's a doozy. Now, Mr. Parks, I want you to understand that no one is saying you didn't see these things. There's no doubt that you did. But you saw them in your mind. They were real, Doctor. To you, they were. That's the way it is with hallucinations. Ordinarily, the eye sees and transmits a picture to the brain. But sometimes, that's reversed. In certain cases, the brain sees and transmits a message to the eye. Do you follow? They were real, then others would have seen them too. Isn't that so? But no one else did see them. How would you explain that? I can't. Think about it. Mr. Parks? I don't know why nobody else saw them. Maybe they weren't looking. You say there were three figures. A young girl, her maid, and a man. He had a big black mustache. All right. Now let's reason it out. According to the museum officials, there was only one figure, the girl. Where did the others come from? Well, the maid always comes from the kitchen, and, and that fellow... Yes. Where did he come from? Outside. Outside the case? No, outside the house. Mr. Parks, there was nothing outside the house but glass. And beyond that, other displays. Isn't that true? Yes. But he came to the front door, and they went out together once. To the uh, opera or something, I don't know. She didn't realize what he was like then. I could have told her. You only had to look at him to see what kind of person he was. But she's so innocent and trusting and helpless. Not like other women. No, not at all. Have you seen her? Yes, I have. Is she all right? Would you like to see her now? Yes! She's here, in a box in the drawer of my desk. Careful! You are holding a piece of wood in your hands, a beautifully carved piece of wood, about six inches tall. Do you have to take her back? I'm afraid so. It's museum property. Now, I want you to go back to your room and think about what I've said. Will you do that? And remember, what you saw isn't the important thing. Our job is to find out why. Once we accomplish that, you won't have any more hallucinations. Yes? Oh. Yes. Send them in. And ask Dr. Geisner to prepare the patient for checkout. Nice to see you, Mrs. Parks. You remember my daughter, Myra. Hello. Hello, Dr. Wallman. And my son-in-law, Buddy. Hi, Doc. Uh, where's Charlie? He'll be along in a few moments. Is he really normal, Doctor? <sighs> That's a word we try not to use. Why not? Because it's meaningless. It refers to the behavior patterns of the majority. If 99.9% .9 of the people in this country went to bed with their socks on, then that would be considered normal. And if you didn't? I go to bed with my socks on all the time. <laughs> well, uh, what I'm trying to say is don't judge Charlie's emotional health by the degree to which he conforms to other people's standards. Don't expect him to be like everybody else. Then you don't think he's sick? Not now, no. He was when he came here. The constant pressure to be something he wasn't, to act and think and feel the way you wanted him to, instead of the way he wanted to, he was unable to cope with this world. So he created another world. But he knew it was false, so he destroyed it. And with that act, he made his first step toward mental health. Of course, he insisted it was real for a long time, but that's standard with hallucinations. Charlie! Hello, Mother. 
Myra, buddy. How are you feeling, Charlie? Wonderful, Doctor. Really, wonderful. No more dreams? I've been sleeping like a baby. Not worried about the girl in the glass case? There was no girl. Just a doll. I know that. And I know what made me think I saw what I saw. Thanks to you. Thanks to you, Charlie. You figured it out, remember? I didn't tell you anything after that first day a few weeks ago. Oh, Charlie, I was so worried. Now, Mother, I know you were, but I'm fine now. I'll find a job and everything will be the way it was. You'll see. I sure missed this. Did they hurt you, Charlie? Well, they were going to use shock treatment, but they decided not to when I got well. <laughs> a lot of nuts in that place, I bet. Buddy! It's all right. I don't mind. May I have some more cocoa? Charlie, we have a couple of surprises for you. Oh? The job at Buddy's office is still open. Really? And I talked to Harriet. She forgives you. But she can tell you herself. She's coming over tonight. That's great. Thank you, Myra. And thank you, buddy. Well, it took some doing, let me tell you, after where you've been and all. Well, I'm sure it did. But you won't be sorry. I, I intend to work very hard. Now, if I'm going to be ready for tonight, I'd better get a little rest. You'll excuse me? Have a good nap, Charlie. Thank you. Would you like to fix my bed, Mother? I turned it down and fluffed up your pillow. It's all ready. That's great. Just great. See you all later. If you need anything, just holler. I will. All right, I gotta go by the house. Uh, be back in a while. Okay, honey. You want me to pick up some chow? That's not necessary. We're all going out tonight. We are. Okay, then. See ya. Take your time. Drive carefully, buddy. Sure. No problem. It's wonderful having Charlie home. I think the hospital did him good. Shh. Not so loud. Don't you? I still don't understand what happened to him. The doctor told you. He didn't tell me anything but a lot of gobbledygook. Mother, I hate to say this, but if you want Charlie to stay well... You're going to have to let go. What in the world do you mean by that? Just what I said. You don't know it. You really don't. But you're keeping Charlie here in this apartment. You're keeping him from growing up. That isn't true. I've told him a thousand times nothing in the world would make me happier. No, Mother, that's wrong. And don't go clutching your heart because it doesn't work with me. There's nothing wrong with your heart. And there's nothing wrong with Charlie that getting out of here won't cure. He's not your baby boy anymore. He's a man. Let him be one. I love Charlie. We all know that, Mother. But if he doesn't leave, he'll be back in that asylum. And this time he'll stay. You don't want that, do you? No, of course I don't. Then you help me tonight, when Harriet comes over. How? by going out to a movie with Bud and me and leaving them alone. All right, if you say so. Pass the sports page, would you? Here, you should check the movies. Oh, yeah, sure. There's Harriet. Already? You better tell Charlie to get ready. Charlie! Hi, I made it. Ooh, new dress? Yeah, cost me something, too. Hi, bud. Hey, Harriet. Charlie, your company is here. Charlie? Charlie! What's the matter? Can't wake him up? He must be tired. He's locked. Charlie never locks his door. Hey, hey, Charlie boy! Up and at him, pal! Maybe he doesn't want to be disturbed. Nobody could sleep through that. Break it down, bud. Gee, I don't know. Break it down. Okay. <gasps> the window's open! 
Take it easy, Mother. He must have crawled out. <laughs> Why would he do a thing like that? <laughs> I don't know. He's your son. Oh, what did I ever do? Mother, be quiet. Hello, operator? Could you give me the number of the city museum? The main one downtown. Thank you. He couldn't have gone there. The doctor said he was well. Hello? Yes, could you tell me, please, are you open tonight? I see. Thank you. Well? Well, they close earlier tonight. Thank God. But they were open until a little while ago. Hello. I see they got your glass case repaired. I'm so glad. They tried to tell me you weren't real. Of course I knew better. But I had to pretend. Otherwise, I never would have seen you again. I love you, Alice. Maybe if I keep telling you, you'll believe me. Your world isn't simple, is it? No world with people in it ever is. There's loneliness and misery and heartache. Oh, well, look at you crying because you're alone. I've been alone all my life. People try to understand, but they can't. You could. We could understand each other and help each other and love each other, if only. Wait! Someone's here. I, I have to hide, but where? This is where he always went, every day. Are you sure he's here, Doctor? I'm almost positive. Place is empty, I checked. He could have come in earlier and hidden, couldn't he? Where? This place is deader than a doornail. Shine your flashlight over there. What about those Egyptian mummy cases? Say, that one isn't supposed to be open. Could a man hide in there? I guess. Nobody's allowed to touch him. It's against the rules. Mrs. Parks, would you do something? Anything for poor Charlie. I'm sure he can hear you, wherever he is. Are you going to take him back to the hospital? I think it would be wise. Don't you? Before anything else happens, call him. Ask him to come out. Charlie? Louder. Command him. Charlie, this is your mother. Come here. Again. Charlie Pox, you come here this second, young man. You hear me? It's too late. He's not going to listen to you now, mother. Hey, Charlie boy, let's go. What do you say, huh? Can you turn on the lights? Yeah, at the main switchboard. Do it. We're going to have to search the whole place. Hey, is this the doll house? That's the one. And the doll, is that her? Yep. Say, what? There's... There's two of them now. A man and a woman sitting on the piano bench. I don't remember that. All right, uh, let's start looking. Yeah. Yeah, I I'll get the lights. Charlie! Charlie, please. This isn't funny. Yo, Charlie! Come on, Charlie! They never found Charlie Parks because they didn't look closely enough at the house in the glass case. The guard didn't say anything more about what he saw. He knew what they'd think, and he knew they'd be right, because seeing is not always believing. Especially if what you see happens to be on display in an odd corner of the Twilight Zone. We'll return to the Twilight Zone in just a moment. You are about to enter another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land of imagination. Next stop, the Twilight Zone.
Hi, this is Stacy Keach. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our Twilight Zone website at twilightzoneradio.com. At twilightzoneradio.com, you'll find the latest information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas, including behind-the-scenes photographs, plus the newest product releases, trivia contests, ways to contact us, other Twilight Zone-related info and merchandise, plus links to other fascinating websites. So make your next stop twilightzoneradio.com. Visit TwilightZoneRadio.com to purchase these Twilight Zone radio dramas on cassette and CD. Or call toll-free 1-866-989-ZONE. That's 1-866-989-9663. There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. What did he say? He said the bus to Hart City. Hartford? That us? No, dear. When's our bus? I don't know, Edward. Why don't you ask? Ask who? The nice man at the ticket window. I want a window seat. Yes, dear. If they don't give me a window seat, I'm not going. I'll stay right here on this bench all night if I have to. You can't do that. They won't let you. Won't let me sit by the window? Then you go on without me, Eleanor. Pardon me. Oh, hello, dear. I'm sorry to bother you. Not at all. Are you waiting for the Cortland bus by any chance? What did she say? Portland. Portland, Maine or Portland, California? Neither. I'm sorry. We're going to the Elder Hostel in Fort Ritchie. My friend Mary went there last year and she said it was lovely. I'll ask at the window. About your bus, too, if you like. Do you mind if I leave my suitcase here just for a minute? Of course, dear. You know that. Thank you. I'll be right back. Excuse me. Mm. The bus to Cortland. What about her? It was due a half hour ago. Yep, a half hour ago. When will it be in? It's kind of hard to say. Road slick, maybe a bridge or two out. That's bound to screw up the schedule. Well, do you have any idea when it'll be in? She'll be in when she'll be in. That's all. I told you that the last time you asked, miss. The last time? The last time I asked you was right now. Look, all I want is a civil answer from you. You're getting a civil answer, miss. Trouble is, every ten minutes, you're up here requiring one. The situation just doesn't change that rapidly. You want to know about the Cortland bus? It's late. It was late when you first asked me a half hour ago. Late when you came back, 15 minutes later. And it's late now. All the asking in the world ain't going to push it, none. This is the first time I've been at this window to ask. Either your eyes are bad, mister, or... My eyes are fine. I don't have any trouble reading the timetables, now do I? Maybe you're the one with the problem. Maybe you don't hear very well. Or maybe you don't remember things. Maybe you'd best see a doctor about that memory of yours. I don't... I don't need to see any doctor. Now, I've had just about enough of this conversation. Goodbye. And you needn't worry. I won't bother you any further. Here she comes again. Are you all right, dear? Yes, I'm fine. Oh, I forgot to ask for you. Ask about what? Your bus. You wanted to know about the one to Fort Ritchie. Oh, we don't need to know. You don't? I found that schedule you brought us before. That's nice. I'm glad, but but I didn't bring it to you. What did she say? Oh, but you did. The first time you came over. You didn't ask us to watch your bag then. My bag? Yes, here it is. You were going to the window, but you didn't want to leave your bag here. Not the first time. And you're saying I spoke to you on 
on two different occasions. That's right, about your boss. Is something the matter? No, no, nothing's the matter. Millicent Barnes, age 25, young woman waiting for a bus on a rainy November night. Not a very imaginative type is Miss Barnes, not given to undue anxiety or fears, or for that matter, even the most temporal flights of fancy. Like most young career women, she has a generic classification as, quote, someone with a head on her shoulders, end of quote. All of which is mentioned now because in just a moment, the head on Miss Barnes's shoulders will be put to a test. Circumstances will assault her sense of reality, and a chain of nightmares will put her sanity on the block. Millicent Barnes, who in one minute will wonder whether she's going mad or whether she's just stumbled into the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Mirror Image, starring Morgan Brittany and Frank John Hughes, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Well, shall we run through it again? Thank you, no. Good. I wondered, well, I, I just noticed. Noticed what? That the bag in there. Where? In the baggage room behind you. That bag, the, the one on the floor in front of the others. What about it? Well, I'd, I'd like to see it. You would? Yes, it looks familiar. What is this, some kind of game? No game, honestly. Uh, it looks just like mine. It's it's identical, even to the handle being torn, the, the red name tag, the sticker on the side. Lady, that is your bag. You checked it. <laughs> That's not my bag. You want it back? It looks just like mine, but it's not. It can't be. That's my bag over there by the bench. Is it? The bench against the wall at the end where I was sitting. Oh. Uh-huh. My bag was there, but it's not now. That's because you checked it. Well, how did... Then I'd like to uncheck it, if it's mine, as you say. Claim check, please. What? All you have to do is show me a claim check. The one I gave you when you checked the bag. I, I don't have one. Here's my bus ticket, my wallet, my keys, and the rest. See, that that's all I have in my purse. No claim check, no suitcase. But that's absurd. You just said it's mine. Nothing I can do about that. State law. When I saw it in the baggage room just now, I'd swear that was the first... The first time I... Why don't you just go over there and sit down, miss? You're either walking in your sleep or you're hungover or something. Just go back there and sit down and breathe through your nose and let me read my magazine. When the Cortland bus comes, there'll be a loud noise a door opening, and people will come in here. And then you'll know the bus has arrived. But I... I never checked my bag. I... I don't feel very well. Where's the ladies' room? Straight across the lobby, other wall. There goes that girl again. I see her, Edward. Can't make up her mind, can she? Must be on some kind of drug. Oh, you... Hush, now. I'll be finished cleaning the floor in a minute, honey. You go right ahead. Thank you. Are you all right? Yes. Yes, I, I, I'm all right. I'm perfectly all right. Why, don't I look well? Why, no. Honey, you look fine. You look just fine. Just like when you came in before. What do you mean, before? You were in here just a few minutes ago, remember? That wasn't me. Sure was, honey. Same coat, same little rain hat. That was you, for sure. Not that many people in the station this time of night. Plus, I never forget a face. <sighs> Look, I don't know what's going on around here. Somebody takes my bag. Somebody says I'm always asking questions about the bus. Now you tell me I've been in here before and... Just take it easy now. Everything's going to be all right. Well, of course it is. There's nothing wrong to begin with. There, there isn't a thing wrong. 
I think the only problem around here is that you people need some sleep or something. You say I came in the ladies' room. Big as life. And then I suppose I walked back out into the waiting room, right into this very door. <laughs> so far, yeah. Here, wanna try? Oh, thank you. This guy's easy, though. <laughs> Let me get you a cold cloth, honey. I don't think you're well. I don't need one, thank you. I... I must be overtired. That's it. But I'm gonna be fine. Now, let's just do a quick reality check. Look out there. What for? Tell me what you see. Okay. Now, tell me about the woman. Tell me if... No woman. Are you sure? All I can see is a kid playing a video game. Hi. Oh, hi. I'm on level 13 again. That's nice. Whoa. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you, um, who are you talking to just now? Who do you think? Want to play, huh? Play? There goes. I lost. Oh, well. I might have another quarter in my purse. Nah, uh, four's enough. Is it? That's what you gave me already. I still got two left. Of course. And that was just a minute ago, wasn't it? Yeah. When you're coming out of... You know. The ladies' room? That guy at the window. He won't give me change, but you did. Four quarters for a dollar. Thanks. You're welcome. So you want to play? You mean, like before? You didn't play me before. You said some other time. Well, want to now? This game, it's called Tomb Rider. Cool, huh? There's the graveyard. When the dead people come out of the ground, you have to shoot them before they get you. Or a tombstone pops up with your name on it. See? After I was standing here talking to you, where did I go? Did you see exactly? How come? Oh, I'm trying to retrace my steps. I, I think I lost something. Same place you were sitting before, over there on the bench. Where are the suitcases? The suitcase? Yes, of course. It has to be mine. Right where I left it. On the floor. Last chance. For what? Last game of the night. Before they shut off the machine. Some other time. I gotta go home anyway. Home. Yes, you you do that. Time to go home. Here. Right here. And the tag with my name on it. How can that be? Miss? Yes, what do you want? Your wallet. I, I think it fell out of your purse. Oh, thank you. I... I must have dropped it o over there somewhere. You did. I saw it, so I brought it over. A person can't get very far without a wallet now, can they? Thank you again. Thank you. You mind if I share your bench? No, I... I, I don't mind. Bus is late, isn't it? It seems to be. It's... it's over half an hour late now. You mean the Cortland bus, don't you? That's the one. I was supposed to be in Syracuse by ten. Planes were all grounded. Took a cab from Binghamton. Darn thing skidded and ran into a tree just a few miles outside of town. Had to walk back to the bus station there. That's quite a story. You look awfully wet. <laughs> no kidding. I'm about four hours from Binghamton and about five minutes away from pneumonia. <laughs> mm, is that right? Forgive me, miss, but you're not ill, are you? <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with me. I, I really truly don't. Well, is there anything I can do? I don't know how to answer that. It's it's just that a whole bunch of odd things have been happening. Odd? I've been seeing things. What sort of things? <laughs> oh, my God. I don't think I should tell you. I, I think you'll want to move to another part of the room if I do. Or call the police or an ambulance or something. Why don't you take a chance and tell me? You never know. I might be able to help. I don't even know you. Oh, sorry. Uh, Paul Grinston. I'm from Binghamton. Millicent Barnes. At least I... I was. And what does Millicent Barnes do? I'm a private secretary. I quit my job here on Thursday, and I got another job in Buffalo, and that's where I'm going tonight. Well, trying to go. To Buffalo. <laughs> but everything I do, people keep telling me I've done it before. The man who sells the tickets, he... 
He said I kept asking him where the bus was and the, the woman in the restroom. She said I'd been in there before and I hadn't been. And my bag here. My, my bag. Where? Right there, by the edge of the bench. Oh. Oh, for a second there, I thought I... I thought it was starting all over again. I think you'd better tell me the whole story. Well, that... That couple over there, that the, the man and the woman and the ticket man, they said I'd checked it, and... And there was a bag almost identical to mine in the baggage room. I saw it. Then when I looked again... Go on. Please. Well, that doesn't make any sense, but... When I was in the ladies' room, there, there was a voice from out here, and I thought I heard... What did you hear? My own voice. I thought I heard myself talking to someone. Who? That boy. Where? Oh, he, he must have gone home. You don't believe me, do you? Well, I wasn't there. <laughs> it has to be some kind of a... delusion. Do people have delusions that they can hear? I don't know. I, I guess they could. That's what they are, I'm sure. Some kind of delusions. But it isn't just hearing things and seeing things that don't exist. It, it isn't just that. Why did the old man selling tickets and, and that woman in the powder room and the couple on the bench and the boy playing the video machine, why did they all say they'd seen me before? I can't say. That's a tough one. What is happening? What on earth is happening to me? I must be sick. I, I must be running a fever, but I'm not even warm. I don't have a fever. No fever at all. Do I hear? Touch my hand. Can you feel me? <laughs> yes, I can feel you. You're really here if that's what you're worried about, and you don't have a fever. I'm not some sort of crazy person. Really, I, I'm not. I, I've never had any problem like this. I, I mean, I mean a problem with my mind or... Or anything like that. Of course you haven't. And there is an explanation someplace. There's a reason. Maybe... Maybe what? Maybe there's someone here in this building who resembles you. Could be that, you know? Or, or maybe somebody, um, somebody playing a joke or something. Is that possible? No, that's too fantastic. And that doesn't explain the bags or anything. If there was someone, where is she now? This is a small bus station. Where, where is that person? When you get to Buffalo, will someone be there to meet you? Why, yes, I think so. I, I, I'm sure of it. A, a friend of mine. She's supposed to pick me up at the station. Maybe you should call ahead since we're running late. Let your friend know you won't be getting in for a while. Yes, that's a good idea. There's a payphone over there. Good. Oh, but I only have one quarter. And that man at the window... Here. This ought to be enough. I can give you this dollar bill. Forget it. Oh, you're very kind. I'll be over there. I'll watch your bag for you. Thank you so much. Good luck. Would you do one thing for me? Sure. What do you need? I need you to ask the man at the ticket window something. Would you mind? Not at all. Ask him if... But you don't have to ask him. Just look over his shoulder into the storage room where they keep the bags and see if there's one that looks like mine. The same handle... The same kind of tag hanging off it exactly. And if there is, tell me, would you do that? No problem. I'll be right back. Please deposit one dollar and seventy cents for the first three minutes. One fifty, one sixty. Oh, I don't have that much. Would you like to call collect? Yes, that that would be wonderful. One moment, please, while I get your party on the line. Hello? Judy, it's me. Where are you? Did you make your bus all right? Yes, I made it, but now the connection is late, the one to Cortland. Good thing you caught me. I was just on my way out the door. It'll be a while yet. I, I guess it's the rain. So when should I meet you? That's just it. I, I, I don't know. Tell you what. I'll call the bus station here and ask them what time it's due. As soon as I find out, I'll get in the car. I'm so sorry to do this to you. It's not your fault. Don't worry about it. I'll be there. <laughs> Thank you so much. See you in a little bit. Number 17 to Cortland, Syracuse, and Buffalo. Now arriving at gate two. All passengers, gate two. That's it. Uh, Judy, are, are you still there? Judy? Gate two, departing in five minutes. 
Need a ticket? Uh, no. I I've got one. Luggage? What? You want to check any luggage? All I have is this briefcase. Go right through that door, then. Line's outside. Yeah. <sighs> what time is it? Oh, I don't know. And it's finally here. I thought we'd have to stay in a motel. Hope the bridge didn't wash out. Well, better late than never. You can go now. Right. Um, I have to wait for someone. I think she checked her bag. Could, could you look? Medium size, leather handle with a red tag on it. And a sticker on the side? You mean the young ladies? I don't see it. That's because she picked it up already. Took it through. No, I don't think so. I, I don't see it back there, but it's possible she didn't check it at all. Oh, she did all right. Picked it up as soon as I made the announcement, just before you walked up. Wait a minute. That's not true. No? She went to use the phone. Phone's over there. Nobody's using it now, see? How can that be? Glad to have her out of my hair, if you want to know. <laughs> Real nervous type. Couldn't make up her mind. Number 17, Cortland, Syracuse, and Buffalo. Boarding now. Hi. Oh, <laughs> you are here. Where did you think I'd gone? To make a phone call, but... I did, and, and now the bus is here, at last. I guess we better get going. Uh, let me get my bag. You're... Right here where I left it. Thanks for watching over it for me. Let me get that for you. Looks heavy. Oh, thank you. You're very nice. No problem. Really, you're being very kind to me. Oh, forget it. You're easy to be kind to. More than just kind. I, I mean... Come on. We don't want to miss it. Yeah, set her down right there, ma'am. I'll put her in with the rest. Be careful now. It's got all my prescriptions. Don't you lose it. I won't lose it, ma'am. What goes in comes out. I'll even give you a claim check for it, okay? There you go. What did he say? Come along, Edward. Hello, sir. Hi. Want that in here? Yes, just this suitcase. Give the claim tag to the young lady. <gasps> oh. Something the matter, miss? Look! What? That's my bag. He's got it. Not that one, the other one. The one that looks just like it. Where? In the luggage compartment. You see it? It's already been loaded on the bus. Who gave you that suitcase? Which one? With the red name tag on the handle, right there. Some woman? I don't remember. Try. What did she look like? Well, it's hard to say. Half a dozen people lined up all at once. Miss Barnes! Millicent! Wait! <laughs> You just lie there for a while. Oh, but I can't. Yes, you can. I'll put my coat under your head. On my way. You and the lady coming, or aren't you? We'll wait for the next one. Next one ain't due till seven in the morning. That's all right. Got a long wait. Okay, we're on our way. You want another wet towel for your forehead, honey? What? Oh, no. I'm shutting off some of the lights. When not in use, turn off the juice. That's what I always say. Well, I better get home. I hope she feels better. Thanks for your help. It's all right, but offhand, mister, I'd say she needs some looking after. More than a towel for her head. You know what I mean? Good night. How are you doing? The bus. It couldn't wait, but there'll be another one. You didn't get on. I don't care. I'm this late already. A few more hours won't make any difference. It's quiet now. Nice and restful. So you can just take it easy on this bench here. Keep your feet up. Where are you going? Nowhere. I'll sit on the other end. Stay here. I wanted to tell you... Yes? What I've been thinking about. Go ahead. Something. It's very odd, but... I've been remembering something I heard or read a long time ago. I, I, I don't know where about different planes of existence, different worlds that exist side by side. How do you mean? Parallel planes, that's what they call them. And each of us, each of us has a counterpart in this other world. And sometimes, sometimes through some, some sort of freak occurrence, there's a break and the two worlds converge. The counterpart steps outside into our plane and to survive. 
It has to take over. Take over how? Replace us. Move us out so it can live. That's a little metaphysical for me. I remember reading it someplace. Each of us has a twin in this other parallel world. An identical twin. Maybe. Maybe the one people saw tonight. Millicent, there's another explanation. There's gotta be. An, an explanation that, well, something that has more reason to it. I can't explain it, but somehow I know that's what happened. My counterpart, this, this other woman. Forget about it, please. Look, I, I just thought of something. I've got a good friend who lives in Tully. I'll call him and see if he can't bring his car down here for us. He could probably run us into Syracuse. I'll call him, all right, Millicent? Shall I call my friend? I guess so. Excuse me. I'll tell you what I think. I think she's got a leak in her attic. Parallel planes, counterparts in another life. You got a thing for sick people? Is that it? Poor kid. I don't know what's gonna happen to her. You gonna call your friend? What? Your friend in Tully. The one with the car. I don't have a friend in Tully. But she needs help. Medical help. I figured it would be easier that way. I figured she'd come along if I told her that. Poor, poor kid. I don't know what else to do. H have you got a phone in there? Who you want to call? The police, I, I guess. They're the ones who'd know how to help her. To tell you the truth, she kind of gives me the willies. I just assume she'd get out of here one way or another. I don't much care how. Where's your phone? Come around to the office so she can't hear. Okay. Say, where'd she go? What? Take a look. She ain't on that bench no more. Is... is anybody in there? Where are you? Where did you go? I know you're in here. Unless you really did get on that bus, but... But you didn't, did you? You're too clever for that. I only want to ask you a question. Then I'll go. Who are you, really? And what do you want? Millicent, are you in there? Yes. Oh, good. You had me worried there for a minute. I'm fine. I made the call. I just thought it's let up outside. How about a breath of fresh air while we're waiting? All right. It's late. Yes. Yes, it is. You know, sometimes, on a bad night, a, a person could use some help. Some, sometimes we all could. You've been really nice. I don't know what to say. Neither do I. Except that I do want to help you. Sometimes talking to someone can make all the difference. I, I may not have the answers you need, but there are people who do. Why is that police car here? Is there trouble? No trouble. We'd better go inside. Mr. Grinstead. Yes. You the one who called? No. He didn't call you. Why would he call you? Easy now, miss. What are you doing? Get your hands off of me! You know a place to take her? Paul? I think it's best if you go with them. No one's going to hurt you. Paul! Relax, lady. Come over to the car. No! No, I won't! What are you doing? Be careful with her. She's kind of fragile. A little confused, that's all. Paul, don't let them take me! Why are you doing this? I told you, be careful with her. She's not a criminal or anything. Don't worry, Mr. Grinstead. We'll hold her for observation, get her some help. You did the right thing. Stop! Uh, let, let me go! All right, come right. on. Uh, get right. Uh, okay, here we go. Get it all squared away? Yeah, they're they're gonna take it to the hospital for observation. What was she talking about anyway? All that business about another life? I don't know. Part of her her illness, I guess. We've been driving for quite a while. Miss? Where are you taking me? 
Don't worry, you're not going to jail. This is all a misunderstanding. The doctors will figure that out. F but I'm not sick. Then you'll go on home. I don't want to go home. No. I'm on my way to Buffalo. I have a new job there. W would you like to see the letter? It's in my purse. Got your ID, too? Certainly. Let's have a look. What happened back there, Miss Barnes? Nothing. Must have been something. Mr. Grinstead said you were upset, behaving irrationally. Did he? Said you had some wild story about people out to get you in the bus station? Oh? Well, there were a couple of pretty unsavory characters hanging around. Haven't you ever been in a bus station? He a friend of yours, Grinstead? Not at all. I only met him a few hours ago. And you thought somebody stole your luggage, got on the bus, tried to pass herself off as you? Look, officer, it's really very simple. I haven't slept in almost 24 hours. I've been riding buses and it's raining and every connection is late. Wouldn't you be a little on edge? That's no reason to run around disrupting the place, bothering everybody. He tried to pick me up. That's why I was so upset. Well, that's not what the station master said. Well, what does he know? I mean, he's pretty peculiar himself. Stop the car right here and let me out. I'm begging you. Sorry, I can't do that. Look, I'll take a cab all the way to Buffalo. Then none of you will have to put up with me anymore. See? There you go. There I go what? You seem like a nice enough person. Why don't you just take it easy? If you'd seen the things I saw, heard what I heard. Calm down now and be a good girl and I'll have to cuff you. You wouldn't like that now, would you? Oh, you do that! Do it! Look, I don't care anymore. I think you better let him check you out real good when we get to Braywood. Braywood? What is that, a, a loony farm? Emergency medical facility. They'll run some tests, see if you need any medication. But my friend's waiting for me. What will she think if I'm not on the bus? Your friend have a name? Yes, of course she does. It's Judy Jensen. We've known each other since we were in school. In Buffalo. That's where the bus is going. I'm supposed to be on it. She was going to pick me up. We'll get word to her. Yes, do that. She'll tell you there's nothing wrong with me. One call, that's all I ask. All units, possible robbery on Elm Street. This is Unit 4. South 2000 block at Mayfair. Are you in the area? Negative. Well, boys, somebody better roger me fast, because I need a unit out there right now. Why are you wasting your time like this when there's a crime going on? Look, I'm not violent. I've never been arrested in my life. And now you're probably going to cost me my job, when all you have to do is call my friend. Do you really want to drive around for another hour with someone in the back seat who's broken no laws while real criminals are running around on the streets? Well, we'd have to fill out a report, a lot of paperwork. Be at the hospital till dawn. We already have to fill out a report. We could release her OR. Then she goes right back to what she was doing, hurt herself or someone else. Oh, in the friend's custody, I mean. Your friend? Is she willing to drive out here and sign an affidavit? Oh, I'm sure she would if you'd ask. We could at least make the call. This is Unit 4. Kelly, we're heading over to South Elm. Meanwhile, do me a favor. Patch me through to a Judy Jensen in Cortland. Call unit four. Hello? Miss Jensen? She's gone to bed. Who's calling? Uh, this is the Tully Police Department. Do you know a Millicent Barnes? Uh, yes, I'd say I do. We have Miss Barnes here, and we were wondering... Is this a crank call? This is Lieutenant Anderson of the Tully PD. Miss Barnes says... Oh, she does. Well, it just so happens that this is Millie Barnes, and I don't appreciate crank calls in the middle of the night, and neither does Judy. We just got in from the bus station, and if you don't mind, I'd very much like to take a hot shower and get some sleep. Is that all right with you? Good night. No. 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 Do you have any coffee? Vending machine, other side. When's the next bus? Seven o'clock? You got four and a half hours. Take a snooze on the bench there if you want. You'll be all alone. No noise. I even shut off the video machine. This place is like a tomb between now and morning. Thanks. I might do that. You want to check your briefcase? No, I'll keep it with me. Thanks. The... 
Hey, what's going on? Nothing's going on. Thought you were going to take a nap. I was about to, but I walk a few feet to the machine, turn around, and my briefcase is gone. Well, sure it is. What does that mean? Oh, dear Lord, she was right. And, and you're the one. It was you all along. Hey, hey, simmer down. You're playing tricks, aren't you? Stupid, hick-town tricks. Does that keep you from getting bored? Stealing people's luggage, moving it around, putting it back when they're looking the other way? Is that what all this is about? The briefcase isn't there because you picked it up and brought it over here and walked out onto the platform. I did that? You saw me? Sure did. Same coat, same shoes, same everything. Didn't say a word. Only question is, how did you get back through that door without me seeing you? Of course, I was reading my magazine, so I guess I wouldn't have noticed. Hey, who's out there? Hey, that's my briefcase! You, stop! Who are you? Where are you going, please? What, what are you doing here? Tell me, I have to know! What do you want? Obscure metaphysical explanation to cover a most disturbing phenomenon. Reasons dredged out of the shadows to explain away that which cannot be explained. Call it parallel planes, the myth of the doppelganger, or just plain old-fashioned insanity. But whatever you call it, you'll probably find more where that came from if you take a good look around the next time you're forced to spend a cold, wet, particularly inhospitable night at a bus station or some similar out-of-the-way place, one that's located just over the borderlines of the Twilight Zone. We'll be back to the Twilight Zone in a moment. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com, where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. Mirror Image, starring Morgan Brittany and Frank John Hughes with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcherson and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Peter DeFaria, Richard Hensel, Peggy Roeder, Adam Tangway, Roderick Peoples, Doug James, and Natalia Reed. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Paul Patch, Terry Jennings, the American Forces Radio and Television Service, our sponsors, and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You're entering another dimension, beyond any limits known to man. This is the universe of imagination, a wondrous land of brave new stories from the far reaches of space and time. So fasten your seatbelt. There's the signpost up ahead. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Man, 
was that? Seagull, probably. No way. Let's move it, ladies. But Sarge... Now what are you crying about? Ramirez says it was a seagull. Yeah? From what ocean? You hear that, Manny? There ain't no beach around here. I didn't say it was. I said it could have been. It was big and black. And seagulls ain't black. Maybe it was a chicken. Puka, puka, puka. Now listen up, you jokers. We don't make it back by 1,200 hours. We miss chow. Bob it. Yes, sir. See that big rock? Which one? Side of the trail, about 30 yards. Climb up, take a peek over the edge. See if anything's moving in the valley. Sure thing, Sarge. Ramirez. Sir. Go around the turn to the trees. If Cemetery Road's all clear, give me the high sign. You got it, sir. I'll watch your back. Now move. Sarge wants to take a break. What about us? This ain't no democracy. You hear that? Artillery. Could have been thunder. I don't see any clouds. Do you see any clouds? Eh, the, the weather's crazy around here. The enemy's five kilometers away. That's what headquarters says. Why would they lie? So we don't turn, tail, and run. I ain't no chicken. Well, let's find out. You got the glasses? Right here. There's the rock. Go over and take a look-see. And keep your head down. Here goes nothing. What do you see? Crop fields. Grass. That's all. My turn. Wait there. Careful, that was a mortar for sure. Ha! <laughs> what do you know? It's raining. We better get gone. Ah, I'd like to take me a little shower first. Oh! Manny! Manny! You're bleeding. Go back. Can you walk? I said go back. There's a sniper. I ain't leaving you here. Nice shooting, Sarge! You got him! Take cover! Ramirez is hit. He's losing blood. Get him to the trees! You were right, right? Hang on, Manny. It was a crow. I should have known. Crows are bad luck. Move! He can't walk. Lift his legs! It's too late. You promised me something. What? When the captain writes my folks, Tell him to say, I didn't feel a thing. Get down! Three men on patrol. A mile from camp, a simple reconnaissance mission, or it should have been. The year, take your pick. The place, it might be any on a very long list. This army happens to be American, but there are a lot of uniforms out there. The men, though, never change. Their job is always the same, to stop the enemy. The question is, at what price? And what of those who wait, for whom their lives are beyond price? They can only pray that every man comes back alive. Some, however, never come back. This, then, is their story. Tale of those who fight and those who wait. In the Twilight Zone. Somebody, I pass, touch, wood! Squad one, wood! Squad Dear Mr. and Mrs. Ramirez, your son Manuel served in my company for... Ah, that's no good. Your son, Private First Class Manuel Ramirez, served under my command 
for the past 12 months. During that time, he exhibited courage and... Sir? Oh, Lieutenant, come in. I was just finishing the letters. Uh, are you ready for me to type them up? Uh, not quite yet. Oh, uh, if I'm interrupting... No, no. I could use a break. Coffee, Captain? Oh, I've had plenty. Help yourself. How many is it now? Hmm? What? The letters. Too many. One for every man we've lost. I always thought... That... What's that, Eddings? Isn't it the Pentagon's job to... Officially, yes. Then why... They are... were under my command. That makes it my responsibility. I see. Every one was somebody's son or husband or brother. They deserve more than a form letter. Frankly, sir, I don't know how you do it. Sitting here, writing? That's the easy part. Just the same, Tom, I've been meaning to thank you. For what? I'm only the typist. Something I was never very good at. How many to go this morning? I've written Miller's family, Bobbitt's. Rough drafts, at least. That leaves Ramirez. I'd hope to have them done before the truck gets here. Well, you can always dictate. That wouldn't work. Why not? I'm pretty fast. I know you are, but I seem to be running out of words. At least the kind that mean anything. Well, let's give it a shot, sir. Uh, if you draw a blank, I'll, I'll make suggestions, and then I'll read it back. Uh, you have final say, of course. I'm afraid I'd drive you crazy. I tell you, we can do it. Uh, just sit me down, give me some paper. You don't know what you're in for. All right, uh... Ready when you are, sir. Right, this is what I have so far. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Ramirez, your son, Private First Class Manuel Ramirez, served under my command for the past 12 months. During that time, he exhibited courage and... Uh, uh, Dedication? Good. It was not a tip of your tongue, sir. I don't know what's wrong with me. Nothing's wrong with you. The fact that you took the time to write, believe me, Captain, that says a lot. His loyalty and motivation were an example to the entire company. It is therefore with the deepest regret that I write today to inform you. Hey, Lincoln. What? You seen the bodies? Yup. All bagged up. Where'd they put them? Behind the latrine, till the truck gets here. They laid them on the ground? No. They put them in the little chapel of dreams, done up in their Sunday best. What do you think? They shouldn't leave them out like that. Afraid someone's gonna steal them? No. Well, they're sure not gonna get up and walk away. We're talking about Manny. I went through basic with him. Me too. And Bobbitt, and the Sarge. And we... This morning we had mess together. So? And now, what are they? Uh, dead meat, that's what. Missing and presumed dead. Same thing, isn't it? Once you're on the list, you don't come back, just like Inglis and Willard and Ruiz and- Forget about it. We used to have a hundred guys. Now how many we got? 67. Who's next? I mean, if we don't watch it, we're all gonna be on the list. We're all... I said forget it, Cook. <sighs> this isn't war games. You wanna make it home in one piece? Then keep your head screwed on straight or you're done for. You got that? I, I just don't wanna end up like... like I was nothing. We could bite the big one and nobody'd even know. What if, what if they never found you? All, all you'd be is a name on a list. There's the truck. Now shut your mouth and do your job, you hear me?
Gorman? Captain? How are things at battalion headquarters? Five by five, sir. Can't complain. How uh, nice for you. The general says he got another pickup. Uh, how many this time? Three. Cemetery Road? That's right. Mm. No mystery why they call it that. No, there's not. Here's the paperwork, Sergeant, uh, plus the letters for stateside. No problem. Pull the truck over there. Lincoln, you and Cook, load them up. Make sure they're tied down securely. Yes, sir. Well, I better get going while it's still light. They say there's a storm coming in. Gorman? Sir? Keep your eyes open on the road back. Sure will. No sweat, though. It's secure. Now, that can change. Yes, sir. I guess it can. That man's always on the move. Better than sitting in one place. Stop by my quarters for a minute, will you, Tom? I want your opinion on something. What is it, sir? Take a look at this. A map of the mountain? And the surrounding area. Now, here's our position. The black circle to the north belongs to the enemy. Roughly everything from there to there. How roughly? Well, the last flyover was eight days ago. When's the chopper go up again? It's hard to say. According to command, it's too risky. The weather? The pilot would have to come in low because of the cloud cover and then pull up before he hits the peak. There's no room for error. You could call in a blanket airstrike. On what? Everything inside the black circle. We don't know their present location. If they've moved, the locals may have come back. Headquarters doesn't want to bomb civilians, and neither do I. So until the weather lifts, all you can do is send out more recon. And keep adding names to the list. Missing presumed dead. A terrible, terrible waste. It doesn't make sense. It does to the general. But Cemetery Road is a shooting gallery. Give me an alternative. Pull back for now, until we know more. Somebody has to hold this side. What if all they have is a few snipers up there? Then we better pray someone makes it far enough to find out. I don't like it. You think I do? We tried the Eastern Fork and we tried the West. We stopped before the road splits, and we sat there and we waited. It doesn't make any difference. At the very least, they have some well-placed spotters. Either that or... Or what? They're preparing for a large-scale attack. Possible, but unlikely. The road's too narrow. Exactly. Listen, forget Cemetery Road. That's where they expect us to fight them. You know what I'd do if I were the enemy? I'd spread out across the floor of the valley, then move up to attack our flank. That would cut off our supply line. They'd have us right where they want us, like sitting ducks. That would also put them out in the open. It's too dangerous. They love that it's dangerous. They don't care about casualties. But we're not sure they're in the valley. How can we be sure if they only come out at night? It's so dense they have all the cover they need. There's one way to know, absolutely. All it would take is one man, one. Say he climbs straight down from the camp, away from the mountain, with a night vision scope and a camera. Then command will have all the proof they need, because if I'm right, you know what he'll see? The entire floor of the valley, alive in the dark, like ants moving leaves. It just might work. Of course it would. Can you imagine how many lives that would save? It's not worth wasting any more. My men aren't pawns, they're flesh and blood. Oh, forgive me, Tom. For what, sir? I'm just spinning my wheels. We both know that that's not the way the Army thinks. Forget I said any of it. I, I guess I just had to blow off some steam. That ain't the way that women are over here. They have women here? <laughs> hey, Sarge. 
What? Can I get some fresh coffee? What's the matter with what you got? It's kind of cold. Well, I'll tell the waitress to make some special just for you. <laughs> Where's Lincoln? In the latrine, I bet. Maybe he locked himself in. Maybe he fell in. <laughs> Well, it's about time. Sorry I'm late, Sarge. Where you been, Private? Looking for the lieutenant. Yeah? Where is he? Search me. Sit down, Jack, before you fall down. Any of you guys seen him? Not me. Me neither. Captain wants to know. Well, I thought... You thought what, Cook? Oh, uh, nothing. The captain asked you a question. Well, it's like this. Uh, last night I was trying to get some shot eye, but I kept hearing a noise. So I looked around and... And what? I... I might have seen him. Where? Edge of camp. Had his pack on like he was heading out. But I know he wasn't on watch. And, and then all of a sudden he just disappeared. What do you mean? Well, he walked over to the rim and that was it. He climbed down toward the valley? He must have. We're talking about Lieutenant Eddings. Yes, sir. You saw him do that? It sure looked like him. Why wasn't I informed? First I heard about it, Captain. You did a head count this morning? All here, except for the lieutenant. I thought he was helping you. The valley's off limits. You knew that, didn't you, Private? I, I figured he was going to do some stargazing. Why would you think that? He was carrying his night vision scope, which was funny, because there weren't no stars. You know how the clouds are. So thick you can't see the moon. Sergeant Lowe. Sir. I want you to put together a search party. Right away. And don't show your faces back here until you've found him. Are we clear? Redmond, Trulick, Hernandez, you heard the captain. Grab your gear. Yes, sir. All right. Come on, boss. General? Captain? No, sir. This is Second Lieutenant Reber. The captain's right here. Hold on. General Hostler on the line. Thank you, Reber. General? Captain? What? Your status? Repeat, please. What's that? It's the weather. It bounces the signal around. Update your status. We are still holding position. Any further losses? No, sir. Well done. Prepare to break camp. Say again? I'm pulling you off the mountain. You can't do that, General. I want you back in battalion before the rainy season. Not now, sir. What? I thought you wanted Blue Company out of there. Not yet. If we retreat now, there'll be nothing to stop them. Uh, I'll, I'll lay down artillery fire once you're out. But, sir, I still have a squad in the field. What's the mission? One last recon. We're about to pinpoint the enemy. I'm sure of it. How much longer? As long as it takes, General. For now, I could use some support on the supply road so I can get everyone out if they cut us off. How much support? How much have you got? Well, I can spare a platoon, but only till your men are accounted for. Roger that, General. Sir. What is it, Reber? Did you say recon? That's a term the old man understands. It's been four days since the search party went out. Longer than that for Eddings. What's your point? Well... Shouldn't they be considered... Missing? Presumed dead? After so long, I thought... You thought wrong. Yes, sir. The next step is always a regret-to-inform letter. That seals it. I don't want to write any more of those. Not ever. Do you understand? I... Suppose I do. With a little luck? Maybe just this once, I can buy them enough time for a second chance. Evening, Captain. Hello, Reber. Where's the new platoon? Back by the supply road, cleaning their weapons. What do you think of them? They look like they'd shoot anything that moves. That's the problem. Then you're not going to send any of them down? With five of my men still out? Not unless I have to. No sign of them? Not yet. I'll call you on the walkie if I spot anything. Meanwhile, you ought to get some sleep, sir. I have two men standing watch. Which men? Privates Lincoln and Cook. Hey, watch. 
Shit. What's the matter? Somebody might see you. Like who? Somebody out there. Oh, yeah, I forgot. The boogeyman? You want one? Nope. Might help calm you down? I don't need to calm down. Maybe you do, boy. All I need to do is fast forward my butt out of here before... What was that? The wind. There ain't no wind tonight. Well, maybe you're hearing things. Douse the cigarette, soldier. Uh, evening, Captain. You know better than to light up out in the open. Sir, yes, sir. Anything to report? Nothing, sir. No movement down below? Not as such. You seem uncertain. Well, uh, sir, you know how your eyes can play tricks on you. If you're scared of the dark? Are you? Heck no. Uh, I, I always said the nighttime was the bright time. You know, Draco the dragon. I don't believe I've had the pleasure. Oh, well, I, I used to look at the stars when I was a kid. Had me a map that showed the constellations. Big Dipper, Little Dipper, Belt of Orion. I know them all. Plus, the meteor showers, where they was going to be. I just lay out in the backyard and wait. Zip. There goes another one. Sometimes I'd make a wish. Of course, the stars look different here. Art? Yeah. The captain doesn't want to hear your life story. Quiet. Huh? What was that? I didn't hear anything. Let's have a look with the glasses. You see something? I'm not sure. What was it? Some sort of movement in the tall grass. Yeah? Reber? I'm going down the side for a look around. Wait, sir. It may be nothing. I'll send some men. Negative. But Captain... No one else. Not this time. Stand by. We'll go with you. No. Uh, maybe the captain's right. He can't go alone. Cover me from here. But, Captain... And don't shoot any uniform that might be one of ours. Here. Use my glasses. Reber? Where are you, sir? About 300 yards. I can still see the camp. What else? Brush. Some trees on the ridge. Sir, we can do a sweep in the morning. Not on your life, or anyone else's. Captain, please. Hold on. What is it? Wait. Hear that? You're breaking up. The storm's coming. <coughs> and that's not all. I'm sure of it. There! In the lightning. I thought I saw it. Who goes there? Identify yourself! Are you hearing this? Sergeant Lowe? Redmond, Hernandez, Krolik, did you find him? Where? What happened to you? Your uniforms and your faces. Sergeant, why don't you answer? Bring your men in. That's an order. Yes. Yes, I understand. Did you get that? Get what? The enemy's coming from the north. A massive troop movement. We have 72 hours at most. Tell headquarters, Reber. Tell them now!
Take it higher. You sure? Yeah, today we're flying over the peak. Well, I guess it's okay if we can see it. be along. You can set your watch by it. That's the truth. Every 15 minutes. That's all he does, walking back and forth, checking the valley. Sentries ain't good enough for him. Still nothing down there. But then why aren't we moving out? Ask him yourself. Here he comes. Private Cook. Yes, sir? Report. Uh, big fat zero. You're positive? Stone dead, Captain. What are we supposed to be... Be quiet. Sir. But, sir... Quiet. What is it? I thought I heard them. Who? Don't play dumb with me, Private. I'm not, sir. I, I mean... You know Sergeant Lowe, don't you? Know him? Why, why, sure. And Private Redman? Yeah. And Hernandez and Krolik and Lieutenant Eddings? We know all of them, sir. Or, or we did. Then you should have no trouble recognizing them. Huh? They may have trouble getting up the side. It's still muddy. Let me know at the first sign. Yes, yes sir. sir. Don't he know they're dead meat by now? I don't have time This for won't this. take long, Captain. I just need a word with you. What's this about? If you wouldn't mind sitting down for a minute. I have to get back to my watch. With all due respect, sir, we're running out of time. There's a big push coming from the north. We have aerial confirmation. Yeah, just as they said. Who? The men in the field. You heard them yourself. Sorry. I didn't. Afraid all I could hear was static. But you saw them. I don't know what I saw. When in the grass... Does wind have the ability to speak? Captain, all I know is... We have to break camp now, before sundown. The trucks from battalion are on the way. It's too soon. The order comes from the general himself. I'm still in command. Sir, you don't have a choice. We need to hold the perimeter. In a few hours, there'll be infantry here, plus heavy artillery. They won't need us. I can't leave. My men... There are 62 other men whose lives depend on it. 67? Five of whom are now missing and presumed dead. Isn't that true? I saw them. What did you see? Shadows? It was too dark. There was lightning. You saw what you wanted to see. How long since you've slept? They were there, I tell you. Low, Hernandez, Redmond, Krolik, and Eddings. You saw their faces? Some of them didn't have much left. Rotting away like their uniforms. But in the lightning... I saw burned skin and wounds, horrible wounds. They could barely walk. They were trying to get back. They must have... They must have 
lost their way. Some of us went down, sir, to the place where you were. We searched every inch of it with flashlights. There was nothing. Not even a mark in the grass. In that case... Yes, sir? Borrow men from the platoon. Make one last sweep. Several hundred yards to the ridge. And if they don't come back either? What? If they're shot at, or blown up, or burned, and you refuse to put them on the list, what do you think will happen? Do you honestly believe they'll wait till you decide? Not alive, but not dead either. That it all depends on you? Who has that kind of power? Please. Think! What if you never write another letter about another GI? Will they stay that way forever? The living dead? The undead? What if God Almighty goes on strike and nobody ever gets cut down again? For heart attacks or disease or old age or anything else? There'd be no room left on Earth. Is that really what you want? Then what? Listen to me. It's over. You can't save them all. They completed their mission. The time's come for them to rest. They've earned it. Then do one thing for me. If I can. Pray for them, Reaper. For the ones who, who didn't make it back. see me. Am I a... New company's packed up and ready to roll. We'll turn around and head back as soon as I get everybody emptied out. We didn't leave them much. It's all right. We're gonna camp out under the stars tonight. Tell them to make a wish. Sir, you're in the first vehicle, front seat. Thank you, Sergeant. How many men? 62. Exactly. See you at headquarters, Captain. Reber? Yes? I'd like you to ride with me. Doing fine, Gorman. You know, I got a thermos full of coffee if you want. No, thank you. Maybe just a drop. Knock yourself out. Some sight back there, huh? What's that? The truck's on our tail. Check the side mirror. Heads bobbing under the tarp every time they hit a bump. Somehow, I don't think they mind. Those drivers don't know the way like I do. Ever been to Chinatown, Sergeant? Which one? It doesn't matter. I was just thinking about Chinese New Year's. Yeah? They have those big paper dragons, you know, with five or six guys underneath to hold them up. Yeah, right. That's what all these trucks remind me of. Only here, it's canvas instead of paper. And there's a whole lot of guys. Look at them back there. Heads bouncing up and down. I'm not sure where they're going. Lieutenant. Yes, sir. When we get back to battalion, I've got a lot of things to catch up on. You wouldn't by any chance know how to work a typewriter. Can't say that I do, Captain. But I can give it a try. Dear Mrs. Eddings, in the course of my military career, I never had the privilege of serving with so promising an officer as your husband. Such intelligence, bravery, and commitment are rarely encountered in the Army, or indeed anywhere else. 
I considered Tom Eddings a fine man and an outstanding first lieutenant. It is therefore with profound regret that I write today to inform you of his last selfless act of courage during an incident under my command. Incident on a Mountainside, a fable to file under ghost stories, or perhaps a brief side trip on the road to understanding. But however you view it, know that we can't forget the price paid by others in our name, or refuse to grant them the peace earned by their blood. Such matters never die, here or in the twilight zone. Missing, Presumed Dead, starring Danny Goldring, with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was written for The Twilight Zone by Dennis Etchison. Heard in the cast were Jeff Lupiton, Edgar Miguel Sanchez, Gary Tiedemann, Kurt Nabick, Patrick Cerny, Doug James, David Darlow, Joby Cerny, and Norm Woodell. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises and the Rod Serling Estate for making this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. Sound design, custom Foley effects, recording, and editing are produced in the Cerny American Sound to Picture Theater by sound designers Craig Lee, Bob Benson, and Tim Cerny. Music for the Twilight Zone is provided by CBS and American Music Incorporated New York. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to download episodes, including six free episodes on our homepage, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaking. There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. Good morning, Mr. Stasiak. How are you today? Morning, Mrs. Ricciardo. Ask me after I have my coffee. Don't you be running in the hall now, little Paul. Okay. And good morning to you, Mr. Beavis. Top of the morning, Mrs. R. Top of the morning. Did Mrs. Chatfield fix your hot water yet? I'm sure she will, Mrs. R. A landlady has a lot of important things on her mind. But how did you take your shower and all with no hot water? Oh, it's no problem, really. In fact, I think I prefer a nice cold shower. Do you remember Benar McFadden? One of the fittest men who ever lived. Published magazines dedicated to health. He always bathed in ice water. Said it got the blood flowing. Do you know he never came down with so much as a cold? Hi, Mr. Beavis. Hi there to you, Paulie. How's old Ironsides coming? She's coming. Maybe she'll be ready tonight. We'll see. Hey, going downstairs? Oh, I thought I might. Seeing as how that's the only way to get to the street. Now don't you bother the man now, little Paul. That's all right, Mrs. R. Paulie and I are friends, aren't we? Sure are. Well, then, go down and play with the other children. Don't you go far, and don't be crossing the street now. I won't. Well, what do you say, Mr. Beavis? I don't know this morning, Paulie. Come on, the coast is clear. You sure? I'm sure. Well, then, I guess, like the man said, why the heck not? Stand back. I'm coming down by the seat of my pants. Stand back, everybody. He's sliding down the banister and he's going to take off. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> hey, hey. Excuse me, everybody. Lost my balance there at the end. Of course, it's not the first time. <laughs> Gee, Mr. Beavis, are you ever going to get it right? Practice, Janie. That's all it takes. Just a little more practice. <laughs> that's what you always say. And that's what I mean. Think how much time I save every morning. Sliding down one whole floor. 
at least 15 seconds. Let's see. That's a minute and a quarter every week, five minutes a month. Why, in a year, that gives me a whole extra hour before I go to work. Do it again. Well, now, that would defeat the whole purpose, wouldn't it? But tomorrow, maybe tomorrow, I'll finally take flight and land square on my feet. <laughs> what are you laughing at? Your bow ties on crooked. So it is, so it is. Thank you, J.D. Now, who wants to help me carry my briefcase? Maybe. Pick me, Mr. I Beavis. Pick me. I can do pick me. Well, then, you'll just have to take turns. And you know something else? Why, I just happen to have a whole pocket full of shiny new pennies. And they're getting awfully heavy. I don't mind tipping, you know, for extra special service. Let me see. Anybody around here want one? Me, me, me. 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 Morning, Mr. Beavis. Here's an apple for you. Why, thank you, Tony. Don't know what I'd do without one of your apples every day. Well, I never. Who does he think he is, Rockefeller? Oh, that's just Mr. Beavis. Well, he acts like some kind of... some kind of crazy person. Oh, he's not crazy. Maybe just a little, what's the word, eccentric. The children all love him. Hmm, just the same. I wouldn't trust a man like that. Look at him. What kind of example does he set? I'd say the man never grew up, like that Pied Piper fella. Isn't that the truth? He's our own Mr. Beavis, is who he is. Guess you could say he's one of a kind. Species of the modern American male, or perhaps not so modern after all. Name, James B.W. Beavis. He has a penchant for animals, children, attractive women, aged women, in fact, people in general. He also likes zither music, all things old-fashioned, professional football, at least as a spectator sport, as well as polkas, Major League Baseball, and Charles Dickens. Should it not be obvious by now, James Beavis is a fixture in his own private, optimistic, hopeful little world, a world which has long since ceased being surprised by him. Mr. Beavis, on whom Dame Fortune will very shortly turn her back, but not before giving him a paste in the mouth. Mr. James B.W. Beavis, who lives just one block into the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Mr. Beavis, starring Bruno Kirby, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. When you gonna get a new car, huh, Mr. Beavis? He don't want a new car. He likes this one. Sure do. This is a genuine antique. Original engine, factory paint job. The only thing I've ever changed is the tires. Funny how they still can't make tires that last as long as the car. What's that on the windshield? Oh, uh, you got another parking ticket. Keep it safe for me, will you, Paulie? Put it in with the rest of the collection. Is it going to start today, do you think? Cross your fingers and toes. A bright new morning like this. We've always got hope, don't we? Okay, do you kids know what to do? Yeah, yeah we should yeah. do. That's all right. Get behind it and push. All right, she's moving. Let her go. Everybody stand back. You can pop the clutch now, Mr. Beavis. Go, yeah, you gotta go. Go. Thanks, kids. See you after work. And whose desk is this? Mr. Beavis's, sir. Ah, I should have known. And where is our Mr. Beavis this morning? I'm sure I couldn't say, Mr. Peckinpah. Well, Margaret, when you do happen to see the gentleman who occupies this... this museum of junk, kindly tell him that I should like to see him personally. If and when he finally deigns to report for work, that is. Will you do that for me? Oh, yes, sir. I'll tell him. His desk sticks out like an infected thumb. Yes, sir. Amid this snowstorm of loose papers, I believe I make out a model ship, a gooseneck lamp, in the shape of an actual goose, mind you. Cute, isn't it? Cupid doll clock. Nodding head dogs, toy kitten, yes, mm hmm, and unless I am mistaken, an actual stuffed ferret. I think it's a squirrel, sir. A veritable livestock exhibit. Perhaps I should rename this company Wild Kingdom. Morning, 
morning, Mr. Beavis. How you doing? Is everything okay? Everything's dandy. Perfectly swell. Marvelous and fabulous, as always. And good morning to you, Midnight the Cat. Spike the dog. And you, Mr. Rocket J. Squirrel. Been a good boy while I was gone? Mr. Beavis. You're looking nice, too, Margaret. Pert and chipper, as usual. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Peckinpah wants to see you. He does? Afraid so. I'm just delivering the message. Message received loud and clear. Just as soon as I water my potted plant. I think he wants to see you now. Right away. Must be something special. All right, then. Into the breach. Good luck. Oh, Margaret. Yes? One thing while I'm gone. What's that? Pet midnight for me, would you please? She needs human contact. Yes? It's James Beaver, sir. In the flesh, so to speak. You may enter. What's up, do you think? Peckinpah looked pretty mad. Is he going to get fired? You can't fire Beavis. Well, if he does, I quit. Your desk, Beavis, is an abomination. It is. And furthermore... You keep a ledger like an ape. I'll take that as a compliment, sir. Apes are very intelligent. Did you know that of all the land mammals, the ape... Your desk is an affront to civilization. Your filing system is non-existent. In short, your eccentricities are beyond human understanding. I'm eccentric? You're saying I'm eccentric? With all due respect, sir. Bringing phonograph records of zither music to play at lunchtime. I just love the third man theme, sir. Don't you? I've always loved it. The first time I saw that movie, oh, oh, it's been years now, but I'll never forget. I said to myself, Beavis... You have to get that record. Hiring carolers to come in and serenade the office during our busiest hour. Only at Christmas time. If you'll let me finish. Was it the sack, Mr. Beavis? Yep. The old sack of Rooney. Oh, I'm so, so sorry. This is the sixth job I've lost this year, Margaret. The best laid plans of mice and men, huh? And Beavis. Oh, don't worry about it, Beavis. There's better jobs than this. Lots better. We're sure gonna miss you. Here's a box for your stuff. Thanks, everybody. My chessboard. My collection of old Mirashan pipes. My books. My pictures. And old iron sides. Is that what it's called? Sure is. The USS Constitution. I was building this ship for one of the kids. Looks like she won't get launched today, after all. Old Ironsides will get launched. You'll see. You'll get another job, Mr. Beavis. You always have. The only job I've ever held for more than six months was when I was in the Navy. Is that you in the picture there? Yep. That's me on the deck next to the fantail. Well, will you look at that. He's fat, isn't he? That's the bosun's bait. This is the fantail over here. Oh, well. And she goes with all the rest. You take it easy now. Things will work out. You'll see. We'll be thinking about you. Smooth sailing, Mr. Beavis. Thanks, everybody. I'll drop you a postcard for my next port of call. Oh, 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 Mr. Truck Driver. Mr. Truck Driver, you don't have to double park. No, what am I supposed to do? Park it on the sidewalk? Park behind me. I'm leaving anyway. Which one? Oh, ho, ho. Let me guess, the old rattle trap, right? Anybody get hurt in that wreck? You can have both spaces as soon as I put my stuff in the back. Can you hurry it up? Let me get the door open here. First, set the box down. Then get the keys out. Hey, Mac, I ain't got all day. Just one more minute. Ah, if you ain't moving in five seconds, I'm pulling in behind you. Be careful, would you please? This is an original Essex. Stock parts. Okay. Watch the bumper! It's rolling! I only tapped it a little. I must have forgot to set the handbrake. That's your problem, pal. Hey! Somebody stop that car! Yours? Mine. Does it do this often? Never has before. Now it looks like it never will again. Too bad. It's been kind of like, 
kind of like an old friend to me. Stand back, everybody. Show's over. I'll phone for a tow truck. You do that. You wouldn't be interested in purchasing an original Essex, would you? For parts, I mean, they're kind of scarce. No thanks, pal. Me? I've kind of got my heart set on a 1924 Maxwell. Or maybe a 25. Thought I'd wait till the new models come out so I can make me a better deal. Sure. I understand, officer. Ever have one of those days? All the time, son. All the time. The difference between me and you is I get paid for it. Mr. Beavis? Where's your car? It's, uh, it's in the shop. Yeah? What you got in the box? This, uh, I guess you might say the stuff dreams are made of, Tommy. Something along those lines, anyway. Hey, is that old Ironsides? Yep. She ran aground before she could get christened. That's okay, Mr. Beavis. You can fix it. You can fix anything. I'll try, Tommy. Afternoon, Mrs. Chatfield. You'll find all your things in the hall, Mr. Beavis. My things? Your Victrola, your stuffed animals, all of it. Your clothes, too. Okay, okay, I give up. What are they doing in the hall? You're being evicted, Mr. Beavis. I'm not sure I catch your meaning. Evicted. Six weeks in arrears on your rent. That's it, as far as I'm concerned. Mr. Beavis, you're still going to finish old Ironsides, aren't you? Well... There may be a slight delay. I'm, 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 I'm going to have to change shipyards. But we'll get her launched. Yes, we will. That's a promise. We'll get launched somehow. Yeah, but how? I don't suppose you've ever had one of those days, have you, Tommy? Um, not yet, but I think you're having one. You know what else I think, Mr. Beavis? What's that? I think you better say your prayers and be real good. Because right about now, you need a miracle. Better make this one your last, don't you think, Mr. Beavis? All in good time, Joe. All in good time. I'll tell you when. I think you forgot to tell me that a couple of drinks ago. Uh, you're not going to be driving anywhere, are you now? Alas, I think not. Today I am, as they say, hoofing it. Once I am sufficiently fortified. <laughs> There's that word again. Which word? You said you wanted something that'd fortify a man in his darkest hour, so I guess you must be feeling pretty fortified by now. Them are it, huh? Your fortifications? Those are. Are what? Those are it. You can't use them in a nominative case. No kidding. <laughs> Live and learn. Yeah. Live and learn. <clears throat> Who's that? Who's who? The old gentleman in the blue suit. Where? Behind me. At the table. I can see him in the mirror. <laughs> I don't see nobody. Right over... Wait a minute. Where'd he go? Search me. Perhaps you can explain to me, Pete, what you put in those drinks that... that made me see somebody in the mirror, but not in the booth. See who? Whom? Quite right, Mr. Beavis. Whom? Objective case. Wait a minute. Now, where are you hiding? Nowhere, Mr. Beavis. I'm right here. Hey, how'd you do that? An exceedingly simple trick. You've heard the saying, now you see it, now you don't. <sighs> Care for a cigar? They're Cuban, you know. Nothing but the best where I come from. You might say we get them duty-free. Oh, thanks. How do you know my name? Oh, I could say I overheard it from the bartender or some such. But if the truth be told, we do have our ways. And who exactly might you be? Ah, yes, a name. For purposes of identification, you may call me J. Hardy Hempstead. Hey, Pete. Yeah? This is Mr. Hempstead. It is, huh? See what he wants, will you please? Sure, Mr. Beavis. And a happy fortified Thanksgiving to you, too. Cheers, Mr. Hempstead. Cheers. Hold on. Wait till Pete brings you a drink. But I've already got one. Where? Why, right here. Oh. To better days. I'll drink to that. And what do you do, Mr. Hepstead? I'm your guardian angel. Wouldn't that be something? But I am. Well, 
I guess we're all our brother's keeper, in a manner of speaking. Not in a manner of speaking. In actual fact. Mr. Beavis, here's the way the, uh, the cookie crumbles. Several hundred years ago, one of your ancestors performed an act of great courage. Part of his reward was to have a guardian angel assigned to one of his descendants in each generation. Current subject, Mr. James B. W. Beavis. That's you, I take it. Guilty as charged. Good. I have your family history right here. Oh, no. You're not selling one of those books about how to look up your family tree, are you? They always say I had a relative who came over on the Mayflower. Hear me out, if you would. Now, in the past few generations, Mr. Beavis, I've handled some extremely solid citizens amongst your progenitors. Handled? Taken care of. Good care, I might add. For example, there was Magellan Beavis, an intrepid explorer of the 16th century. This is a woodcut of the gentleman in question. Nice costume. Then Parnell Beavis, member of the British Parliament, who fought for home rule against insurmountable odds. And more recently, Gunner Lou Beavis, the first Marine to hit the beach at Nicaragua. That's Uncle Lewis. Indeed. And your picture will fit right here on the next page. As of now, you too are being watched over by yours truly, J. Hardy Hempstead, your obedient servant. Watched over how? Aided by minor miracles from time to time as the need arises, given a small heavenly assist when the circumstances call for it. Well, you picked a good day for it. I know. Today you had a rather uncomfortable time of it. What started it all was being fired from your 11th job in 18 months. Mr. Peckinpah didn't care for zither music. I don't much blame him, but that's neither here nor there. It so happens that I can reconstitute the whole day for you and alter it so that the final upshot will be the opposite of what it has been. In other words, Mr. Beavis, let's go back to 9 a.m. this morning. We'll rewind and start all over again. You mean I can have the day to live over again and it won't come out the same way? Definitely not the same. We merely alter some of the relevant aspects, and of necessity we must naturally perform a few alterations on your characteristics. For example, Mr. Beavis, your manner of dress... What's wrong with it? Are you serious about that sports coat? I like plaid. <laughs> and that bow tie. Let's try something a little different. Brooks Brothers might make a better impression. How did you do that? Much better, don't you think? Nice business suit, conservative tie. I look like an undertaker. That may well be. But if you want the day to turn out differently, you have to be different. Shall we go, Mr. Beavis? There isn't much time. You're really terribly nice, Mr. Hampstead. Think nothing of it. To go to all this trouble, whoever you really are. I assure you, this is neither personal nor sentimental, Mr. Beavis. It's merely my job. <laughs> now he's talking to himself. Looks happy, though. Maybe I better have a shot of what he's drinking. Good morning, Mr. Stasiak. How are you today? Morning, Mrs. Rigiardo. Ask me after I have my coffee. Don't be running in the hole now, little Paul. Okay. All right, here we are. Back where you started this morning. Yep, this is it. Everything's the same. First, I locked my apartment. Good morning, Mrs. R. Top of the morning. Hello. What's the matter with her? Why isn't she talking to me? Remember to keep your voice down. She can't see me. She can't? No one but you. Hi there, Polly. Uh, hi. Aren't you going to ask me about old Ironsides? Don't worry, she's coming along. What's old Ironsides? Don't you bother the man now, little Paul. That's all right, Mrs. R. We're friends. Aren't we, Polly? Aren't we? Go down and play with the other children. Don't you go far, and don't be crossing the street now. I won't. Well, what do you say, Polly? Looks like the coast is clear. The banister's nice and shiny. Don't even think about it. Hey, what's going on? That nonsense was for the old Beavis. You're the new Beavis, remember? Morning, everybody. I don't know, Mr. Hempstead. Think about it. If I don't slide down the banister anymore, I'm losing a good 15 seconds. That's a minute and a quarter a week, five minutes a month. Straighten your tie. You're late. Who's going to carry my briefcase? You can do it. 
What about this pocket full of new pennies? Not in this suit. Morning, Tony. Where's my apple? You want an apple, mister? That'll be 25 cents. Let's go. Oh, Mrs. Chatfield. Oh, good morning, Mr. Beavis. I wanted to talk to you about the rent. Oh, I found it in the box. Three weeks in advance. You're a wonderful, wonderful rumor, Mr. Beavis. That's a switch. This part I don't mind at all. Only, where are the kids? They're busy playing, I presume, as children are wont to do. But who's going to help me push dot my car? That won't be necessary. I don't even see my Essex. Oh, no. Did somebody tow it away? Correction. You don't own an Essex. This is your car. But this? This is a sports car. A little foreign sports car. Red's your favorite color, isn't it? Yes, but do you think it fits? With everything else, I mean? Mr. Beavis, live it up, will you? But have you ever driven an Essex? My dear sir, I have driven a chariot with 11 horses. I'm the guy responsible for Ben-Hur winning the race. That Essex went out with the old Beavis. You're a different person now. No more zither music. No more Christmas carolers in the office. Though the latter idiosyncrasy met with some approval from the organization. Now, here are your new car keys. Go ahead, give it a spin. Hey, Paulie, look at this. Want to take it for a test drive? He acts like he doesn't even know me. Shall we go, Mr. Beavis? Yeah, yeah, okay. Better times are ahead, I promise. If you say so. Well, here we are, Mr. Beavis. Looks like the office is already humming. Where's my desk? Same place it's always been. Right over there. But it doesn't look the same. Somebody's already cleaned it out. No such thing. Your workday hasn't started yet. Look at the clock. You're not even late. It's only 8.58. Morning, everybody. Good morning, Mr. Beavis. Where's my gooseneck lamp? And the clock I want at the carnival? And midnight? And Rocky? Where's the ship I was building? I don't know what you're talking about. Good morning, Beavis. Good morning, sir. Friends and associates, a moment, please. Everyone, I should like you to hear a bit of good news. As of this day, Mr. James B. W. Beavis is being given a raise in salary 10% a week. May I add, Beavis, your work is admirable, and since you've been with us for 11 months now, I think a raise is very much in order. A raise, Mr. Peckinpah? Quite right, Beavis, quite right. Thank you, sir. Think nothing of it. The least we could do, considering. Mr. Peckinpah, sir. Yes, Beavis? What about the... Yes? The zither music and the Christmas carolers. The zither music? The Christmas carolers? I'm afraid I don't know what you're talking about. Mr. Beavis, you no longer have an interest in any of that nonsense. Oh. Oh, what? Nothing, sir. Very well, then. See you later, Beavis, and keep up the good work. Why, this desk looks... It looks absolutely nude. It doesn't look decent somehow. Margaret, where was old Ironsides? Are you feeling all right, Mr. Beavis? I think I'd better get some air. Yes, that might be a good idea. I got a raise. Naturally. Where are you going now? You only just arrived. Outside for some air. Or I might go back to my place. So early in the day? I was thinking, maybe I'll play some stickball with the kids in the street. Mr. Beavis. Yeah? They won't play with you. Why not? You're not the same, Beavis. Not anymore. You mean everything's changed. Even that. It's only today that we can see the changes. Actually, they started some time ago. I'm beginning to understand. Good. Well, Mr. Beavis, still want to get on the elevator? Yes, I think I will. Why? Things seem to be going your way, don't they? I guess they are, Mr. Hempstead. Beavis. What do you say we level with one another? I mean, really, what is it you want? After all, for a person like yourself, 10% is the most even I can get for you. Frankly, I don't get you. I'm used to Beavis's with big dreams, gigantic hopes, fantastic aspirations. Magellan Beavis sailing around the horn. Parnell Beavis standing alone in Parliament, booming out his convictions. Gunner Lou Beavis, over the top men, Semper Fidelis, nobody lives forever, let's go, boys! That was the spirit. Mr. Hempstead, sir, I I don't want to seem ungrateful. 
But the things I want, the things I believe in, I know they're odd. But they're worth considerably more than 10% a week. I take it then that you prefer your bow ties and plaid coat and old iron sights. I'm afraid that's the case. And you realize things will be as they were. There'll be no job, no car, no place to live for a while. It's been that way before. <sighs> I see. Complicated, is it? Hardly. Take a look out the window. Hey, there's my old Essex down at the curb. You'd best feast your eyes. It won't be around for very long. The truck will hit it as previously ordained. You'd better go back in for a minute and get it over with. Here comes old Peckinpah now. This time, he won't be talking about a raise. You know something? It doesn't make a bit of difference. Not one bit. And whose desk is this? Mr. Beavis, is, sir. And where is our Mr. Beavis this morning? I'm sure I couldn't say, Mr. Peckinpah. Well, Margaret, when you do happen to see the gentleman who occupies this... this museum of junk, kindly tell him that I should like to see him personally. If and when he finally deigns to report for work, that is. Ah, <sighs> Once more into the breach. How do you feel, bud? Fortified? I do indeed. Today I lost my job, my car, and I've been evicted. Or I'm about to be all over again. But you know, I love the music and model ships. And if I can't bring kids into an office at Christmas time to sing carols, then what's the point of being alive? Beats me. Well, there really is no point. There is no point at all. I'm going to try and find a job, an apartment, and then I'm going to finish old iron sides for a little boy eight years old with a dirty face who happens to love model ships just the same as I do. Wait a minute. That's, that's my car. Mr. Hampstead, wherever you are, you're still watching over me. You must be. This your car, buddy? Yes, it most certainly is, officer. And you don't know. You can't imagine how glad I am to find it here. You see, a truck tapped the bumper and it rolled down the street because I didn't have the handbrake on. That was the first time, of course. But now, thanks, I'm sure, to Mr. Hempstead. Well, I don't know any Hempstead. And I don't care if it's the first time or the hundredth time. What are you doing? Writing you a ticket. In this city, we kind of take a dim view of parking next to a hydrant. You mean a fire hydrant? Big and red. Right there by your front fender. Uh, what hydrant is that, officer? Hey, where'd it go? I think I have a pretty good idea. Still with me, huh, Mr. Hampstead? Still with you, Mr. Beavis. Still with you. Mr. James B. W. Beavis, who believes in magic, the magic of a child's smile, the magic of liking many and various people and things and being liked in return, and the strange and wondrous mysticism that is the simple act of living. Mr. Beavis, one species of the modern male who lives in his own private and very special twilight zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com, where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone.
Mr. Beavis, starring Bruno Kirby with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were David Darlow, Christian Stolte, Fernette Lebo, Jeff Lupatin, Linda Ryder, Meg Falcon, Max Kirsch, Carrie Darlow, Riley Baugh, Kurt Nabig, Doug James, Carl Amari, and Vince Amari. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Jason Mallow for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the Twilight Zone. for the traffic around here. That peddler's wagon like to run you down. You better keep your eyes open if you can. Uh, I'll try. Where are you going, Denton? No place. That right. Let's see, to get yourself a haircut. Just let me pass. Or a shave, maybe. Yeah, that'd be a good idea, wouldn't it, boys? Please. Or a bath. Yeah, that's it. And some clothes that don't stink. <laughs> That'll be a nickel. Here you go, Charlie. Al? How about a drink, Charlie? Uh, well, please, I'm dry as a bone. You got any money? Well, can't you put it on my tab? Well, see, Al, it's like this. You didn't pay last time, or the time before that. Matter of fact, you haven't paid all year. You know I'm good for it. Afraid it's cash on the barrel head from now on. I need a drink, Charlie. Just one? Not today, Al. Oh, cover me for a shot at rye. Don't do this to yourself. Somebody? Anybody? Don't, Al. Just don't. One drink. That's all. How about it, Miss Smith? No can do, Al. Liz here don't pay for drinks. Other people pay for her drinks. You see what I mean? Go get yourself cleaned up. I'll stop by if I can and see how you're doing. Sure, sure. Yeah. But I need one thing first. I'm thirsty. I can't make it if I'm thirsty. Just go. Do it for me. For old time's sake. That's how it is then. I'm sorry, Al. It's the way it has to be. If you say so. See you later, everybody. Well, hello, Denton. Get what you need in there? No. <laughs> I'll bet you didn't. But I'll tell you something, Denton. I know how you can get yourself a drink. Yeah, how? Uh, you see that peddler's wagon come through? Well, he's setting up in front of the hotel. Why don't you go ask him if he's got a drink? Go on, ask him. Maybe he's got what you need. Okay, I'll do that. No. Oh. Ah. Oh. Whoops. <laughs> Did you trip, Al? Ought to pay more attention. My boot was right in front of you, and you didn't even see it. I'll try and be more careful. <laughs> Portrait of a town drunk named Al Denton. This is a man who's begun his dying early, a long, agonizing route through a maze of bottles. What he really seeks is not another drink, but a fresh start. 
Al Ditton would probably give an arm or a leg or a part of his soul to have that. The question is, where does a man turn when the last of his luck finally runs out? In a moment, Mr. Denton will make the acquaintance of a newcomer who just might be willing to help, along with the third principal character in our story. Its name, Colt. Its caliber, 45. Mr. Denton hasn't met either one yet, but when he does, he'll find that their true function is to give him what he needs more than anything else. A second chance. And now... The Twilight Zone and our story, Mr. Denton, on Doomsday. Starring Adam Baldwin, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Hey, Al, I just thought of something. You want a drink so bad? Well, guess what? I got me a bottle here, and it's still half full. Be ashamed to let it go to waste. So why don't you use some to take a bath? <laughs> that sting, Al? I'll bet it does. Come on, open your mouth. Somebody get him a bar of soap. You want some more? (coughs) Yes, sir. Well, first, let's see some appreciation. Let's see you pay for the drink in your own special way. A little song, Al. How about it? A song? You know the one I mean. (coughs) How dry I am. How dry. I am how dry I am. Pretty good, Al. Here you go. Open wide and wet your whistle. John, can't you break that up? I don't like it any more than you do. The misery they give that guy. Well, what else can they do for a good time? We ain't never had a circus come through here. Please, Charlie. (laughs) You want the rest of it, Al? Here you go. Take the whole bottle. Oh, it's all broke now. Come on inside, Dan. Let's get a fresh one. Please, Al. Just leave it. There's nothing left. Here, can you stand up? Oh. Thank you, Miss Smith. What's that? Huh? On the ground. Oh. You mean this? That's a nice looking gun. Colt 45 Peacemaker, that's what it is. You packing a gun now, Al? Oh, it's not mine. Well, whose is it? I don't know. Somebody must have dropped it in the street. (laughs) You weren't so bad with a gun in your day, were you, Al? Well, that was a long time ago, Miss Smith. A very long time ago. Well, you know something? This is the first time... The very first time I've held a gun since... uh, Well, I can't remember how long it's been. Too many bottles, Al. Yeah. Way too many. Come on inside. I'll get you a towel so you can wipe your face. Thank you kindly. Will you tell me one thing? If I can. Why do you drink so much? I don't really know. I just got in the habit one day and then kept to it. Kept to it till, uh, till I ended up like this. I didn't used to. I always had a clean shirt, hair combed. Uh, that could change, you know. A shave, a bath, some different clothes. You don't have to go on this way. Well, I want to change. But you don't know how hard it is. Here we go again, boys. Well, looky, looky. He's still here. Got a girl to help him. No more trouble, fellas. Let's hear our little songbird one more time. Charlie, will you give me a hand? Hold on. Didn't you hear what the man said? Hey, Denton, I got a new bottle here, and it has your name on it. Only first, I want to hear three more choruses of how dry I am. Let's have it. No, Al. But if I do, he'll give me a drink, Miss Smith. The devil with him. I'll give you a drink. You won't have to do this for it. How dry... How dry I... Oh, Al. Al. All right, Rummy. Now you can come in and get your drink. Tell Charlie to set one up. You've been a good boy. Thank you. Wait a minute, Denton. Huh? Hey, gunfighter. What do you... Where'd you get the gun? Oh, 
Oh, you, you mean this? I uh, found it. I found it over there in the street. That a fact? Maybe it fell off the peddler's wagon. Looks good in his hand, don't it? Yeah, like it fits. Been a while since you used one of those, hasn't it, Rummy? Well, yes. Speak up, Rummy. I can hardly hear you. Been quite a while, hasn't it? Quite a while. What say? A long time. Well, maybe you'd like to try it out. Maybe. Maybe you think you could even outdraw me. <laughs> That'll be the day. Sure will. No. No what? No, I don't know how to use it anymore. But the time was you did. Let's see you try. I told you I wouldn't know how. Stop it. Come on. You and me, Denton, will draw whenever you're ready. That's enough, Dan. It's not funny anymore. Out of the way, miss. The gunfighter and me, we're going to have a little showdown. Charlie, where are you? Come on, Gunner, right here. Let's pull. I'll give you first chance. How about it? Dan, stop this! Come on, boys. She's right. This ain't a joke. Go back to the bar, Charlie. Can't you see we got private business out here? Listen, Dan, I put up with a lot from you boys, but... Here, I'll give you a break, Rummy. I'll do it left-handed. What do you think of that? I'm telling you to break it up. Now, we both got our guns in our hands, okay? Nice and easy. That fair enough for you? Miss Smith, Ch Charlie, tell, tell him... Uh, please tell him... To... Ow! Ow! I, I'm bleeding! You see that? He shot the gun right out of his hand. I don't believe it. Al! Al, are you all right? Oh, Miss Smith, please tell, tell him it was an accident, will you? I, I, I don't want any trouble. No trouble here anymore. No trouble at all. Now, please, mister. What? Listen, I didn't mean for it to go off. Must be a hair trigger. I just wanted you to know that. But you gotta understand, it was an accident, pure and simple. Come on. Let's get out of here. Better get that hand looked at. That was no accident. That was some real shooting, Al. Come on in. Get a drink of the good stuff. I don't know what happened. Go on. You're entitled. But I wasn't even aiming. Well, however you did it, I'd say you got your eye back today. I don't think so. You must have been practicing or something. I ain't seen shooting like that since... Since... <laughs> I can't even say. And against Dan Hodling, too. It isn't even my gun. I just found it. Have another drink. All you want. On the house. Hey, Rummy! Mr. Hodling, I swear it was an accident. I, di I didn't even draw him. <laughs> I sure didn't mean to... Put that glass down and face me, Denton. I want to see you take a bullet in the stomach. Dan, it's over. Give that guy a break, will you? Charlie, take this gun quick here. I don't even want it. Did you see that? Shot the lamp off the ceiling. Without even looking. Fell right down on him. Knocked him out cold. I ain't never seen nothing like it. Well now, Al. I'd say you got your eye back all right. In space. I, I wasn't even aiming. He don't need to. He shot over his shoulder. How'd you do that, Al? I, I can't really say. He was looking in the mirror. Behind Charlie. How's that for a trick shot? Mr. Denton, maybe you let us buy you a drink. What? Take the bottle. What did you call me? I didn't mean no offense. No, I asked you what you called me. Nothing. Nothing, Mr. Denton. I, I didn't call you anything. <gasps> That's what you called me. Mr. Denton. You hear that, Charlie? He called me Mr. <laughs> Go on. Have all you want. No, thank you, Charlie. I've had enough. Al, are you all right? Oh, yep. I'm just fine. I think I'll go across the street and have a shave. Where's my gun? Leave it, Dan. Come on, let's go. Get away from me! Hey, Rummy! What did you say? Get that player piano going. Leave it be, son. I said start it up again. I want to hear some music. With singing. What's the matter, boy? Too quiet for you? Well, let me give you a hand. Didn't you hear me? I said don't! You're the one that's going to be singing from now on. You pick the tune, and you sing it, and don't call me Rummy anymore. Well, sir, things are sure going to be different from now on. I hope you're right, Charlie. I hope to heaven you're right.
Elle! Oh. Hello, Liz. I... I just wanted to tell you... I think things are going to be all right from now on. I believe that. What things? <laughs> Don't you understand? You don't have to worry about bullies like that anymore. I heard what Charlie said. Charlie? You're as good with a gun now as you ever were. Well, that's what he says? I remember too, Al. And I think he's right. Oh, I was good. I was real good. I was so good that once a day somebody would ride into town and make me prove it. And every morning I'd start my drinking a few minutes earlier. Until one morning, the guy who asked me to prove it turned out to be 16 years old. I left him lying there on his face right in front of the saloon. I left him bleeding to death with my bullets in him and he was 16 years old. It doesn't have to be that way. Oh, doesn't it? No, I've seen it before. It's going to start all over again. Every fast and fancy man who owns a gun will come riding down this street. But you know something? This time it will be different. Afterwards, it'll be me lying there face down, bleeding to death. Oh, Al. I think I'll go in and get a shave. Now, I'd like to look proper on the day I die. Afternoon, Mr. Denton. I don't want anything. How's that? Well, you're a peddler, aren't you? I can't use anything you've got. Oh, yes, I'm a peddler. Pots and pans, utensils, herbs, medicines, liniments, and tonics, men's, women's, children's clothing, farm implements, and what have you. A little bit of everything, you might say. Well, nothing for me, thanks. No? Well, what I need, you don't have. Are you sure? I'm positive. Excuse my bad manners. Fate's the name. Huh? What? Henry J. Fate, like it says on the wagon. And you're Al Denton. How do you know that? I couldn't help but overhear the trouble you had a little while ago. Hope it worked out. It did, for now. I knew it would. You knew? Oh, it always does, one way or another. The way it was supposed to all along. You see, I meet a lot of people. They all have different needs. I've learned to read them. Try to have something for everyone. Is this yours? What's that, Mr. Denton? The forty-five Peacemaker. It's an expensive gun. Yes, I'm sure it is. It was lying in the street when I came out before. I was thinking maybe it fell off your wagon. Oh, no, no, no. That doesn't belong to me. It's yours now. Yeah. <laughs> I guess it is. Good day to you, Mr. Denton. And I'm sure it will be a good day. You know something I don't? Oh, not at all, not at all. But when we make changes, it's bound to be a good day. That's always how it seems to work out. Don't you think? Uh, sometimes, maybe. Good day to you. Well, hello there, stranger. Sorry to bother you, Ned. Bother me? Why, you couldn't bother me, Al. Could he, Jake? Not on your life. He's the man of the hour. Now, don't say that. Come on in. We were just talking about you. How we knew you way back when, though I'm the one who knew him the longest. Why, I knew him when he first rode into town. How many years ago was that, Al? Well, too many. So, what'll it be? Shave and haircut? I was thinking just a shave. Uh, if I could owe you a save for a few hours... I... Nothing doing. It's on me. I'll uh, wait till you're finished. I'm done. Just slap a little of that bay rum on my face, Ned, and the chair's all yours. Here you go, Jake. Specialty of the house. Two bits? Two bits it is. And one for my friend Al Denton here. It's all the same to you. I'll pay my way from now on. Don't you worry about it. Why, it's all over town what you did to that no-account kid. We won't be seeing him for a while. You did us all a real service, I'd say. Now, why don't you just sit here in the chair... And I'll make a new man here. That's very kind. Both of you. I won't forget it. Say, is that the gun? That's it. You want to take it out of your belt and set it down, Al? I can hold it for you. Oh, that's all right. Just the shave will be fine. And a haircut and a hot bath. Now, how would that feel? I got some water heating up in the back room. Then won't you be the man, all right? Clean boots. Hmm. Now, 
who is that guy in the mirror? Why, Mr. Denton, I almost didn't know you. Good evening, sir. New shirt makes a big difference. Yeah? All right, all right, who in the... They said this was his room. Well, they did, huh? Who, who are you looking for? Tall man. Usually doesn't wear his gun. Has blonde hair. Like you. Oh? Sounds like that describes... It describes a fella named Al Denton. Supposed to be the top gun here. That wouldn't be you by any chance. It would? Then I got a message for you, Denton. A message from who? Pete Grant. You heard of him? Pete Grant? He's heard of you. Well, what's the message? It's real simple. You don't even have to write it down. Pete'll be in town tomorrow night. Ten o'clock. He'll meet you in the saloon. Well, for what? A drink? <laughs> Not hardly. At five minutes after ten, one of you will walk out. <laughs> I don't think it'll be you. Is that it? That's the end of the message, Denton. You got an answer for him? Well, look, you tell him. You tell him he doesn't even know me and there's no call to... Yeah? You tell him. Tell Mr. Grant I'll be here tomorrow night. I'll wait for his pleasure. That's just what it'll be. His pleasure. Ah, oh, that didn't take long. Not much time at all. Just enough for one shave, a haircut, and a bath. That's all he took. You deliver the message? That I did, Pete. How'd he look? What do you mean? Then they say he's as good as he ever was. Is that how he looked? I don't really know. It was night I and I... No, it was night. It was an hour ago, you dumb, thick-headed steer chasing... Easy, Pete. You're all riled up. You got the nerves again. Grab your chow. And you better get some sleep. Sure, Pete, whatever you say. Soon's I water my horse. Fast he is, then. I bet he's got a case of the nerves, too. Nerves like a sickness. I'm glad I ain't him tonight. <laughs> by a mile. Try this one. Now, take it slow and easy. Ten feet off at least, if I could just stop my hand from shaking. Al? Oh, it's no good. You'll get it back. You just need to practice. Oh, it's too late for that. I should have known. It takes more than a shave and some new clothes. It takes more than a hot bath and a shine of my boots. That takes care of the outside, Miss Smith. Not the inside. I don't believe that. You're sober now and your eyes are good. Yeah, well, look at my hand. It won't hold the gun steady. Not long enough to get my aim. What are you doing? I want to get out while I still can. And go where? Away from here. Far away. Al! Al, you can't run! Oh, no? <laughs> Watch me. I gotta run before it's too late. I gotta run fast and run far. Al! Al, come back! Evening, Mr. Denton. Who are you? Oh, it's you. Know, Mr. Fate. That's my name and peddling's my game. Yeah, sorry, but I don't got no time to talk. You shouldn't, you know. Shouldn't what? You shouldn't run away. That's what you're doing, isn't it? How do you know that? I told you I learned how to read people, what they need. And you don't need to run. I don't. <laughs> No, I guess not. I should stay here and get shot to death for no reason at all. I guess that's what I should do. Curse this gun. Curse the moment I found it. Oh, my, no. Don't curse it, Mr. Denton. Use it. Well, I would if I could. And now, if you'll excuse me, I've got some packing to do. Now, hold on. I think I might have what you need. There. Yes, indeed, Mr. Denton. I'd say this... 
is exactly what you need. I told you before, you don't have anything I need. Not even this? What? It's one of my potions. You might call it that or an elixir. Either way, it'll help solve your latest problem, Mr. Denton. Oh, my, yes. It'll help solve it in no time at all. Snake oil, that's all you are, a snake oil salesman. I knew it when you wrote in. Don't be too swift in your judgment. Allow me to explain. I call this my developer. How's that? More to the point, my fast gun developer. Very special formula. Now hear me out. The man who drinks this becomes the fastest of the fast. He'll be able to shoot a hole through a silver dollar in midair at a hundred feet or better without even aiming. And best of all, it lasts for ten full seconds, guaranteed. Ten seconds. And after that? After that, the user's on his own. Ten seconds, I could empty a gun in half the time, or I used to. Care to test it? Now? Go ahead. Feel free. Proof of the pudding, so to speak. What's in that bottle? An ounce of whiskey or sugar water? Nothing of the sort, I assure you. Taste it. Well, let me get this straight. You're telling me all I have to do is drink it? Mm-hmm. The developer will do the rest. It works almost instantly. And if it doesn't? Then what have you lost? A few seconds? A simple test. That's all I ask. <sighs> doesn't taste like much. Your time starts now. Remember, ten seconds. There's your target. Where? The street lamp. Down at the end of the street. See the flicker? Are you kidding? I couldn't hit that if I was standing right in front of it. Go ahead, Mr. Denton. Your time's almost up. Draw. Eight, nine, ten. I don't believe it. There you go, Mr. Denton. Your time is gone. Now the gun would probably be of no more use to you than a bottle it'd be to a bowl. What'd you put in that? Here's a fresh one. Drink it a few seconds after 10 tonight, just at the moment Mr. Grant walks into the saloon. You know about Grant? Oh, I'm afraid everybody knows it's all over town. How much do I owe you? Oh, why nothing. There's no charge for this. You might call it a service. That's what it is, a service of Henry J. Fate. Just so you remember at some future time, the night that Fate stepped in. Look at the time. Coming up on 10 o'clock. I don't think that Grant fella's gonna show. Well, it'd sure be a whole lot easier that way. Save me from getting the place shot up. I tell you, Al, don't miss. One shot is all it'll take. Yeah, you're right about that. You gonna fix that lamp on the ceiling? I might. And I might not. Maybe I'll hang it on the wall like a trophy with a plaque underneath and Al Denton's name on it. You do that, Charlie, and I'll even pay for the engraving. Sounds like Al now. Yep, right on time. Hello, everybody. We've been waiting, Al. Knew you'd be here. Evening, Ned. You're looking good tonight. Thanks to you. Don't worry, none. That gunfighter won't show. Probably too yellow. Ah, who ever heard of Pete Grant anyway? After tonight, nobody. That's who. How about a drink, Al? Uh, not right now, Charlie. You shouldn't be here. I don't have much of a choice, Liz. But... I thought you were going away. I thought so, too. But here's how I figure it. A man's got to play the cards he's dealt. Because there's no place it's safe. Wherever you go, someone will find you. You mean Pete Grant? Yeah, him or someone like him. All the Pete Grants of the world. You don't have to prove anything. Go, right now. Just go. It doesn't matter where. You've got your life back. Why do you want to throw it away like this? Ready for that drink, Al? No, thanks. I think I'll pass. Suit yourself. It's not ten o'clock yet. There's still time. I see. Now that's just it, Liz. There isn't any more time. I've wasted too much of it already. Get on a horse and ride. Go to another town. Start over. I could meet you there. If you want me to, we could... Listen. Who's that coming? That would be him. Liz, do one thing for me. What, Al? This little bottle. It's my medicine. What kind of medicine? Never mind. When he calls me out, you pull a stopper and hand it to me before I turn around. Then get rid of it. I don't want anybody to see. But what is it? A chance. 
about the only chance I've got. What'll it be, mister? I'm looking for somebody. Uh, who might that be? At the end of the bar. You Denton? That's right. I heard about you. Oh, yeah? What did you hear? Heard tell you're supposed to be fast with a gun. Well, I'll tell you something, son. You got a good chance to find out. I aim to do that. Now, look, I got no quarrel with you. That's not all I heard. I heard you were a low-down, dirty coward. You shouldn't believe everything you hear. Turn around and step away from the bar. You sure there's no other way to settle this? I'm plenty sure. Well, all right, then. If that's your pleasure. Now, Liz. I'm ready. What's that young fella doing? Sneaking some kind of drink. Al, look! He has a medicine bottle, too. Just like yours. Go ahead. Make your move. Al! I got you, Denton. And I got you. But that can't be. You're both right. You shot the guns clean out of each other's hands. This is a push, boys. No winner. Let it end here. Your hand. You won't be shooting anymore with that hand, Al. Not anymore. A couple of the fingers are gonna be stiff from now on. Yeah, I reckon they are. But that don't make any difference. You were fast. Fast on the draw. The way you stood up, that's something to tell your grandchildren about. And the way it looks now, you just might live to have some. Here, wrap this handkerchief around to stop the bleeding. I don't need your help. No, I guess you don't. Not now. You know, you won't understand this right away, son, but you just got a blessing. Two fingers stiff like mine, for good and all. That's what it is, a blessing. Took me a whole lot of years lying dead drunk in the street looking up at the sun before I learned it. And you? You won't have to go through that. Get away from me. Get him, Pete? No more than he got me. Then it's over and done. Yeah. It's over and done. Let's ride. I'll walk you over to Doc's so you can get that hand looked at. Thanks, Liz. There's no need. It's gonna be fine. Just fine. Oh, horse. Time to move on. Mr. Henry Fate, like his wagon says, a dealer in everything. Utensils, pots and pans, liniments and potions. A fanciful figure in a black frock coat who also deals from time to time in second chances. And while there are some who say that he exists only in the dreams and imaginations of men, others say that he does exist because he must, even if it's only in the Twilight Zone. More from the Twilight Zone after this. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com, where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. Mr. Denton on Doomsday, starring Adam Baldwin with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Rod Serling. 
Heard in the cast were Christian Stolte, Jeff Lupatin, Richard Shavsden, Craig Brawley, Brooke Sanford, Kurt Nabig, Doug James, Roderick Peoples, Lynn Foley, Carl Amari, Roger Wolski, and Vince Amari. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etcheson, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are that of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Go out for a pass! Okay! Ha <laughs> ha! Fumble! Uh, let's see now, uh, Fairfield. Um, uh, uh, excuse me, boys. Hey, mister! Get out of the way! Yeah, we're playing football! Uh, surely, but first, uh, that is, if, if you don't mind... Uh, huh? C- uh, c- could, you, could you direct me to Yancey Street? What do you want to know for? Well, I've never been to that particular neighborhood, and, uh... How come you're carrying that thing? Oh, this, uh, this is the Hercules Mark IV, the finest device ever made for hearth and home. What is it? Some kind of an invention? Why, yes, as a matter of fact, a a new breakthrough in home hygiene. It removes dust and dirt that you can't see with the naked eye. It comes complete with a laboratory-grade filter and an extension hose. You mean a vacuum cleaner? No, 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 nothing so prosaic. Yeah, it is. And you're a salesman. You better stay away from my place. My dad hates salesmen. Mine, too. He'll suck you in the jaw. The last guy that came around... Uh, If you could just point the way to Yancey Street... Over there, by the park. But don't stop at my house, neither. My mom will kick your butt. Mm, Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, bye. That guy was weird. Yeah, with his little hat. (laughs) Ha ha, what a loser. Well, here we are. At Yancey Street. May as well try the first apartment. Yeah? Uh, Madam, uh, may I uh, have a word? Who are you? Um, um, my uh, my name's Dingle. Uh, I have something for you. You a process server? No, ma'am. I'm here to, uh... Social worker? No, no, not at all. I'd merely, uh... A cop? No, no. uh... You said you wanted to give me something? Oh, yes, indeed. Well, you can come in, I guess, for a minute. Lovely place you have here. Yeah, sure it is. Now then, I have the most amazing thing to show you. That it? Yes. Looks kind of like a big tin can with knobs and wires. Now, I'll just plug it in. Now, pretend, if you will, that this rug here is your brain and this dirt... What are you doing? This dirt is all the messy thoughts in your head. You threw dirt on my floor? Now, watch what happens when I turn on the Hercules Mark IV. All that filth goes away in a flash. It's better. See? Suck, suck, suck. Gone, gone, gone. Get that thing out of my house. Well, oh, if you wish, but uh, first I, I'd like to, t- to tell you about... Uh, What's going on in there? It's a crazy man. He spilled dirt all over and then he... Say, he... pal, what are you trying to pull? Well, I was just de- 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 demonstrating... You uh... a salesman? Well, you might say... Uh... Well, take your crap and get moving. Oh, uh, just one question before I go. What's that? I don't suppose, um, that is, you you wouldn't care to purchase one of my vacuum cleaners by any chance, huh? Get out now! You know, we have easy time payments. <laughs> <laughs> Look at him! 
I told you, mister. My old man don't like salesmen. Oh, th th thank you. Uh, th thank you both uh, very much. Uh, no, I think, uh, I think I'll just uh, try the next block over. Well, Callahan, you heard the man. He says he's not gonna pay, so that's that. Yeah, you want me to pay on a bum call? Where I come from, a bet's a bet. You saw the play, the umpire's blind. Look, you shouldn't have took the bet. I set the odds and you took them. All I want is what's coming to me. Ah, oh, hello, Mr. Dingle. Uh, the usual? Oh, not quite yet, Mr. O'Toole. Just allow me to sit here and collect my thoughts. Uniquely American institution known as the Neighborhood Bar. First up is Mr. Anthony O'Toole, proprietor, who waters his drinks like geraniums, but who stands four square for peace and quiet and booths for ladies. Then Mr. Joseph Callahan, an unregistered bookie whose entire life is any sporting event with two sides and a set of odds. His idea of a summit meeting is any dialogue between a catcher and a pitcher with more than one man on base. And the citizen who wants his payoff is every anonymous better who ever dropped rent money on a horse race, a prize fight, or a floating crap game, and who took out his frustrations and his insolvency on any vulnerable fellow barstool companion within arms and fists reach. And Mr. Luther Dingle, a vacuum cleaner salesman whose volume of business is roughly that of a valet at a hobo convention. He is a consummate failure at almost everything. But soon, two visitors from outer space will arrive on the scene and alter the destiny of Luther Dingle by leaving him a legacy. In just a moment, a sad-faced punching bag who missed even the caboose of life's gravy train will take a short constitutional into that most unpredictable region, the one we refer to as the Twilight Zone. <laughs> And now, back to our story from the Twilight Zone, Mr. Dingle the Strong, starring Tim Kazarinsky, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Don't give me that, Callahan. I told you before, I don't pay off on a bum call. Three umpires called him out. I called him out. 11,000 fans called him out. Final score, Pittsburgh three, Dodgers nothing. You and me got an even bet. I got the Pirates, hence you owe me five bucks. I know a bum call when I see one. That ball was foul when it hit him. It don't matter what you think you saw. So instead of an out, it was a foul ball. Who's to say he wouldn't have got on base? So that after the single, he would have scored a run and, and like that. You're dreaming. And furthermore, Callahan, you're a low-down, cheating insult to American bookiedom. I'm going to give you five seconds to take back that innuendo. Callahan, I told you once before already. Told me what? You start a brawl in here again, and I'll fix that mouth of yours, so from now on you'll be doing all your drinking through a tube stuck in a vein. Me? I give you trouble? You heard me. Tell it to the number one welcher of all the western states over here. This guy still owes me money for the fight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe on account of that was a bum call, too. And I don't pay off on bum calls. Hey, Dingle. Uh, yes? You remember that fight? The champ's out of the ring, and the ref gives him a long count, like everybody in the room could have gone out for a beer, engaged in some small talk, and then come back and still sat down before the ref has finished counting. Now, how about that? I'm asking you. Me? Yeah, you. How about that? You're asking, Dingle. I sure am. I'm asking him. Well, I, I don't know. You see the game on television last night? Well, as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, I did watch it, yes. There you go. Now we'll settle this. You talk about bum calls. Ninth inning, batters up with two down, and we got a man on first and a man on second, and this umpire with no pupils in his eyes calls a foul ball and out. You see that? I believe I did see that particular play. Then you tell him. You just tell him what you saw. Yeah, go on. Exceptional defensive play. Abner Doubleday would have been proud. Never mind Abner Doubleday. I leave it up to you. Was that a foul ball? Or was it an out? Well, yeah. well, I... Uh... Come on over to the bar, Dingle, and I'll buy you a drink. 
refresh your memory. I'll pay for it. Put your money away, both of you. This one's on the house. Okay, take your time. Say it. Say what you saw. Well, it did appear to me... Yeah? It, it appeared to me that the ball was in safe territory. Appeared? Uh, consequently, upon striking the ground and then hitting the batter, the rules would very clearly indicate that, 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 that the batter was out. You heard it! You realize, of course, pal, that you're calling me a liar. Now, I ain't an unreasonable man, so I'll give you one more chance. All right. Was that a foul, or was it an out? Well, uh, as I say, uh, it's my considered opinion. Here's what I think of your opinion. <laughs> oh! Hey, that's enough. Back off. What happened? Here, Mr. Dingle. Let me help you out. Oh, oh yes. Uh, thank, thank you very kindly, Mr. O'Toole. How come you always got to hit Dingle? You hit him last week. You hit him the week before. A man can only stand so much. I'm tired of this guy contradicting me. And when somebody calls me a liar, there's my honor to consider. Your honor? You've got nothing but larceny in you, all the way from your arches to where you part your hair. And when you die... They're gonna have to screw you into the ground. How about that, Dingle? Is that true? I'm crooked? I leave it to you, buddy. Am I crooked? Well... Hey, Dingle, Dingle, just once. Why can't you just be neutral? Well, that's an interesting question. Watch what you say, Dingle. I got money riding on this. You are sure we are invisible? Beyond any doubt. This represents a typical gathering place for Earthmen. From the coordinates, yes. Did you ever see such primitive-looking creatures? Typical Earthmen. And I say that anybody tells me Philadelphia had any right to win the pennant that year is out of their green grass mind. You're blind as a bat and you're stupid too. And furthermore, if you're gonna sit there and tell me... Look at the record books! What? I rest my case! Not entirely typical. The one in the middle with the hat and peculiar neck adornment. In Earth terminology, I believe it is called a bow tie. He appears to have suffered physical damage. At the hands of his fellow humans? Appalling. This might be the perfect specimen. Does that compute? The very one we're looking for. Silence. I'm receiving his brain waves now. Awaiting confirmation. His name is Dingle. He's an abject coward. He doesn't even possess the minimum musculature for survival on this planet. Decidedly a sub-physical type. A genetic throwback? I believe we have found our subject. You intend to give him the additional strength? We have not found anyone weaker, have we? Negative. This one will make an exceptional subject. I estimate 11 additional cyclograms atomic weight. That should make him approximately 300 times as strong as the average human. Yes, that will suffice. Contact the mothership. Tell them we have picked a subject. They may begin observing him in 60 Earth seconds. Confirmed. Adjust settings. Check. And prepare to let him have it. Look, Dingle, you, you don't gotta answer this guy at all. What do you mean? Just cause he don't happen to like the Phillies. Let him tell me. He's got a brain, don't he? Of course he does. You got a point of view, don't you, Dingle? All right, let's get historical. You follow the game, you know the stats. What did you think of the Phillies back in, uh, say, 53? That was a big year. The Phillies in 1953? That's right. You tell me, for example, if you think Robin Roberts was one half the pitcher that Labine was that year. Oh, here we go again. Well, um, of the two, I'd be inclined to take... Uh... Roberts? You heard the man, buddy. Why all the time you gotta fight me? Now let's run through this one more time. You say that Robin Roberts had more stuff than Clem Labine? Uh, to be perfectly honest and candid, uh, as, as to the two men, uh, as g g good as they both were, uh, all things being equal. So come on already. Hey, let the man talk. Who do you pick? Roberts. Ah. Uh... Oh! I'm telling you guys for the last time. You pull any more rough stuff around here, and I ain't gonna let you in that front door. Now look what you've done to this poor little fella. Ah, he's coming around. 
How do you feel, Dingle? A, a Clem Labine was definitely superior. You see? All I'm doing is helping him see things clear. Whoa, 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 what was that? What was what? I, I, I don't know, but I, I definitely felt so something for a second just then. Uh, how you doing? You all right? Uh, definitely Clem Labine. Uh, all the same, I, I think you better go on home. Well, if you insist. Uh, but I feel quite well. Uh, quite remarkably well, in point of fact. Here's your vacuum. Oh, very kind of you, but I, I can carry it. Dingle. D do you mind, uh, you know, a word of advice? Oh, no, not at all. Look, there's some guys in this world that are, you know, they're going to get punched in the nose no matter who they pick in a ball game or who they vote for or the color of the tie they put on in the morning. I quite agree, O'Toole, though I've, I've always thought polka dots were quite stylish, personally. Yeah, well, look, you're one of those guys, Dingle. So, you know what I think you ought to do from now on? Don't talk. Just nod. If a guy asks you who you like in the third race, you just smile at him. Okay. If somebody asks you who you're voting for, you just nod. Okay. And if you're sitting in the bleachers for a doubleheader and you hear some guy yelling for the Dodgers, you don't go yelling for the Pirates. Uh -huh. You just leave your seat and you go get a hot dog. You understand, Dingle? Uh, I believe so. Uh, a word to the wise and so forth, huh? Uh, very considerate of you, uh, Mr. O'Toole. I'll definitely give the concept further thought. Yeah. What's the matter? Well, that, that's odd. What is? I feel, uh, I feel so funny. Funny how? Oh, oh nothing. I'm, I'm sure I'm fine now, but uh, for a moment there, it was as if something passed over me or, or through me, and I, I heard a high-pitched sound. Uh, very odd. Did anyone else hear it? I can't say as I did. What's he talking about now? Oh, well. No, what do you suppose caused that? Caused what? Well, this vacuum cleaner feels light as a feather. Uh, not that the machine isn't light. It happens to be one of the lightest on the market. Ah, oh, give me a break. No, it's a handy-dandy Jim Cracker A1 piece of merchandise, a guarantee to lighten the labor and lengthen the life of that wonderful partner in the American home, the housewife. But, but, uh, I've never noticed it was this light. Hey, see you, Dingle. What the? Did you see that? The door fell off. Hey, look, Dingle. I mean, with all your faults, despite the fact that you cost me in band-aids what I normally would have to put out for the water bill, you've always been a nice type fellow who never gave me no trouble. But why all of a sudden do you have to go wrecking my front door? Oh, believe me, Mr. O'Toole, I am mystified. I am absolutely mystified. The door just seemed to just seemed to come off its hinges when I grasped the knob very lightly in my hand, uh, my right hand. Uh, well, I'll just set it here against the wall, and you can do whatever you need to make it better again. I bid you good day, gentlemen. Jeez, O'Toole. What kind of drink did you pour him anyway? Look it, there's that dweeb again. Boys? Hey, mister, why'd you come back, huh? I told you my dad had sack you in the jaw, and he did. Yeah, you're really asking for it. Quite right. Uh, only this time, I'm not going to Yancey Street, uh, merely to that uh, park bench to sit in the sun and collect my thoughts. <laughs> he talks funny. I got an idea. Give me the ball. You're gonna throw it at him? Yeah, knock his dumb head off. Bet you can't do it. Watch this. <laughs> oh, jeez! <Jesus. laughs> no, no, boys. That's not the best of all possible manners, is it? Pretty funny. Ah, uh, go peddle your vacuum cleaners, you creep, and throw the ball back. Think you can catch it? He can't even throw it. Oh, is that so? Uh, all right, uh, go back for a pass. Sure. Let me see now. How does one grip a football? Ah, uh, yes, I think I've got it. Uh, ready? Here goes. Whoa, look at it go. Right at that building. It's gonna hit the window! Here's your lunch, Arthur. You want some soup with that? Just let me read my paper here, okay, Lydia? I gotta go back to work. You're always at work. Don't you like being home no more? Too hot. The air conditioner don't work. If you tell the super to fix it... What the 
heck was that? I don't know, Arthur, but you don't have to tell the soup or nothing. Because now we got a nice cross ventilation all the way to the next apartment. Hey, mister, where'd you learn to throw a ball like that? Uh, I really don't know. I don't know what's happening to me. What in the world is, is happening to me? Get those kids down there. They broke my window. We better get out of here. Yes. Out of the street. A taxi over here. Where to? I don't care. Anywhere. I'm in a hurry. Well, get in, pal. Oh, oh yes, of course. Hey, you tore my back door off. What'd you do that for? Oh, believe me, this is as much a mystery to me as it is to you. Uh, uh, I'll leave it right here so you can fix it. Now, how am I going to do that? J just, just let me catch my breath. Hey, quit leaning on my car. You you're tipping it over. Help! Somebody get me out of here. Oh, dear me. You're pinned under the steering wheel, aren't you? Well, give me a second. There. You can get out now. Did you see that? He lifted the car and turned it over. With one hand. I can't believe my eyes. Most amazing thing I ever saw. Who is he? He's a hero. What's your name? N no name. I mean, I'm, I'm nobody. Nobody at all. Um, excuse me, miss? Yes? Um, may I sh share your park bench? Yes, of course. It's not mine. I only come here in the afternoons. <laughs> With your, your charming baby, I see. Oh, he's not mine either. I'm just the nanny. They want him to have his time in the park. You know it is. Well, how perfectly lovely. Well, I don't, actually. I mean, no, that is. You're not married? Never. Really? That's hard to believe, a nice, normal man like you. Well, why, thank you. What? Well, no, 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 no woman's ever said that to me before. That uh, you know, I'm I'm normal. You're joking. I wish I were. I'm not acquainted with many women. Uh, uh, hardly any, in fact, uh, on the personal level. Uh, gosh, I I hope you don't mind chatting like this. Not at all. I spend a lot of time here taking care of the baby. Oh, cute little fella. I know what he wants. You do? Well, look up. Where? That tree branch uh, above your head, there's an apple on it, and the baby sees that. Really? Oh, I'm sure of it. Coochie, coochie, coo. Aren't you the cutest little fella? Oh, look, um, I, I don't want you to think I'm a masher or anything. I, I'm certainly not a masher, but uh, I, I wonder if you'd m m mind answering a question. That depends. Well, what I mean is, I mean, uh, uh, looking at me, would you say, uh, at least upon a, a perfunctory, uh, uh, cursory, uh, uh, very first surveil, would I uh, appear to be abnormal in any way? <laughs> Not at all. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Unless you plan to use that in the park. Oh, oh that. Uh, you know, up to a few hours ago, I sold those things. Uh, newfangled vacuum cleaners. Or at least I, I went through the motions. Uh, I was miserably bad as a salesman, just miserable. Would you believe it? Last week, I made exactly 89 cents in commission. And that was for an attachment, an upholstery nozzle, and I sold it to a drunk who kept insisting it was a divining rod for alcohol. Is that why you stopped? Well, there were um, other factors. I, I expected to be fired today anyway, but you know that's the least of my worries now. Uh, a few minutes ago, People were chasing me. Why? Well, that's just it. Be because they thought I was abnormal. Now, I ask you, would, would you be interested in hearing the source of my worries? Go ahead. <coughs> well, that apple, for instance, uh, the baby wants it, but you can't reach it, can you? No. Not even if you put the baby down and stood up on the bench. 
I couldn't put the baby down. Oh, precisely. But what if I were to give you a hand? I'm not sure I... Well, see, this bench weighs, oh, I'd say, um, 100, 150 pounds, and you're no more than 110 to 115. Well, 125. Well, what if I were to stand, reach down, pick up the bench by one of its legs, and lift it straight up into the air, like this? Oh, please! so that you could reach the apple and you wouldn't even have to disturb the baby. Go on, reach over and take it. And then I put the bench down with you and the baby on it, right back down on the ground, as gentle as it can be. There. Uh, would you say that's abnormal? How? How did you? Hey, man, could you do that again? Whoa, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I got my camera with me. I sure would like to get a shot of that. Is it a magic trick, like in Las Vegas? Are you a magician or what? No, it's just something that I've discovered I can do. Uh, very recently, as a matter of fact. You see, um... I, I, I better get the baby home now. Let me just get the camera set up. But the young lady's gone now. There's no point in lifting the bench with no one on it, is there? Well, then do something else. Or like what? Anything. I don't know. I... Well, at, at least let me take your picture. Stand right there by that big rock. Oh, uh, here? Uh, well, I, I suppose one picture wouldn't do any harm. Uh, shall I take my hat off? Uh, of course, then the sun would be in my eyes when I have to squint. Uh... Well, can you show me your muscles or something? Oh, I'm sorry. I don't believe I have any muscles to speak of. Oh, yeah, right. Say cheese. Oh, wait, now the rock is in the way. Uh, perhaps if you stand a few feet to your left? And then the sun will be right in the lens. Oh, in, in, in that case, uh, I better move the rock. Uh, uh, may I? Uh, hold on one second. Whoa, you, you lifted it just like that. It must weigh a ton. There, young man. Is that better? I suppose you can snap my picture now if you insist. Yeah, that's great. Are you sure this is my good side? Couple more. Oh, right. Wait till my editor sees this. For the love of Mike, did you see this? Uh, what do you got there, Callahan? It's Dingle, on the front page of the Daily Bulletin. Let me see that. Hercules? No, it's Luther Dingle, 20th century Samson. Good gravy, there's his picture! Picking up a giant rock! You mean this is our Dingle? None other, by the looks of it. This is where I spend my afternoons, uh, when I'm not working, of course. Dingo, my old pal! Hey, have a seat, buddy boy! Mr. Luther Dingle, his favorite neighborhood pub. A regular guy who leads a regular life, when he's not busy performing miracles. This is Jason Abernathy, and I'm here to bring you the full story on my eyeball news report. So, who wants a drink? Step right up. Are you his friend? What's he really like? What was his first feat of strength? Did you always know he was special? What's his secret? Well, now, uh, Mr. Dingle, uh, Luther, is uh, my number one customer. Never goes to any other establishment. Ain't that right, boys? That's the truth. I knew he had it in him. We was pals all the way back to grade school. All right, who's next? Line up. Mr. Dingle, if what I hear is true, do you realize how much money you could make on a tour with my international circus? A circus, eh? Uh, I, I don't know. Vegas, Atlantic City, Branson, Missouri. Hey, don't listen to her. Hey, Dingle, your future's in television. You're the walking, talking embodiment of every American male's wish fulfillment. You're John Q. Citizen, you're Babbitt, you're Tom, Dick, and Harry. We'll develop a sitcom around those values. A spinoff. After several guest spots, of course. Well, I'm just not sure. All right, well, how about uh, an infomercial? A simple across-the-board address by you with examples of your physical prowess followed by product endorsements. It's a natural for breakfast cereals, vitamin pills, anything at all. You mean like Jack LaLanne, uh, the juice man, that sort of thing? Forget it, Dingle. I keep telling you, boxing is a piece of cake. You line up with me, I'll get you a couple of real easy setups, and inside of eight months, I'll have you fighting for the world championship. Or if you want to go with the WWF instead. All right, all right. Right, everybody, we're going on the air live in just a few seconds. Uh, would the people around Mr. Dingle get out of the way, please? I don't want to. Okay, on the air in four, three, two, 
one, and... Hello, friends. Jason Abernathy here. Our unusual subject today is Mr. Luther Dingle, who, if what actual onlookers say is true, is the world's strongest man. Oh, well, I know. <laughs> Mr. Dingle, Mr. Dingle, uh, would you give us an example of this fantastic, uh, uh, allegedly fantastic strength of yours? Well, I'd be happy to. Uh, Mr. O'Toole, uh, is it all right? You know, the thing we discussed? What, are you kidding? I ain't done this much business since, well, I don't know when. Be my guest, Dingle. Well, uh, yes. Uh, I'll start off with something simple. Uh, you see this wall? Solid plaster. Supported, I believe, by wooden studs. I'll make a small X with my finger here and. Um... You saw it. Mr. Dingle has just punched a hole through a solid wall with his bare fist. Now, for my second demonstration. Oh, dear, let me see you. Uh... Well, you've heard of karate. Uh, I suppose I could simply just line up the edge of my hand with the surface of this table, my open hand, mind you, and with a single blow. That's amazing! Would you call it mind over matter, Mr. Dingle? Oh, no. I, I, I'd call it an example of matter over matter. You see, it doesn't matter what's on my mind, even if it's nothing at all. Uh, okay, Dingle. <laughs> You just don't go breaking all my tables in half, okay? Jeez. Hey, better sit down, buddy. Have yourself a drink. Hey, you want my seat? Not yet. Uh, I feel fine. Uh, splendid. Uh, these bar stools are bolted down, aren't they? If, let's say, I wanted to move one a few inches... Oh, see that? He ripped it right off the floor and he didn't even break a sweat. What a guy. Go on. Take my stool if you want. Oh, stand up. Sure, why? If you please. Uh, why are you looking at me like that? Oh, no. Wait a minute, Dingle. Ain't you ever heard of bygones being bygones? <laughs> Put me down. I see it, but I don't believe it. Ladies and gentlemen, the man at the bar is 160 or 70 pounds, and Dingle is lifting him like a rag doll, whoa. twirling him over his head with one hand. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh. Funny. There. Now, that didn't hurt too much, did it, pal? You're good as new. Well, almost. Uh, gonna give your hand up, pal? Mr. Dingle, you're my hero. He can do anything. Well, better not pick a fight with that fellow. Had enough. Most inferior. We give him the strength of 300 men. And he uses it for petty exhibitions. What shall we do about it? Give him 20 or 30 seconds more, and then remove the power. Excellent. Then I think we'd best be off. Three more planets on the itinerary. What is particularly interesting contains only females. Set the ray for cancellation. Check. Ladies and gentlemen, for my next feat, I think I'll lift this entire building. Whoa. <laughs> well, at least the ceiling, and hence all the floors above it. Uh, uh, step aside, everyone. I, I don't know if we have a clear shot of this, but he's standing on his tiptoes, extending his fingers to the ceiling. <clears throat> Here we go. <laughs> oh, um, uh, uh, huh. uh, let me try that again. I, I can't seem to... Uh... Something's wrong. Uh, no, I just felt strange there for a second. Uh, uh, let me try another bar stool. Remember, they're bolted to the floor. Uh, one finger. Uh, no, maybe two fingers. He's a fake! No wires this time. It was a trick. What's the matter, Mr. Dingle? Uh, the wall, then. Uh, I'll punch another hole right about here. Ow! Well, apparently, we've all been the victims of a charlatan. Cut. Are we still live? Come on, let's get out of here. It was a trick, that's all. Just some guy looking to get his picture in the paper. All right, leave off with poor Dingle here. Get out of here. Hey, come on, Dingle, sit down. I'll get you some iodine for those knuckles. Ladies and gentlemen, you have the station's apologies. We uh, didn't realize that these were merely stage illusions. And, okay, we're off the air. That's a wrap. Off the air for good, I think. Let's go. So long, Samson.
Time to go. Yes. Wait, who are they? Hello, boys. Where are you two from? Venus, how about you? Mars, conducting your own experiments? Yes, and you? Sudden introduction of strength to subnormal Earthmen. What is your experiment? Sudden introduction of an enhanced intelligence. Find any interesting subjects? That one over there, referred to as Dingle. He is certainly subphysical, maybe submental too. A likely subject. Give him the intelligence quota ray. How much? Oh, we'll make him approximately 500 times more intelligent than the average human. Uh, what was that? Oh. Hey, Dingle, who do you like in the doubleheader tonight? Well, in this case, the laws of probability are interspersed with the finagling laws of chance, so through a process of calculus and a subdivision of grapple-based physical motivating and a divisional annotating, in this case, of course, using the two X factors as represented by the teams, the final score must, of necessity, be 5-3 to three Milwaukee in the opener, 6 to nothing Dodgers in the nightcap. Yeah, what did he say? Search me, Callahan. Let's have another drink. It's on the house. It is apparently on an advanced mathematical plan that the entire quantum theory of space and time relativity must, of necessity, be equated with the parallelian law of definitive numerical dialectical algebraic and can be notated. Exit Mr. Luther Dingle, former vacuum cleaner salesman, strongest man on earth, and now mental giant. These latter powers will very likely be eliminated before too long. But Mr. Dingle has an appeal to extraterrestrial note takers as well as to frustrated and insolvent pet losers. Offhand, I'd say that he's in for a great many extremely odd periods, simply because there are so many inhabited planets to send down observers, and also because, of course, Mr. Dingle lives his life with one foot planted firmly in the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at TwilightZoneRadio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. Mr. Dingle the Strong, starring Tim Kazarinski, with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Peter DeFaria, Doug James, Richard Hensel, Turk Muller, Rick Peoples, Adam Tangway, Martin Hughes, Maria Stevens, Peggy Roeder, Roger Wolski, and Carl Amari. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. This copyrighted series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into 
the Twilight Zone. Yes, sir. You open for business? I sure am. I couldn't tell. Nobody on the street. Oh, not this time of day. It's too hot. What's your pleasure, sir? Beer. Beer she is. Cold, is it? Uh, cool's more like it. Ah, do me just fine. That'll be a nickel. Nickel it is. Come a long way, did you? Mm. <sighs> long way. So the name on the map... But I didn't know if it was still here. Lovely little town. Uh, what's that? I was remarking about the town. Lovely, peaceful place you got here. Yep, that it is. And the name really gets me. Happiness. That's what she's called. Happiness, Arizona. Been called happiness, uh, let's see now. Oh, almost uh, ten months now. What was it called before that? Before that? Well, it had different names. Like what? Well, it was Satan's stage stop for a while, then Dead Man's Junction, and then Boot Hill Village. Boot Hill? For the town cemetery. You passed it coming in. Well, that I did. I saw the sign on the side of the road, said it was to commemorate the, let's see, uh, how did it go? The many people killed in the course of our turbulent beginnings. Right. 128 people buried up there. That many? Every one of them shot dead. Is that a fact? Save one who died of natural causes. Well, things sure have changed. Now you got the Happiness General Store, the Happiness Hotel. It didn't used to be that way. I'll tell you something, mister. <laughs> this town wasn't fit to live in. No? No, sir, Rebob. Well, there wasn't one night you could come in this bar and not have to step over a dead body. Hard to believe. Nothing but shooting and killing going on night after night. Well, even my brother John, rest his soul... We had more folks biting the dust than we had coming to Sunday meeting. Do tell. And you know what happened? I couldn't begin to guess. Well, I'll tell you. Town just kind of took stock of itself. Got a real strong sheriff from Dodge City. Put the old kibosh on firearms. Built a jail and gallows. Enforced the law. Next thing you know, happiness, Arizona. That's quite a story. Happiness. Or a man can walk down the street and have himself a drink without checking the mirror to see who's gunning for him. That's progress, mister. That's real progress. This kind of thing, it, well, it sort of brings tears to my eyes. Well, that's all right now. Don't you be scared to go showing your true feelings. I know how it is. You live with violence and killing all your life, and then suddenly it's just like... Well, kind of like the sun coming up over a dark cloud and shining down on you with the warm rays of beneficence. That's mighty well put. I do a little preaching on the side, too. I'm not surprised to hear that. What's your line? My line? Your work. What do you do? Oh, I I'm on the road a lot. Selling? In a manner of speaking. Services is what I supply. Can I get you another beer? Yeah, that would be right kind of you. Services, you say? What kind of services? Oh, you wouldn't be interested. Well, you never know. I might be able to throw a little business your way. Well, you might at that. This is the kind of town that generally can use me. What services do you supply? I bring back the dead. Introducing Mr. Jared Garrity, a gentleman of commerce, who in the latter half of the 19th century plied his trade in the wild and woolly hinterlands of the American West. He has just driven his wagon down the hot, dusty main street of a quiet, unadorned, and absolutely typical town in search of an opportunity to practice that trade. Mr. Garrity, if you can believe him, is a resurrector of the dead, which on the face of it certainly sounds like the bull is off the nickel. But to the scoffers amongst you, and all you ladies and gentlemen from Missouri, don't laugh this one off entirely, at least until you've seen a sample of Mr. Garrity's wares and witnessed an example of his services. The place is Happiness, Arizona. The time, about 1890. And you have just entered a saloon where the bar whiskey is brewed, bottled, and delivered on special order, direct from the Twilight Zone.
And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Mr. Garrity and the Graves, starring Chris McDonald with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Hmm, five points. Sheriff! That's better. Seven points. Sheriff Gilchrist, open up! What is it? Sheriff, come quick! What's the matter now, Jensen? The stranger, Sheriff. The stranger! What stranger? Sheriff, I'm glad you're here. Well, where else would I be? Uh, I don't know. But I'm always the first man they look for. And the last they want to meet. Yep, that's true, all right. What are you doing? Practicing my knife throwing. What does it look like? Whose picture are you throwing at today? Same as always. My deputy. Ex-deputy. Chesley? But he done run off. Tell me about it. Oh, oh, Sheriff, you gotta come quick. It's that stranger feller. All right, all right. Just let me strap on my gun. Is that what he said? Well, where is he now? Well, no, it just up and vanished, just like that. Is that what Jensen said? I don't like this one bit. Where's the bartender? I need another drink. He's coming with the sheriff. Here he is, everybody. Simmer down now. What's this about a stranger? He's wearing a black suit and a black hat. Well, there's his wagon right outside. And a mustache and a bony face. And you should have seen his eyes. Now hold on, everybody. Let the sheriff talk. He'll answer all your questions. What did he say his name was? Uh, well, he didn't say. At uh, least I, I, I don't think he did. You got a sign on his wagon out there. By golly, you're right. Well, sure he is, Lapham. What's it say? It says, Garrity. Hmm. Then that could mean something, I reckon. That could be his name. Say, that's deduction for you. Now you know why we got law and order around here. Well, it's a chancy job. Makes a man watchful, I bet. And a little lonely. We finally got ourselves a lawman who uses scientific deduction. Why didn't I ever think of that? Don't know a fella's name, you just look at his wagon. Really wasn't no great shakes of deduction, Lapham. Well, now I beg to differ with you on that. But it points up the fact that you can't stop thinking on this job. Not ever. It's a kind of think, think, think proposition. Take this six gun, for instance. A lot of men depend on this all the time, when they should be using what's under their hat. Under their hat? The old bean. Ha! <laughs> By golly, nobody was ever righter than that. And besides, using the head instead of the gun, you save money on bullets. Not to mention burials and labor. You could say that again. No thanks. Now, he said what to you, Jensen? He said that he could bring back the dead. That's what his line was, bringing back the dead. That possible, Sheriff? Better ask Doc. But we don't have a Doc in happiness. Oh, that's right. Well, sir, when he said that, I'd like to keel over in my tracks. Bring back the dead. I think to myself, well, well, I think to myself, the man's either a lunatic or he's trying to go me. That's when I went over to your office and got you, Sheriff. And when we come back, it up and gone. That's right. Interesting. Very interesting. He probably figured you'd gone to get the sheriff or some such. And he decided right then and there to make tracks. Now that's reasonable. That's exactly what he done. He's obviously some kind of a con man. And the minute he seen Jensen here leave the saloon, he knew he was going to go get the law. So he decided things was too hot for him, and he better hightail it out of town. That there is a... A real deduction, all right. Except, how come he left his wagon? Gooberman, you're embarrassing to have around. What kind of question is that? How come he left his wagon? I can't believe you asked that. How come he left his wagon? Uh, so, uh, tell us, Sheriff, how come he did leave his wagon out front? The way I figure it, 
He probably didn't get out of town after all. The way I figure it, he probably checked into the hotel or some place like that. What other place could he go except in the hotel? Maybe Miss Tabby's. But Miss Tabby run off with the deputy. Thanks, Jensen, for twisting the knife. The hotel, exactly. That's what he done. Sheriff, you got a lifetime job here if I got anything to say about it. Give the sheriff a drink on me, will you, Jensen? Sure thing. Kind of you, Lampum. Real kind of you. Yeah, real kind. <gasps> That's him, Sheriff. That's him. Barkeep. Y yes sir? You got another one of those nickel beers? Uh, coming right up, sir. You're... You're Garrity? That's my family name, yes. Can I ask you a question, Mr. Garrity? Of course, Sheriff. That your wagon out there? Yep. That's my wagon. Says Garrity on it. Uh-huh. How come? Like I said, that's my family name. Oh, so that's right. <clears throat> Mr. Jensen here tells me that you bring back the dead. That what he said? No, that's, uh, that's what you might call a uh, figure of speech, isn't it? Uh, what are you getting at, Sheriff? What I mean is, you don't actually bring back the dead, do you? On the contrary, that's exactly what I do. Bring them back. What did he say? Hit me with a shot of whiskey there, would you, Jensen? No problem. I don't suppose you'd care to tell us how you go about doing something like that. Well, no offense, Sheriff, but it's kind of a professional trade secret. Secret? I mean, like a magician. He doesn't tell you how he does his tricks. Well, I don't tell you how I bring back the dead. But I do, just the same. And you actually, you actually bring back the dead? I do indeed. Brought back healthy and hopping as the day they departed. And if that ain't a boon to mankind, somebody better tell me what is. Somebody better indeed. Fact is, gentlemen, I've heard of your town. 128 people in Boot Hill up there. I figured if a man's trying to sell cold drinks, he goes to the desert. And man's got buffalo skins and woolens, he goes to the cold north country. And if he brings back the dead, well, then go to a town where most of them are buried. And the name of that town is Happiness, Arizona, with the biggest cemetery west of Chicago. <laughs> All of them departing this earth with unspeakable violence. All but one. Which one? Uh, that was my wife, Zelda. God rest her soul. A bustling, healthy, strapping woman of 247 pounds. Not unattractive, mind you. And then one morning, she's taken with the dyspepsia. And I'd lost her. That there is why I drink from a broken heart. How much loss can a man stand? Here, Gooberman, have one on the house. What the? Stand back, everybody. What's happened? Oh my gosh, he run over the dog. Poor thing. Is it still alive? Oh no, I sure am sorry, poor little mutt. How did it happen? Dog just run right out in the street. I tried to stop, but he got under my wheels. Must have struck him a blow in the head. Not a mark on him, but he's sure dead. What do you call that, Sheriff? Hmm. Accidental animal homicide. Oh, mighty decent of you, Sheriff. No fine or nothing. No fine. You obviously couldn't help it. That's what the law says. Anybody know who the dog belongs to? Stray is what she is. Never seen her before. Nope, not around here. I'll put her up in my wagon, take her out and bury her with my own two hands. No need. Huh? Ladies and gentlemen, the proof of the pudding, so they say, is in the eating. And the proof of a service is in the performing. Hallelujah. The dog is certainly dead, isn't she? No question about it. Then, gentlemen, I shall take it upon myself to return this gentle creature to the land of the living. What do you mean by that, mister? I shall resurrect it. Stand back, all of you. I ask only one thing. 
in order that I may conduct the operation satisfactorily and completely. What's that, Garrity? Would you all turn around? What? And look the other way, so you're not watching me. How's that? If you don't mind, please, show me your backs for just a moment, out of respect for the dead. Ergest rage grand wazoo intercoiter metalun magic land of Alakazam. Eureka! Sit up, girl. Shake hands. Shake. That's a good dog. Chasing a bird, I'd say. Ladies and gentlemen, I rest my case. He done a miracle! That's what I'd call it a miracle! Magic is what it is. My dear friends, citizenry of Happiness, Arizona, it's with no small degree of pleasure that I stand here in this quaint, picturesque main street performing what I modestly claim as an accomplishment of some dimension. As you've all seen, I've just brought a dog back to life. It's not natural. Please, hear me out. It was not black magic and it was not the devil's work. It is the application of scientific principles which I have picked up over the years. While traveling extensively in the Himalayan mountains for seven years, I served as personal apprentice to the High Lama. But how? How'd you do it? Simply by utilizing certain cosmic forces. What are they? With a concurrent application of mystical electrolysis. <laughs> Let's all have a drink on it. Fortunately, I brought with me in my wagon here a supply of all the necessary herbs and spices to repeat the process. And what I have done for that dog, why I can do the same for your loved ones. May their souls rest in peace for the moment. You mean you can bring back my Zelda? And my former partner? And my late husband? How about my mother? And my old horse? I had a fiance came down with the chillblains. What if we don't know where they're buried? Peace, friends. This is a time for meditation, for communion with your most sacred beliefs. For tonight, at midnight, joy abundant will reign in happiness, Arizona. The dead will be returned to you. All in one piece. Well, now have a cigar, mister, on me. Well, thank you. <coughs> now go to your homes and prepare for the ultimate happiness. Hello, spirits of Boot Hill. Are you there? I say, spirits! I'm talking to you! Garrity here. Make yourselves known to me. Would you do that little thing, please? Spirits, come forth. Now, I tell you, I'm run out of time here. No sign of him. He's up at the cemetery. Still? Four hours he's been up there now. That place always froze my guts, even at high noon in the bright sun. Imagine what it must be like after dark. I don't want to imagine. You know, one time when I was a kid... Please, Lapham. I had a pet goldfish. In Arizona territory? No, this is back in Springfield. Anyway, I had this goldfish, and my cat used to watch it swim around night and day. What was your cat's name? My pussy cat? Her name was Tabby. Lapham. Anyway, one night, 
She knocked the fishbowl over trying to catch it, and I got so mad, I chased her out of the house. Spare me. And wouldn't you know, that cat ran out and leaped in the pond. Now, it was the dead of winter, and there was ice on the water, and, well, to make a long story short, when I pulled her out, she was frozen solid. You could have throwed her through the air like a boomerang. What's a boomerang? Never mind. Let him get finished. So I carried her back in the house all stiff like that so as I could bury her the next day. And you know something? In the middle of the night, that cat thawed out and came back to life. Started running around like she was possessed. I hid for my life. The sound she made it just wasn't human. Of course not. It was a cat. Be that as it may, the cat was never the same. <laughs> what finally happened to her? She ate some spoiled mackerel and expired for the second time. She didn't come back from that one, sad to say. Imagine. Can you just imagine? Imagine what, Uberman? My own little blossom. My own Zelda. The lonely days and lonely nights. And at midnight, she's coming back to me. Saints preserve us. Uh. Listen, what's that? Sounds like Mr. Garrity's finished his work. Evening, gentlemen. Evening, Garrity. Whiskey, please. Ah, uh, sure thing. Another. Yes, sir. How... How did it go up there? Go? On Boot Hill. The cosmic impulses are... Yes? Incredible tonight. Absolutely incredible. You mean you're finished? All finished. <laughs> What's that clock say? 11.35. Good. Good? They'll be falling down any time now. Takes them a while because they walk so slow. But they're ahead of schedule. They are? I wasn't five minutes into the ceremony when the earth started to heave. A mighty anxious crop of folks up there. Mighty anxious. It'd do your heart good to see them wiggling around under the sod. That right? Just like some happy colt raring to face life again. Did... did you happen to see my Zelda up there? Why, I might have. Oh, you couldn't have missed her. She's the biggest thing on the hill. Only funeral that ever took nine pallbearers. That was some service. Doggone if she wasn't a strapping girl. I remember the time she threw me out of the house. Through a window, as a matter of fact, I was 18 feet in midair. That picture behind the bar. Which one? The man with the handlebar mustache. Your beloved brother, isn't it? John? <laughs> sure is. How'd you know? Reminds me of someone I've seen quite recently. Shot by accident last March. There was a gunfight in here, and he got hit by a stray bullet. Tall man like you, with a kind of a limp. How... how'd you know? Your brother was the last man buried. And the last ones buried are the first ones to come up. Come up? And then down. Down? Down the hill, into town. You say something out there, Mr. Garrity? I believe I do. What? Why, I believe that's him coming now. Down the middle of the street. Look, do you see? That's him! How can you tell? Look at how he's dragging his foot. Can't see his face. I was right, Mr. Jensen. You... you were? It's your beloved brother, John. And a more decent and honorable citizen never pulled a cork out of a bottle. Or so I'm told. He... he was a no-good thieving bum. He spent more time digging in the till and stealing whiskey than he did serving customers. Why, Mr. Jensen, you dishonor the man, and here he returns to you from the grave after that unfortunate accidental bullet fired by someone caught him between the shoulder blades. I'm here. I'm a coming, coming back to you. Hold on! Mr. Garrity! Yes? How much do you charge for bringing back the dead? Well, just room and board, Mr. Jensen. My major source of income is the pleasure I derive from bringing happiness to my fellow man. 
Well then, how would you like to increase that source of income real quick? You'll have to speak a bit plainer, Mr. Jensen. How much would you take to put him back up on the hill? I'm asking you. To put him back? My brother, I mean. In his grave, where he belongs. Hmm. What does that mean? Well, it's a difficult procedure, Mr. Jensen. Once the resurrection has taken place, it requires a maximum effort to replant them, so to speak. Would a hundred dollars pay for the effort? A hundred? In gold. Shall we say a thousand? What does five hundred do to you? Well, it warms me a little, but I still feel drafty. Let's make it seven fifty, shall we? Deal. Disappeared. Just plain old disappeared. He did. It's true. He's gone. Can't see him no more. They're right, Garrity. He vanished like a shadow on the street. Thank the good Lord. It was your brother, all right. I saw him with my own eyes. Tall man with a limp, just walking toward us as big as you please, and then... He just plumb disappears. Yeah, that's right. Garrity did it. He's a miracle worker. Well, that's life. Well, let's go inside and have a drink. But don't fret, friends. He'll be followed soon enough by the others. The others? Including your beloved wife. Your lonely hours are a thing of the past, Mr. Guberman. Your Zelda will soon be back with you to share your life and restore your peace of mind. Well, uh, no disrespect, but, um... Yes? Uh, what I mean is, uh, she was the flower of all womanhood and everything. Of that I have no doubt. But on six different occasions, she broke my left arm. That thing was in a cast so much, I developed a permanent list. Your point, Mr. Guberman? Well, I... I sort of hate to disturb her rest. Get me? I'm beginning to. What'll it take to put her back? A difficult assignment, Mr. Guberman. Let's say $500. Uh, with me, it was $750. Jensen, I'm disappointed in you. And ashamed, truly ashamed. Your own dear brother. And you, Guberman, your own wife. Garrity, as an official of this town, I apologize for these men. I'm humiliated. Nothing less than humiliated. I don't blame you, Sheriff. Not one bit. But you, I could perceive immediately that you are made of sterner stuff. Well, I suppose that's true. I didn't see you quake in your boots. Just because Lightning Peterson will be one of the departed returning tonight. Lightning Peterson? <gasps> You killed him yourself, didn't you, Sheriff? And he was supposed to be the fastest gun in the territory. Boulder Dash. I say Boulder Dash. Lightning Peterson, indeed. You killed him once, Sheriff, in an honest showdown, and if his internment hasn't taught him anything, you can do it again. Uh... Something, Sheriff? You're resurrecting that gunman along with the rest? It's a mass operation. I see. <clears throat> I see. As a matter of fact, it provides a marvelous opportunity for you to dispel those ugly rumors I've heard. Rumors? That you actually shot Peterson in the back late at night, when he was alone and unarmed, while you had six deputies at your side. Hold on. Now, I know you faced up to him in broad daylight, a man of your character, but this will give you a second chance to shoot him down if need be, face to face. Have a seat, Sheriff. You don't look so good. If you really want to know, Mr. Garrity, I don't think Peterson should be resurrected. I think he's, uh, a menace to society. Fact is, Sheriff, judging by that clock on the wall, I'd say he's already on his way down. Personally, I wouldn't mind facing him again, but why go to all the trouble? Trouble? For a man of your skill? Would $500 put him back up there? Lightning Peterson? You do him an injustice, Sheriff. He was quite a lad with the gun, and mighty active at that. A $1,200 job, minimal. Sold. Just bring me the bottle, Jensen. Mr. Garrity, are you in there? Ma'am? You happen to see a scrawny little man up there? 
kind of gimlet eyed? Hmm. Name? Perkins. Ephraim Perkins. A relative? Ex husband. And no tighter man ever squeezed a silver dollar. Thing of it is, I'm married again. And if the truth be known, I never did care much for Ephraim while he was living. And I don't properly see why I should have to go through it all again. Besides, what would I do with two husbands? I can appreciate your dilemma. A uh, hundred dollars? Five, madam, would be a bit closer to home. Oh, fella, Uncle Jeb, left me his farm. See, uh, how much would it take to keep him there? Hold on now. One at a time. Uh, my father-in-law, big man, asked to be buried with a bullwhip. <laughs> Just ain't no reason at all why he should come back. Now, I'll have to write these down. My husband, Charles. Mean cuss. Nobody liked him. Had to hire mourners from out of state. Order, please. I'll take your money one at a time. Can you make change? Well, let's see here. Who's next? Who oh, there? Oh. Here, boy. <laughs> there you go. Nice puppy. Nice little boy. Got a bone for you in the back of the wagon. You're paid for playing dead like that. That you, Ace? Right here. You're late. Couldn't help it. Town was the ripest pair we ever plucked. <laughs> they couldn't open their money bags fast enough. What's the taste? Whew. See for yourself. I haven't had time to count it. Will you look at that? Considerably more than you earn as an actor on the stage, my friend. Considerably more. Played the part well, though, didn't I? Beautifully. The handlebar mustache was a nice touch. Well, that's why I brought my makeup kit. Never know what you'll need. I checked the itinerary. Our next stop is Tucson. We'll pitch camp and get a good night's sleep. And you go in there in the morning and get a line on the place. We'll see which one of the dear departed you can impersonate tomorrow night. Now climb in. Well, let's get a move on before that sheriff turns suspicious. I tell you, I'll be glad to get gone from this cemetery. Creepiest one yet. You don't believe in ghosts, do you, Ace? <laughs> well, I never did, but this one. There's so many tombstones everywhere. Man thinks he's yeah, hearing things after a while. Not this one. The folks up here on Boot Hill, they're buried deep enough. So long, friends. Real sorry I couldn't perform what I laid claim to. <laughs> oh, rest in peace now, all of you. Come on, let's go. Come on. Dirt out of my eyes, will you, John? Sure enough, Evan. Wait, hold on. You got a worm in your nose. You know, the man don't do himself justice. The actor who played you wasn't worth a darn. Terrible mustache. But that there Garrity, he sure can do a job of resurrecting. Sure can. Don't know where he learned them words, but they worked. Didn't they, Lightning? Let's get on to town. We ought to wait for the others to dig out. Don't worry, they'll be along. Besides, I got a lot of drinking to catch up on. There's a yellow skunk of a sheriff I aim to settle a score with. And a little pipsqueak of a soft jug waiting to get his arm broke. And I am just the lady to do it. Oh, my name ain't Zelda Gooberman. Let's go, boys. Just the four of us. It's clobbering time. Exit Mr. Jared Garrity, a would-be charlatan, a make-believe con man, and a sad misjudger of his own rather considerable talents. This haunting little fable respectfully submitted from a soon-to-be-empty cemetery located atop a dark hillside on one of the more dangerous slopes leading into and out of the Twilight Zone.
Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered while supplies last at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. Mr. Garrity and the Graves, starring Chris McDonald with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Rich Komenik, Doug James, Christian Stolte, Roderick Peoples, Linda Ryder, Michelle Graff, Vince Amari, Roger Walski, and Carl Amari. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. <laughs>